Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Cheaper Child Care Bill 2022, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Dunning. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President, and I'm pleased to uh, commence the uh, contributions of the second reading debate on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Cheaper Child Care Bill 2022 on behalf of the uh, opposition. Um, obviously, uh, much has been said uh, in the other place from colleagues uh, around the coalition's position, which I'll restate now, and that is that we won't be opposing the bill, um, noting that we did support it in the House. Um, it's important to outline from the coalition's point of view uh, why we've reached that conclusion um, and also making it clear that uh, given the nature of our um, political foundation, our framework of beliefs, we do believe in choice uh, and we believe that parents who engage in uh, work or study should also be able to access care. Um, whether that be through formal or informal arrangements. I think that's an important factor of uh, this entire makeup of this sector of the economy, this service provision part of the economy that um, hasn't been dealt with properly here. In this bill, though, there is a lack of detail from the government. In particular, there's no plan to address a particular issue that is going to cause um, a high degree of uh, concern for many, and that is the lack of a plan to address the workforce shortage uh, and, of course, the pressures being faced by educators 
uh, currently in the marketplace. And I should also indicate that up until recently, uh, my family and I had a formal involvement in this industry, and we know exactly what uh, educators are going through. It is something that we do need to take account of here. There's no plan to address access to care, um, given many parents and anyone who goes out into the community knows, and I'm sure it's across this place, uh, that, that many parents are struggling to find a place uh, for care and education of their child. Um, it might be part of the week that they require that is covered. It could only be a day, but indeed the fact is that it is a difficult uh, task to be able to find a uh, place for care. There's no plan to address thin markets and childcare deserts, um, where of course there are no or little to no services, and there's no modelling to show that this bill will actually deliver on what the government has promised. There's $4.7 billion being spent here through this legislation, and not one single cent will be spent in creating additional places or services. And of course, as we've said previously, the bill that we're debating today favours high income earners over the rest of Australians. In terms of workforce pressures, we know that early childhood educators who do an amazing job have been under pressure for a couple of years and they've worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic. Um, and now we're at the other side. Uh, workers are leaving this sector for other careers. Um, there are a range of issues that have contributed to that, but at the end of the day, um, they've become burnt out. Uh, there are currently 7,200 vacancies in this sector, um, but there are pieces of recent data showing there could be up to 20,000 vacancies, which of course does point to the concerns the Coalition has raised around this legislation. We've asked the government on several occasions now how many additional educators will be needed under this policy, and we're yet to receive an answer. Now, I think it's an important uh, fact to be put on the table so that we know what we are actually dealing with here and how the problem will be resolved and what the plan or the pathway is to get there. Good Start Early Learning, the largest not-for-profit provider, estimates an additional 9,000 educators will be needed by July next year to match the influx of children expected under this policy. The government's been doing a lot of talking, but obviously, based on the fact that we don't have these important pieces of information to allay concerns, not much listening. Uh, back in 2019, in opposition, the now government campaigned on a platform of higher wages for early educators, but that seems to have been dropped from the platform, um, and the minister won't commit to higher wages for early educators. And indeed, when asked about it, they point to their fee-free TAFE places, which won't deliver immediate relief for the workforce, especially when they need it most. And of course, as I've said already, they're not happy, the educators, and they're leaving the sector in droves. Many centres are, of course, capping enrolments and asking families to keep their kids at home because they don't have enough staff to operate at full capacity. And we're seeing an increasing number of centres who are applying for waivers uh, because they can't retain teachers who leave the sector for better pay and better conditions in the education sector. And with more children set to enter the sector from July of next year, we need to understand how the government plans to ensure that there is a workforce to meet these needs and the support these kids deserve. In terms of childcare deserts and thin markets and access to care, there was a report commissioned and published earlier this year from the Mitchell Institute showing around one third of Australian families, or nine million Australians, live in a childcare desert. A desert is described as being one place for every three children, hardly making the mark. So 50 per cent of childcare deserts are located in metro locations and the other half in regional, rural and remote locations. But, as we've already said, this bill creates no extra places, and there's no interest from the government in plugging that hole. Where there are additional places going to open for all the new, where, you know, where are these new places going to open for all the new children entering the system? Uh, and what's the point of lowering out-of-pocket costs if you can't even get into care? Some key questions that need addressing here. While the government has said it will continue um, the Community Childcare Fund, which provides much-needed funding through grant rounds for services in disadvantaged and vulnerable communities, there's no money in this budget for the next round, nor can the government tell us when the next round of grants will open. And indeed, I think it's important to point out, if there was a real sense of care from the government around improving access, uh, they'd address uh, the areas struggling most. Now, in terms of the cost here, the last time the government uh, was in government, um, childcare fees jumped by 53 per cent in just a six-year period. 
And so the price tag of this policy has changed four times. It started out at 5.4 billion, then 5.1 billion, revised down to 4.5 billion, and now back up to 4.7 billion. That does make one wonder how much work has actually gone into this. I've already talked about the lack of modelling, the lack of clear data around how many places, how many new educators are needed and how certain issues will be resolved. But this jumping around of numbers, the revision of what the cost of the policy will be, I think does speak to the fact that that is undercooked. Um, Labor's policy, the $4.7 billion policy, is, as I understand it, costed for three days a week. And the average child attends early learning three days a week. If Labor really wanted to get kids attending care more days a week, it would have probably been prudent, I would have thought, to cost a policy for five days a week instead. In terms of higher income earners um, being set to benefit over low income earners, currently families with a combined income of up to $355,000 are eligible for a childcare subsidy. Under this bill, that will blow out to $532,000. There's been no modelling done on whether increasing the threshold to $532,000 will actually increase the number of hours worked by those families or if it will increase the number of days they put their child in care. We don't know um, what the families in those brackets currently do, whether they access care five days a week or whether they use a mix of informal and formal arrangements or whether they have a nanny or an au pair or a stay-at-home parent under this bill taxpayers will fork out an additional $22,500 for a family on a combined income of $360,000 a year, with a minimum of two kids. Now compare that with a family earning a combined income of $80,000. Taxpayers will fork out $2,488 uh, a year for them. It's clear there's been no due diligence done on this policy and no modelling, which is, of course, a great concern and should be for everyone. In terms of the out-of-pocket costs and the issue that all of us know our communities are dealing with, cost of living pressures, as I've already said, childcare fees skyrocketed by 53 per cent in six years, the last time the Labor Party governed this country. Out-of-pocket costs are already rising and fees will most likely rise before the 1st of July 2023. Uh, this will quite possibly erode a significant amount of the increased subsidies before they're even in place. Indeed, while we were in government, we kept out-of-pocket costs low. The latest CPI data from June of this year showed that childcare costs came down 4.6 per cent in the year to June 2022. And while the minister has said that this policy will not have an impact on inflation, I'm not quite sure how one can stick to that. We know that it's just not true. The government has no plans to address rising out-of-pocket costs or rising cost of living pressures in childcare. Their 12-month, $10 million ACCC inquiry announced is just too little, too late. And the inquiry will do nothing to alleviate current pressures in the sector, including, and importantly, workforce shortages and access. The inquiry doesn't start until 1 January next year and won't report back until the end of that year. That means that there will be nothing done to address the rising costs until 2024 at the earliest. Australian families can't wait that long. They need relief now. And with early education costs set to increase under this government, Australian families deserve to know if they'll really be better off under this government, as was promised. It's time that this government focused on less politics, less spin, and more on a plan to ensure a strong economy that supports Australian workers and their families by actually ensuring that policies that are brought forward are properly costed, that we understand how many extra places will be created or will be needed, where they'll be needed, and ensuring that all communities that rely on these services have access to them and that they happen in a timely fashion. As I've already said, um, and I think it is an important point to focus on, the underpinning of any good policy is good research, good data and good modelling. There's been next to no modelling done on this policy. There's no GDP modelling that's been done. No modelling on how many additional childcare places will be needed under this policy, nor how many educators will be needed. Uh, indeed, where will they come from? What cohorts are we looking to to, uh, to fill these spaces? And how do we get them to where in the community they're needed? There's no modelling on whether this will increase attendance to childcare by children and their families. Uh, of course, as I've already said, there was no understanding or knowledge around the makeup of 
those who will benefit most from this policy and how they currently use it, whether they'd use it more under the revisions. There's no modelling on whether the sector will be able to meet the influx of new children, nor any modelling on what areas the majority of these children will come from. The only modelling that's been done now is how many women have children aged zero to five and are either in part-time work or no work, which doesn't take into account uh, considering their income nor whether they want to return to work or take on more work. I think it's important to place on record uh, the coalition's investment in this space and what it yielded. We almost doubled childcare investment to $11 billion in the financial year 2022-23 and locked in ongoing funding for preschools and for kindergartens. We made the biggest reforms to the early childhood education system in over four decades. More than 1.3 million children have access to the childcare subsidy from around 1 million families. Under the coalition government, 280,000 more children are in early childhood education. We abolished the annual cap on, child, on the childcare subsidy and around 90 per cent of families using CCS are currently eligible for a subsidy of between 50 and 85 per cent. Since March of this year, we have provided a higher subsidy of up to 95 per cent for families with multiple children in early childhood education at once, increasing workforce participation and cheaper access to care. Our targeted extra support introduced in March of 2022 made a real difference, and childcare costs actually came down, as I said earlier in my contribution, by 4.6 per cent in the year to June 2022. And importantly, we saw, work, uh, we saw women's workforce participation reach record highs at 62.3 per cent uh, in May of this year, compared to 58.7 per cent when we came to government all those years ago. And in concluding, I obviously indicate that uh, I do have a second reading amendment um, that has been circulated, uh, which I would encourage senators to uh, consider supporting. It goes to the points that I've already made uh, around the need to ensure that this bill, which does cost a huge amount to the Australian taxpayer, does deliver benefits to where they're most needed, to make sure that this bill, costing a huge amount to the Australian taxpayer, uh, is founded on good policy and therefore is directed in a way that will continue to grow the economy and improve workforce participation for those in the community who currently need it. Um, Thank you very Senator much. Dunningham, I, think I understand yours might be the first second reading amendment that has been uh, flagged with the Senate, so I ask you to move it. I move the amendment, Mr Deputy President. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. The assistant legislation amendment, cheaper childcare bill 2022. And I'm going to start with the title of the bill itself. We heard during the Senate inquiry on this bill that the language of cheaper childcare undervalues the role of educators. Tamika Hicks, on behalf of the United Workers Union Early Childhood Education delegates, expressed bitter disappointment in her submission with the choice of words and questioned how educators could ever change the narrative about the value, recognition and importance they deserve without support from the top. We know early learning educators are some of the lowest paid workers. They were the first sector from whom JobKeeper support was withdrawn by the coalition during the pandemic. But they ought to be highly respected and their contribution to children's development, the community and society also highly valued. When we talk about respect, language matters. So the Greens support the view of UWU and other educators and consider the government should take a leading role in shifting public discourse by replacing the words in the title cheaper childcare with more affordable early education and care in the title of the bill. And I will be moving an amendment to that effect. And we should also commit to consistently using the term early education and care instead of the term childcare. Now to the bill itself. The bill increases the maximum childcare subsidy, CCS, percentage available to families and extends access to the CCS to all families earning less than $530,000. The bill introduces a new base level of 36 subsidized hours of childcare per fortnight for First Nations families regardless of their activity levels. It also introduces new transparency measures 
requiring large providers to report annually on their financial information and on lease arrangements to the Department of Education and enabling the department to publish this information. The bill enables providers to offer a discount on fees to their educators whose children also attend the center. Finally, the bill introduces good governance as a core eligibility requirement for provider approval and imposes a new requirement for providers to submit accurate records, receive gap fee by EFT and keep proper records. The Greens believe early childhood education and care is an essential service that should be universal, free, accessible, well-funded by the government, and never run for profit. While the bill does not go nearly far enough to achieve our vision of universal and free early learning and care, we support the bill as it represents a step in the right direction in making early learning affordable for more people. This was really such a good opportunity for the Labour government to fix the early childhood education and care system once and for all, but they unfortunately chose not to do that. So there are some key issues that still need to be addressed by the government, and the first of these is workforce. The early childhood education and care workforce is in crisis. It is estimated that around 9,000 more educators will be required because of the reforms introduced in the bill, and there are currently 7,000 vacancies already in the sector. Assuming attrition rates continue as they are, it is estimated that there will be over 10,000 vacancies next year. That would mean there would be a need for around 19,000 more educators in July next year when this bill comes into effect. A big driver of this attrition is poor pay, with degree qualified educators often being paid 20 to 30 percent less than primary school teachers. But also, governments have long failed to adequately value the profession. This is what early educators are telling us. I'm now going to read what a few of us have told us in the United Workers Union's submission to the inquiry into this bill. One says, I've been an early childhood educator for over 25 years and I'm now looking for another job, not in childcare, as I am so burnt out and over everything else, I don't feel the quality of care is there anymore as I have so much paperwork. We're just getting through the day. And another one says, we have always been taken for granted. And after all that we went through during COVID and all its implications where we were essential we still are not recognized for what we did. We're so tired of being undervalued, underpaid, and overworked. We are over our profession. And the last one I'm going to read out is this. With the cost of living rising, educators are leaving every day, as it is near impossible to survive on the wages we receive. After over 20 years in the industry, I've lost my mojo, mostly to the pay, but also educators' well-being. This is an atrocious condition for those people who serve such an essential, respected and professional role in society, that is the development of our children. Currently, the only measure in this bill aimed at attracting and retaining educators is the provision of a permissible educator discount that providers may offer to their educators. Under this measure, early childhood education and care providers will be permitted to offer a discount on fees to staff engaged as educators without affecting the amount of childcare subsidy payable for the educator. We support this measure and want it to be extended to all staff employed at centers, including cooks. But it is completely inadequate to address the scale of the workforce crisis. And let's not forget that a vast majority of workforce is women who already face a huge pay inequality gap. We support calls from the sector that the government should provide an urgent interim wage supplement. The government should implement protections to ensure that the wage supplement is passed on in full to educators. For clarity, this measure should be interim while longer term structural changes are undertaken to improve educator pay and conditions such as proposed changes to the Fair Work Act to address gender pay equity and improvements to bargaining processes. As the inquiry into the bill heard, immediate action is needed to address workforce shortages and the pay and conditions that workers face before the bill commences in July to ensure 
at a very basic level that the policy aims of the bill can be realized. The government has been made aware of this fact loudly and clearly and cannot ignore it any longer. Now moving to the activity test. The Greens welcome the new baseline entitlement to 36 hours per fortnight of subsidized early childhood education and care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, regardless of the activity levels of their parents. This change has been long overdue. The reality is, though, that the activity test as a whole is cruel, punitive, and beyond repair. It denies access to early childhood education and care for the most disadvantaged children and punishes families who have insecure casual work. The activity test should be abolished entirely, as many witnesses to the inquiry stated, including Early Childhood Australia, the Australian Child Care Alliance, UWU, um, The Parenthood, and Lisa Bryant. As Lisa Bryant put it, the activity test is a punitive measure introduced by the previous government, more or less on ideological terms, which said that only the deserving should get access to childcare. No child should be penalized for what their parents do or can't do. According to an August 2022 report from Impact Economics, the activity test is also contributing to at least 126,000 children from the poorest households missing out on early education. The report found that because of the activity test, single parent families are over three times more likely to be limited to one day of subsidized um, childcare per week. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families are over five times more likely to be limited to one day of subsidized care per week. Non-English speaking families are over six times more likely to be limited to one day of subsidized early learning and care per week. And low income families earning between 50,000 and 100,000 are six times more likely to be limited to one day of subsidized um, early learning and care per week. Removing the activity test would represent significant progress towards delivering universal early learning and would ensure the full benefits of the CCS increase can be realized by all families and children. Thousands of children from disadvantaged families are missing out on early education and care. Now, there is sufficient evidence to warrant abolition of the activities test immediately. The government does not need to uh, wait for the outcome of the Productivity Commission's inquiry to act on this. Um, and I will be moving an amendment to abolish the activity test and encourage my colleagues to support it. The Greens agree with the many stakeholders that supported a need for greater trans transparency in the early childhood education and care sector during the inquiry. Many early learning centers are run by large non-government providers. There has been a proliferation of for-profit providers in recent, recent years, and it is no coincidence that prices have risen by 41% in the past eight years. Given the substantial public money that providers receive, there is a compelling need for a robust transparency regime. I therefore welcome new reporting requirements for large providers, but consider that these requirements should be expanded to cover all providers and that this information should be publicly available. I also consider that for-profit providers should have to publicly report full finances, including their profitability, dividend payments, executive compensation, wages expenditure, investment in quality and inclusion, rental costs and fee increases. At the end of the day, education should never be for profit and we should be phasing this out altogether. And I will be moving amendments to that effect um, later on during our committee stage. Once the bill comes into effect, it will increase demands for early learning. This needs to be matched with a corresponding investment in providing extra places. As pointed out by regional and rural stakeholders during the inquiry, waiting lists in many places are already too long. According to a report from the Mitchell Institute earlier this year, 35% of the population live in neighborhoods classified as childcare deserts, where there are more than three children per one place. People in regional areas are more likely to live in this desert, while those in remote regions are highly likely to be living um, also in, in areas where there are limited places. The Mitchell Institute report noted that areas with the highest fees also generally have the highest levels of accessibility, suggesting that providers are not only establishing services where there are greater levels of demand, but where they are likely to make greater profits. The government must develop a plan to phase out for-profit 
early childhood education and care, which has clearly contributed to these inequities. And the government must work with states and territories to invest in greater availability of early childhood education and care. So the Greens will be pushing for the government to consider this issue in the context of the Productivity Commission's review of the sector, which will commence next year. And I look forward to working with the government on this review, which is badly needed. The Greens will keep pushing for an early childhood education and care system that we can be proud of, one where every child in this country has access to high quality, free, accessible early childhood education and care, no matter what their postcode, their bank balance or their background. And every early childhood educator is respected and has better pay and conditions which reflect their profession and, and the responsibility they take on in the development of our children. So I will be moving Green's second reading amendment which will reflect this by noting that the bill only provides limited support for families that are currently paying exorbitant fees for early childhood education and care, only makes modest changes to the activity test, does not do anything to address the workforce crisis, and then call on the government to make early childhood education and care universal and free, address the workforce crisis by immediately funding an interim wage supplement. High quality early childhood education and care can give children the best start in life and is a critical component of lifelong learning. It also enables women to pursue career opportunities and ensures they aren't held back because early learning and care is too expensive or not available. As a migrant parent with no family in Australia, I would not have had the opportunity to study or embark on my engineering career, nor my children had the opportunity of early development if it wasn't for affordable childcare at that time. The government should scrap stage three tax cuts, which benefit billionaires and the wealthy, and instead invest in an early education system, which is universal and free with higher wages and better conditions for workers. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm really pleased to rise today to speak on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Child, Cheaper Childcare Bill 2022. I rise to proudly speak on this bill today because this is a bill that will make a system fairer. This is a bill that will make a system more accessible and it is the bill that recognises the importance and value of early childhood education. Because for far too long, under those opposite, early childhood education has been overlooked and undervalued. But it is so incredibly valuable. Early childhood education gives our youngest Australians the best start to life, and it enables parents, especially mothers, to get back into work when they want to. And I know a few of those opposite in the other place may disagree with the value of this bill. It is particularly interesting to hear those opposite now concerned so deeply with access and workforce shortages and wages issues after 10 years of spending, spending 10 years treating early educators so poorly and dismissing their continual concerns that the early education industry be valued for what it is. Well, their disagreement is well documented uh, from the last uh, 10 years and in the media. We've heard things from those opposite like the best place for children is at home and that working women are outsourcing their parenting when they use childcare. Well, these old antiquated points of view do not belong in Australia in 2022 and they certainly do not belong on government benches. And it is why this government is so proud to introduce this bill, to pass it through um, the parliament and to deliver our promises to early childhood educators and to parents across the country. It was those opposite who ripped JobKeeper from dedicated early childhood educators during the pandemic. Early educators were the very first to be cut off when JobKeeper was ripped away. But early childhood educators were at the time at the forefront of the pandemic in settings where being so COVID safe was just impossible. Early educators were ensuring that other frontline workers could do their job, but they were completely dismissed by those opposite. 
So it is now com completely shocking and disgraceful and absolutely shameful to hear those opposite trying to uh, mask this behaviour when we talk about the lack of uh, educators and the workforce shortages that are being faced. Early childhood educators are underpaid. I don't think anyone on this side of the, of the um, chamber is arguing anything other than that. They are also undervalued, and they have been undervalued by those opposite when they were in government for almost a decade. They are leaving the sector in droves, and we know this because under the former government they were treated so poorly. They don't see value in their work add up to their pay packets. That is unfair, and it is time for that to change. Our incredible early childhood educators aren't care just caring for our youngest Australians. They're ensuring that our children are getting the best start to their lives and their education. It's why this bill will see more kids in childcare and more mums participating in the workforce. There is more work to be done to get wages moving for educators, to make the system fairer for educators. We don't pretend that this bill to deliver cheaper childcare, more affordable childcare, for every Australian who uses the system is a one-stop shop. We know that there is more work to do. And I'm really proud that this week, or this sitting fortnight, uh, the Senate will get a chance to have its say on the Secure Jobs and Better Pay Bill. Because if you support early childhood educators getting a pay rise, well then you can support this bill as well. I think early childhood educators would be pleased to finally hear those opposite finally concerned about their wages, finally concerned about the fact that their wages haven't kept up with the cost of living. It will be incredibly interesting to see what the crossbench and those opposite do when given a chance to support a bill that will deliver wage growth for workers just like early educators. It is only our government that understands the importance of early childhood education, and that's why we took this promise to the election. We know that making early childhood more affordable and more accessible to families is an economic measure. During the election, we heard from those opposite that, they, um, that we had a lack of economic policies. They're so dismissive of uh, this uh, policy as being an economic measure. They don't see the value in it. But we do, our government does, and that is why we are delivering through this bill. This is a policy that will make our entire country better. It will get more people into work. And it will not mean that mums are finally not financially punished for wanting to work more, which is how the system currently operates. This bill makes sense. It works for Australians. It works for young Australians, and it means better wages for Australians. Can I say finally to those early childhood educators who have spent decades uh, campaigning, uh, getting out there, talking about the value of their work, well, you have finally been listened to. We value the work that you do. We thank you for caring for our children. We could not do our jobs in this place or indeed across the country without the support of early childhood educators. You are valued. We uh, we support the work that you do, and this bill is just one step closer in delivering a better childcare system for every single Australian. We need to deliver cheaper childcare, and that is what this bill will do. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to speak on this government's uh, Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Cheaper Child Care Bill 2022. Uh, at a time when calls for this government to support families and businesses have fallen on deaf ears, particularly with ramming through their Shonky Industrial Relations Bill, uh, let me iterate the Coalition's wholehearted support for real policies and measures that will help to ease cost of living pressures faced by families. The coalition fully supports giving families the, and parents the choice to be able to determine uh, how best to raise and care for their children in whatever form uh, will best work for them, whether through formal or informal arrangements or the combination of both. Uh, while in government, the coalition was able to deliver uh, increased access to childcare, almost doubling the investment to $11 billion 
uh, locking in ongoing funding for preschool and kindergartens in 2022-23. Under the coalition, more than 1.3 million children had access to the childcare subsidy, and we abolished the annual cap on the subsidy. Uh, since March this year, we provided a higher subsidy up to a rate of 95 per cent for families with multiple children in early childhood education, helping to increase workforce participation and providing cheaper access to childcare. And in doing so, we continued with our track, record, our track record in supporting the economic empowerment of women. Women's workforce participation reached a record high of 62.3 per cent in May this year uh, under the coalition, compared to 58.7 per cent when Labor were last in office. So the gender, the gender pay gap has, has reduced from 17.4 per cent under Labor to 13.8 uh, per cent under the coalition. And this is something that the coalition uh, is very proud of achieving, very proud to have seen occur under our watch. Uh, these are just a few of the achievements of the former coalition government. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the fact that uh, the coalition have always supported Australian families. Uh, it's part of our creed and it's central to, to what we believe. It's central to, to who we are as a party. So we support uh, this bill in principle, uh, but we also have some valid concerns about the delivery of Labor's so-called cheaper childcare policy. Uh, over several weeks, as the Deputy Chair of the Education and Employment Committee, I attended hearings in Canberra and Melbourne, and we had a closer look at the feelings of this bill. Uh, at this point, I would like to acknowledge the, the work of the committee, uh, particularly the, the chair, who uh, does a, a very good job, I've got to say, in, in keeping things uh, running smoothly and, and in order. It's, uh, I think, so far this parliament, that particular committee, uh, we've had a, a huge amount of work to do. Uh, of course, the, the real signature uh, piece that's coming through at the moment is the, uh, is the, the industrial relations bill. And in, in, in despite the, the, uh, the, the huge disagreement across the committee in relation to some of the issues that come through that committee, we, we actually do work really well together. And on this particular bill, uh, we, we were able to work exceptionally well together. So I acknowledge all of my fellow committee members and, uh, and indeed the, the secretariat. Uh, they've had a huge uh, workload, uh, the Secretariat, particularly in relation to the Industrial Relations Bill, with only 22 days to be able to consider uh, a significant uh, bill and, uh, and report back. And, and, uh, even this, this committee, uh, this, the hearing on this legislation was actually a truncated experience as well, uh, very, very short in comparison to the traditional uh, way that uh, legislation is dealt with. Uh, by, by certainly my experience in the last parliament, uh, generally you know, bills are, are given much more consideration, but uh, we're seeing a pattern under this government of, of dealing with things very uh, hastily, um, and, uh, and it's happening uh, across many portfolio areas, and, I, and it's something that I hope this government doesn't continue with, because I think it's a real discredit to this place, uh, in particular the, the Senate, and, uh, and we've got to make sure that uh, legislation is properly scrutinised. Now, we did, we did manage to go through uh, this legislation nonetheless, even though it was a short time, and, uh, and we're able to highlight, I guess, quite a few uh, deficiencies in it, and, and I just want to take you through uh, some of those right now. So again, we, we certainly support uh, this legislation, we'll be voting uh, to support it, but there are, there are some, some issues that, that uh, we must deal with. Now, now we, why are we supporting this? Well, we, we are a party. That, uh, that, backs, uh, that backs in business. We're, we're a party that backs in families, that supports families. Uh, we're a party of economic stability and empowerment, and we're a party of sensible economic management. So it, it is concerning, however, that, that, uh, that this policy that we're seeing, that this legislation is, is lacking modelling. We heard from the, uh, from the department, and sadly, we heard that there was no economic modelling and there are, in fact, incorrect assumptions that are right throughout this bill. At the hearing in Melbourne on Wednesday, the 2nd of November, Treasury confirmed that the only modelling that they've done is on the impact of the policy on mothers with children aged zero to five. 
The Albanese government has argued time and again that this policy will increase access to early learning for families, increase workforce participation and reduce out-of-pocket costs. But what has been put forward by Treasury has painted a, a completely different picture. When questioned about the, the, the modelling underpinning this policy, Treasury admitted that they had done no modelling on the impact of the policy on the gross domestic product. No modelling on wage costs or increases, no modelling on the provision of early childhood, care, uh, early childhood educators and no modelling on the impact of rising fees. Now, the government's policy also assumes that by 1 July 2023 there will be enough places in the sector to meet the expected increased demand that the, that, and that fees will remain at their current level. Yet we have seen no modelling none at all, as to whether or not the sector will be able to meet the influx of new children. Now, the, the department took us through why it is difficult to do the modelling. Okay. So if we accept that, then how is it that this government is out there proclaiming the, the virtues of this policy and, and that we're seeing members uh, in the House of Representatives in their own electorates, uh, Labor members in their own electorates, claiming that this policy will increase X number of places, X number Will, will, will assist X number of families. Uh, the member for Kingford Smith said that it's going to create seven. It's going to help seven thousand families in their electorate. Well, well, how is it they're able to claim these sort of figures and these sort of stats when there's actually no modelling? There's no modelling to demonstrate any number at all. At all. So there's a real vacuum there that exists. Now, many educators have raised uh, important issues such as low wages. Mental health stresses, and Senator Faruqi took us through some of that in her contribution. Uh, we're seeing an increase of, of red tape and burnout as their top concerns, and the sector suffers suffers from a high attrition rate. Now, providers are, are struggling to attract and retrain, uh, retain educators. Centres are having to cap their services at 70 to 80 per cent capacity, sadly, due to a shortage of educators. Good Start Early Learning, a terrific provider, the largest non-for-profit non provider in Australia, estimates that an additional 9,000 educators will be needed by July 2023 to meet increased demand as a result of this policy. There are currently 7,200 vacancies in this sector. But once again, there's been no modelling done by the government to show how many educators will be needed nor how they will address the current workforce uh, crisis that we have. It's mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling, that no real modelling regarding access and educators has been done by the government. All of this is on top of nothing being done to address thin markets and childcare deserts where there are little to no services available to families. And I ask question throughout the inquiries time and again. I said, you know, you don't have to go far out of Perth, where I live. Uh, you don't have to go even to the outer suburbs uh, and you start to see childcare deserts, not to mention the, the absolute dearth of, of, uh, of provision in regional Australia and certainly in, in some of our more remote parts of our country. You go across the Kimberley and it's almost impossible. To, to, see, uh, to find a, a childcare or a childcare place. Uh, even in the Pilbara and in more populated cities like, uh, like Karratha, there's just a, a massive shortage and you just can't get access to childcare, which is obviously incredibly difficult because it's difficult for these towns to attract people to come and base themselves there and, and, and bring their families and work in these places. That often these places have a fly in, fly, in, fly out uh, environment. And so, uh, how do you attract workers when you can't get access to, to childcare in these places? And unfortunately, this bill does nothing to address those sort of issues. It does nothing to address those issues. The Mitchell Institute reported earlier this year that around a third of Australian families live within a childcare desert, where there is only uh, where there is only one place available for every three children. Now, $4.7 billion is, a, of course, an incredible amount of money, and not a single cent, not a single cent of that $4.7 billion is going to be spent 
on creating any additional places or services. So if you're one of those families that can't access a childcare centre, who can't get a place, then how is it possible that this policy is addressing your cost of living issue? The government's out there saying that this bill, and I remember it right through the campaign, saying we're going to address cost of living by reducing childcare. Okay, they're elected on that platform. I get that. They've got a mandate. But how is it that you can still say that, that this bill is going to address cost of living, when we know that this bill is not going to actually deliver an additional childcare place anywhere in the country? So if you can't access childcare, how is it possible that it's going to reduce your cost of living? Not to mention the accessibility challenges that are facing the young families uh, living in rural and re regional and remote areas. Uh, this is a, a critical issue. And sadly, this government have shown so far that they're just about the headlines and they're not actually interested in addressing these big challenges. Instead, they've presented this half-baked, undercooked policy, a very expensive policy, with zero modelling that's been done to back up their claims, expecting it to be some magic bullet to solve cost of living pressures for families. And the last time that Labor was in government, uh, childcare fees skyrocketed by 53 per cent. That's their record—53 per cent increase in just six years. Now, out-of-pocket fees are already rising. Inflation is rising. I'm seeing that. Fees will most likely rise before the 1st of July 2023, before the implementation of the impact of this bill is felt. Uh, fees will already rise by then, and the government have no modelling on how this could potentially erode the impact of subsidies before they're even in place. I mean, it's, uh, I, I did study economics when I was at school. I didn't do it post school. Uh, but one of the 101, and I know um, uh, <laughs> Senator Scar has his book there. He's got the, here, <laughs> basic economics, uh, supply and demand. I'm sure it's here. Senator Scar will, will point to the particular page that it's in. Look, it, it is. Uh, we, we know that when you increase demand, you, you, you see that there will be an increase in costs, and this is going to impact families. And there's nothing in this bill. There's nothing. Uh, in, in what the government have demonstrated to us so far that is going to protect families from rising costs of childcare. This subsidy could easily just get eroded, uh, easily just get taken up uh, without there actually being any impact on reducing costs of living. Uh, and our families need to know if they, uh, if they are really going to be better off under this bill. They need to know whether they will be better off under this Albanese Labor government, because so far, so far they haven't. Everything's going up. Everything's going up, except for the wages, in and the money in people's pockets. Our families, the backbone of our society, they're counting on this government, and our families, the future of our nation, are depending on them. And it's time for the Albanese Labor government to come up with some real policies that are actually going to support families, that are actually going to impact on the ground and that are going to deliver for the workers of this country. Thank you. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'll start by saying how welcome this bill is, improving access to more affordable early childhood education has so many upsides for uh, people, families in our communities, for our communities and, and for society more broadly. There are upsides for children in terms of their learning and development as well as their socialisation skills. Upsides for parents because it will enable a significant increase in workforce participation. And of course flow on upsides in terms of the economic benefits and productivity improvement from this. As the minister noted in his second reading speech, some 1.26 million families are estimated to, to benefit from this, uh, just over 23,000 of them here in the ACT. Treasury estimates that this bill will increase the hours worked by women with young children by up to 1.4 million hours per week in 2023-24. In the midst of a tight 
labour market and high cost of living, the extra work coupled with lower costs of early childhood education will make a big difference. Of course, with better access comes high demand, as pointed out by Senator O'Sullivan, and in many areas wait lists are long and workforce shortages acute. There is huge concerns across the sector that with the welcome and long overdue increases to pay rates in the residential aged care sector, competition for early childhood educators will only become more acute. With this legislation, clearly the need for, for early childhood educators to receive a pay rise is important, is, is crucial, is, is urgent. As people in the ACT have said to me, you can earn more working at Bunnings than educating and caring for the next generation of Australians. We need to change that urgently. Uh, the government's proposed industrial relations changes uh, to what is proposed to be the supported bargaining stream, and as I've told the government, this is part of the legislation that has my full support, uh, aims to do that. But we need to do more. Uh, if there is to be an increase in early childhood educator salaries, government needs to come to the table and fund it. And we also need to ensure that taxpayer-funded increases are flowing through to workers and not simply being absorbed as profits. I'm proposing a number of amendments to this bill and I'd like to thank the government, specifically Minister Clare and his team, for their open and constructive approach to considering the changes to the bill. The first change I'm proposing is to the name of the bill, and I note Senator Faruqi has also raised this issue. Pay rises for early childhood educators are essential, but there is more to recognising and valuing the critical work they do than just money. Language is important and influences the way we think and behave. That's why I support calls from the sector to amend the name of this bill to be about providing more affordable early childhood education and care. Talking to early childhood educators, there is a lack of recognition for the work that is done in this sector. I hope that this is something that will begin to address this, that will begin to place more value on the important work that early childhood educators are doing because I think that there's few things more important than playing a role in shaping the lives of young people, of, of children. I think it's, it's also important to recognise the way that centres operate and the valuable roles different staff play. Uh, talking, after talking to the government about this, I'm really pleased that the government has agreed to expand the scope of the optional discount that can be offered on fees to the children of educators working in that centre to include cooks. This bill is really a really important step forward, but there's more work to be done in pursuing this reform, especially when it comes to improving access for disadvantaged children, reviewing the activity test and sector workforce requirements. The government has committed to tasking the Productivity Commission with undertaking a comprehensive review of these issues in the sector more broadly. I believe this will serve a more constructive material outcome than a statutory review for this particular piece of legislation. I note concerns about the lack of modelling and agree the need for more thorough modelling and particularly how important reviewing legislation is to ensure that it's actually doing what it uh, sets out to do. I can't think of too many other uh, places where you simply try and deal with an issue set it and then largely forget about it. We need to be actively reviewing, monitoring and, you know, when needed, amending and, and ensuring that we are heading down the right path. Delivering on the aim of implementing a universal 90 per cent subsidy for all families is a worthy goal and I look forward to supporting the government's effort to implement this on behalf of the people of the ACT. Thank you. Senator Pocock, Senator Polly. On the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Cheaper Childcare Bill 2022.
2022. Under the reckless governing by those opposite, childcare costs were allowed to increase by 41 per cent over the past eight years, and the cost of living was allowed to skyrocket. This has had a devastating impact on Australian families and their ability to send children, their children to early education and care. It is also a further reflection of the lack of importance and value that the coalition places on women in the workforce and the benefits of childcare and early childhood education. The Cheaper Childcare Bill is an important and necessary bill that will help make a meaningful difference to the lives of Australian families, to the Australian job market and to the Australian economy. It is a multi-billion dollar commitment to Australian families and to our children, and it upholds another Albanese government election commitment because we value families and children and we want to see them thrive. And as a mother myself, I understand just how important it is to have the options available for affordable early education and care for our children. This bill is a crucial step in helping women return to the paid workforce. Now, I make the reference to paid work because, as everyone who is a parent will agree, parenting is one of the hardest and most underpaid jobs you will ever do, and I don't want to dis diminish the value of that important work. But those parents who want to return to the paid workforce, this bill will make it more accessible for them. It is widely known that in Australia, mothers are typically the parents who spend more time raising their children. In 2016, the Australian Institute of Family Studies found that approximately 5 per cent of families had a stay-at-home father compared to 27 per cent having a stay-at-home mother. It was also estimated that fathers spent approximately 13 hours a week on childcare, compared to a mother's 27 hours. This is a huge difference, and for mothers who want to return to work, they need affordable childcare, otherwise it simply isn't a feasible option. The Australian Bureau of Statistics announced in February 2022 that there were approximately 745 people who were wanting to work and were able to begin that work within four weeks but were still unable to. 113,600 of these people were unable to work due to childcare constraints, and 106,800 were women. Better enabling the approximately 106,800 women who have been unable to join the workforce will contribute to gender equality by accelerating work to close the work participa workforce participation, pay and, very importantly, superannuation gaps. According to the Workplace Government Equality Agency, the national gender pay gap is currently 41.1 per cent. This bill will help reduce this and will allow women to better support themselves now and into the future. This is a win for women, for their families and for the Australian economy. This bill will enable more children to access early childhood education and care. This is so important when it comes to helping set up our children for formal schooling in later years. This bill and the support these approximately will approximately help 16,400 Tasmanian families. They will get the help that they need, and this is a significant step in filling these gaps, and it will also reduce the cost of living pressures. These parents who want to and will be able to return to the workforce where their skills and knowledge will be greatly appreciated. With the timely passing of this legislation, these changes should come into effect by July 2023. This will be such a relief for Australian families. This bill is not a handout. It's an investment in women, in children, in families, in the Australian job sector and, most importantly, it will enable these women and these families to contribute to our economy. Supporting families and children in Australia should be a bipartisan issue. We shouldn't be them versus us, so I urge those opposite and around the chamber to support this very important piece of legislation. Thank you, Senator Polly. There are no further speakers. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I thank those senators who have spoke on the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Cheaper Child Care Bill 2022 and for their contributions to this debate. It is a bill which is good for children, good for families and good for our economy. 
It will support the development of our youngest Australians in those crucial early years. It will provide more choice to parents, in particular women, in choosing to re-enter the workforce and work more hours, which is so desperately needed in the economy. Treasury estimates that these measures will unlock the equivalent of up to 37,000 full-time workers in the first year alone. It will make early education and, ch and care cheaper for more than a million families. It will introduce a base level of 36 subsidised hour subsidized hours per fortnight of early childhood education for First Nations children as well. It will improve transparency and integrity measures in the sector, and it delivers on a key commitment made to Australian families in the 2022 federal election. I thank Senator Pocock for his contributions to this bill, and the government will support those amendments. Uh, this bill has won widespread support from families, the business community and the early childhood education and care sector, and I commend it to the chamber. Thank you, Minister. Now, I do believe Senator Pocock has an amendment to move. I'll just check with the Now, in my absence, before I got here, I believe Senator Dunningham uh, moved uh, his amendment. So the question is that Senator Dunningham's uh, motion, uh, move, uh, motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. The no's have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint oh, Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Pratt as teller for the noes. Order. There being 25 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I advise senators there are two more amendments, second reading amendments. The next one I'm going to put is standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. So the question is that um, the amendment is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bell for one minute. One minute. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. <coughs>
kept quiet, please, because the um, clerks need to be able to hear the count. Order, there being 12 ayes and 47 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I will now move to the second reading amendment, standing in the name of Senator David Pocock. So the question is that the second reading amendment is moved by Senator David Pocock be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. There is a committee stage requested. Before we move into committee stage, we'll just read the uh, second reading amendment. So the question is that the second reading am uh, as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to family assistance and for related purposes. Thank you very much. All right, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, uh, it is so ordered. So we will move to, I believe, Senator Faruqi's amendment on uh, sheet 1738. 
Senator Faruqi. Thanks, Chair. I'm just getting the right page. That's all right. You're not alone. No. No. Uh, Senator Faruqi's got a couple, has she? 1738. Yes. yes. Uh, thanks, Chair. I move Green's amendment on sheet 1738. This amendment is about changing the short title of the bill. Um, and the reason for that is that cheaper childcare is a way of framing a sector um, which is not respectable. And I did speak a bit about it in my second reading speech, uh, but um, educators have really been disrespected and undervalued for a very long time. And as I said earlier, language really does matter. So my amendment changes the title, a short title of the bill from cheaper childcare to more affordable early education and care. And I understand that Senator Pocock has a similar amendment for the long title of the bill as well. So these should really be taken in conjunction. Um, there is no reason that both the titles should not be changed. So I move the amendment. Minister. Uh, Acting Deputy President, and I thank uh, Senator Faruqi for uh, her discussion on this. And we had a, a question in estimates about it as well uh, two weeks ago. And I can certainly say that uh, this is a government that respects the role of early educators uh, in the community. Uh, we value the role that they play in the community, and I think we've demonstrated that by our actions in government, um, supporting a pay rise, our efforts to tackle the workforce shortage uh, that we have underway. Uh, and as I said in estimates, there obviously is a collision here with uh, messages that we took to the election that we intend on delivering on. So uh, we will oppose uh, this amendment from Senator Faruqi. But I can assure Senator Faruqi and I can assure the public in general is that this is a government that respects the role of early educators. I know um, every time I hear uh, Minister Clare talk about this issue, um, he's very, very respectful of early educators. I think he's actually got a cousin um, who's been very good at, uh, at letting him know uh, what the official job title is. So uh, we're very much respectful of it, but we don't uh, believe that uh, this is the bill, uh, a name change is the appropriate thing to do. The question is that uh, the Greens Amendment 1 on sheet 1738, moved by Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
time. That's it. Thank you. The question is, I'm sorry, can you lock the doors? Thank you. Okay. The question is that the Greens Amendment 1 on sheet 1738, moved by Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Those, uh, the ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, the noes shall pass to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim to tell it for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan to tell it for the noes. Okay. All good. Okay. Order. The result of the division is eyes 14, noes 33. The amendment is decided in the negative. Thank you. We will now move to Opposition Amendment 1 and 2 on sheet 1731 by Leave Together. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, uh, I move that items uh, 1 and 2 on sheet 1731 by Leave be taken together. And in moving that amendment, I'll speak now. Uh, Chair, uh, I've outlined a range of the reasons the coalition is moving these amendments in the contribution I made earlier and I know other colleagues have also spoken to this and it does come down to the need for information to understand uh, whether this policy uh, and the expenditure attached to it will hit the mark whether it will do what it is said uh, this um, policy will do in terms of providing extra places and enabling more people to return to work. And so, to that end, um, 
and uh, there was a significant portion of the debate that took place in the second reading uh, around uh, modelling um, and what had been modelled and what had not. Um, and we, we know that uh, there was not a great deal of modelling undertaken. Uh, it's been made patently clear by the lack of response from the government throughout this entire debate, not just here or the other place, but publicly too, around the lack of effort that has gone into understanding uh, the impact this policy would have and indeed whether there would be benefits flowing. Um, and I was able to cite just one example of a small demographic that had a small amount of modelling undertaken relating to the impact on them, but at the same time talked to a huge range of areas that had not even been considered. And so the amendment, amendments that we're moving here um, in terms of a review of the Act mean that the minister will be uh, needing to cause an independent review um, around the operation of the am uh, amendments made by this Act. Uh, and there are a list of items there which I think are central um, to understanding the success or otherwise of this legislation. Um, understanding the impact that the amendments that are being made through what we're debating now on issues like the cost of childcare fees and the loss of subsidies to price increases and inflation I think is important to properly understand exactly what impact may be felt by the household, by the end user, by the working parent or the um, client of the childcare service and the education service. Uh, what impact will be felt there? Can there be guarantees made that will enable a negative outcome on in this area not to be felt by households. We know, uh, based on the information provided to us to date, that there hasn't been modelling undertaken on these issues. And I would have thought we're all in the business of problem solving, we're all in the business of making sure that Australia is a better place, uh, that uh, those who seek to work can do so more freely, those who want to take advantage of this great service in the early childhood education and childcare sector uh, are able to do so. But we don't know whether there will be a loss of subsidy due to price increases in inflation uh, and whether child, the cost of childcare fees will go up. So it is important to understand what impact will be felt by the policy levers being pulled in this legislation, and that's what, uh, one of the elements of uh, what this review would look into. Um, we also, I think, importantly need to understand uh, in this review what the creation of um, well, what creation of new and additional childcare places would occur. Uh, we know that there is a huge amount of demand out there, and we've heard figures uh, in various elements of this uh, debate raised up to 20,000 places uh, were cited as being the shortage in parts of Australia. So understanding what creation of new and additional childcare places will occur as a result of the amendments in this legislation. Uh, because, as I think has been said in the debate, and whether or not these uh, amendments give effect to this or not is a different question. But the point's been made that, in theory, it will occur. But no one can tell us how many. No one can tell us where. And that is a problem, and that is why having a review to look at this as well is incredibly important. Also, the changes to service gaps across Australia, particularly in rural and regional and remote Australian communities, and I know that Senator Mackenzie will probably have some remarks to make about this, perhaps with other colleagues as well, but it is an important thing. We talked about uh, uh, childcare deserts where services are thin to non-existent on the ground, where the demand outstrips supply by three to one. Um, are, are we going to see these gaps filled? Are we going to see these holes plugged? Are we going to see the problems for these communities when it comes to access to this service, uh, this vital economic service? Are we going to see those problems solved uh, as a result of this legislation? Again, because there was no modelling done, we don't know. Uh, we can only assume, based on what we know to be uh, the experience under our time in government, um, we, we know that uh, a lot more, more needs to be done, but understanding, of course, uh, what impact will be had, and we don't know what impact will be had as we go to spend in excess of $4 billion on this policy uh, resulting from this legislation. Also, the changes to Indigenous children's attendance, specifically an increase in the number of Indigenous children 
attending childcare. No modelling done on that. An important area of policy, an important consideration in the deliberation of this legislation. For those communities out there in regional and particularly remote communities, how will these changes specifically impact on them, the needs they face, and uh, the improvement of life outcomes for them? And every senator who has spoken on this legislation has, has pointed to the importance of a solid early childhood education sector and the foundation that it provides for young Australians, uh, no matter where they live in the country. We know that there are improved outcomes for those who gain access to a good system that provides needs. But we don't know, though, what changes there will be to Indigenous children's attendance, specifically if there will be any increase in the number of Indigenous children attending childcare or early childhood education. Uh, again, something I think that is very, very important uh, in relation to <coughs> the passage of this legislation. One thing that has been spoken about a lot, again, that we don't have any detail around, is the number of early childhood educators and any workforce gaps that exist. The review we're proposing here would uh, take us through that. We'd understand exactly where the gaps are and what problems are faced. Uh, in, in gaining that information, we would then be able to uh, support the government in creating solutions to any impediments there are to finding those childhood educators and where those workforce gaps exist. Understanding those uh, issues, those hurdles, those impediments is central to ensuring that we can address the problem. But to date, here we are passing legislation with no modelling, no understanding of these gaps, of who we're looking for, how we're going to attract them, uh, and what additional pressure might be applied to the workforce, uh, what increasing of the gap might occur as a result of these changes. So important again to have a review into this particular part of the legislation. Uh, we also want to make sure that we look at any increases to workforce participation rate and, in addition to that, any increases in productivity. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the economic outcomes of this legislation, what it will mean uh, for communities, for uh, an economy that needs every bit of boost it can get. Uh, and I think understanding what this injection of in excess of $4 billion of expenditure to support and augment uh, this sector, understanding what impact that will have in the economy is, I think, an important part of what we should be considering here. As I've said already, we don't know because the modelling hasn't been done. Um, there have been varying figures around even the cost of this bill. As we move forward, all of us want to be solution providers and problem solvers, understanding how this policy will translate into increased workforce participation and increased productivity, I think, is exceptionally important. I don't think it's something that we should be forgetting as we go into this. Everything we do, particularly with the pressures that we face across the economy, across society, across every region of our country, we should understand what improvements uh, that there would be made to economic outcomes in terms of workforce participation and productivity. Uh, in calling for this review, we do want to ensure that both quantitative and qualitative research is conducted. I think it is important to understand not just the numbers and stats, but also uh, the improved outcomes for uh, people across the country, households and families who want to take advantage of this service. As I said right at the beginning, we all want to make sure that this sector um, is functioning as best it can to support the needs, wishes and dreams of Australians, better outcomes for young Australians uh, with a good foundation. Uh, it's a, an important amendment and I hope uh, colleagues will look to support it because having data is central to a good outcome. Thank you, Senator Dunning. Senator McKenna. Is the minister going to oh, I did glance for the minister, but I think you're going to get the call. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, it is hard to be it's hard not to be cynical that this Labor government has any commitment whatsoever to those nine million of us who don't live in capital cities in this country. We have before us a childcare piece of legislation that doesn't add one single place to the overall burden in our country and, more significantly, for those of us that live in communities where we're in a childcare desert, 
not one single additional place, no creative thinking about how families, and particularly women who live in rural remote Australia, are going to be able to access childcare so that they can actually get back into the workforce. Everyone in this place talks a big game about workforce participation of women and how they're so keen to facilitate that. But you know what? It just matters where you live with these guys. It absolutely matters where you live. Because if you are a woman who lives in one of these childcare deserts, then you can't actually access the childcare places that you need. And as Senator Dunningham made clear, these are thin markets. These are not necessarily communities that can support the long and expensive um, daycare model. So it actually required a little bit of thinking, other than just tapping into United Voice and saying, what do you need? Uh, let's, we're in go government now. Let's uh, make sure you have everything you need as one of our um, key stakeholders and constituencies and basically do nothing to assist, nothing to assist rural and regional women, rural and regional families and children uh, with their childcare needs. You've announced $4.7 billion in the budget. It's quite incredible. That's a hell of a lot of money to spend in a policy area where you actually don't make a fundamental difference to the most marginalised and most vulnerable in these communities. We're actually more interested in helping out middle-class suburbs in capital cities, and we might ask why you're more interested in assisting those families, over people who cannot actually access this service at all. And I would seek the Greens' support for the opposition's amendment here. This is a sensible amendment that seeks to hold a timely review into this legislation to see if it actually does deliver the types of outcomes that we all want to see with our childcare system. We want to see greater uh, workforce participation by women, but we also need to make sure that these services don't depend on your geography, on where they're being delivered. Minister, could you please tell me how many extra childcare places are being delivered in your home state of Queensland as a result of this bill? Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. And I'll respond to uh, the uh, points from Senator Dunningham and Senator McKenzie as well. Uh, and uh, just in terms of the substance of uh, these amendments, um, what we've been very clear about is uh, where we think the review should take place, uh, and we believe that there are uh, challenges in this sector, which is why we've asked the ACCC and we've provided them with $10.8 million to undertake a price inquiry into childcare in 2023, and this will consider the effectiveness of the existing price regulation mechanisms the drivers of rising early education costs, the impact of these childcare subsidy changes on out-of-pocket fees. Uh, so we've asked the ACCC to do that, and we think that's complementary uh, to the legislation that we obviously hope to pass today. The government is also committed to tasking the Productivity Commission with conducting a comprehensive review of the sector. Um, that review will commence in the first half of next year, uh, and both of these reviews we think are comp comprehensive and therefore do not require additional reviews at this time. Uh, there's no doubt there are challenges uh, in the sector, and I think it's obviously not for other politicians to lecture uh, colleagues on self-reflection, but surely those opposite do have to have a little bit of self-reflection that they've just concluded 10 years in government and we've inherited this mess that we are trying to fix. Um, they make no mention of that in their contributions here. Um, they say that they are supporting this bill. I have not heard one positive comment out of any of them in terms of their contributions to this, um, which is what uh, we took to the election and are hoping to implement here today. Um, so we know that there are uh, challenges in many communities and around workforce, uh, which is why we are actually delivering on that. So we've got a, a workforce action plan that we are doing, uh, and we also, in the budget, committed to almost half a billion dollars. Um, to uh, the Community Childcare Fund, which obviously goes to supporting 
uh, many childcare places in communities uh, where they don't have uh, the necessary support there. So that's something that we are going to continue. Uh, this helps ensure families have access to early childhood education in areas where there are not a lot of services. Uh, and I also note that some state governments have announced substantial reforms uh, in this space as well, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria, around establishing new services in areas of need. Um, so through providing more subsidy to families, there will be an increase in demand, and obviously that will go towards uh, there being um, the market responding and creating more spaces and more services at the same time. And our workforce initiatives, um, which are comprehensive, uh, including fee-free TAFE and additional higher education places, will increase the availability of educators to meet demand. So there's a combination of things that are happening in terms of what the government response is, um, and that is in regards to the Community Childcare Fund, but it also goes to uh, the increase in demand that will come from this legislation, uh, meaning that we'll, the market will respond and create more places at the same time. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. I note the minister uh, refuses to uh, accept the fact that this bill will not add any additional places in his home state of Queensland. Minister, um, when you talk about the review that uh, you're proposing, ACCC, Productivity Commission, for those of us uh, that don't live in capital cities, it is our lived experience that unless you explicitly ask bodies to examine the impact of government policy on rural, regional and remote communities, on workforce participation of rural, regional and remote women, of the impact of your policy decisions uh, on country kids, their development and growth uh, and our future prosperity, then it just doesn't happen. And unfortunately, our experience under your government thus far shows that it doesn't happen. You've in fact cut the very funding mechanisms that have built childcare centres and facilities in country communities, the Building Better Regions Fund and others, that you want to typify as wasteful spending in our communities that have actually led to families being able to access childcare, often for the very, very first time. So excuse me if I'm not you know, dancing in the streets over $4.7 billion to satisfy middle-class income earners in capital cities and your union mates from United Voice. I want to particularly put on the record in the time that I have available to me um, the hard work of Anne Webster, the, member, the National Party member for Mali, um, who has just championed this issue for so many of her uh, country towns and regional centres. Seven towns in the Mallee right now are without childcare. Birchip, Bort, Kahuna, Matoa, Pyramid Hill, Rainburn, Rainbow and Wedderburn. Um, other larger centres, there are long waiting lists. One centre in Mildura has a waiting list of 200 kids. And this is a regional capital that exports to the world. And the latent capacity, particularly of women in that community, all bar for the access to childcare, cannot pursue their careers uh, and their jobs to provide for their families as a result of this. And you, you say, you know, many state governments are stumping up. Well, you know, cooey Daniel Andrews, you've got five days. Labor has not only ignored the need for services in the Mallee, but deliberately scrapped the funding, as I said, provided for this in the form of Building Better Regions Fund Round 6 and the Community Development Grant programs. And Anne Webster has people in Mali who want to go back to work, professionals who offer their towns vital experience and its skills but can't simply because there is no place to safely uh, place their children to receive quality childcare education in a safe manner. Minister, how many additional places as a result of $4.7 billion of funding are going to be available in rural and regional Australia as a result of your government's legislation? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And as I said, Senator McKenzie, 
Uh, we know that there are many challenges uh, in many parts of the country around access to early childhood education, which is why we are confident that uh, making it cheaper and more affordable uh, will see that more families take up that option. And we also see uh, that there will be a response um, from the market to increase these facilities uh, because they know there will be more demand. But we've also got um, the, the uh, commitment that we made to the Community Child Care Fund uh, that will obviously go uh, some way towards tackling some of these challenges. And you mentioned some of our regional funding. Um, well, we do have a focus and a fund that is being set up that will be available for regional communities to apply to. But unlike your funds, ours will be transparent, ours will be accountable, um, they will open at regular times, there'll be a guideline. Um, guidelines for people to follow so communities know when they can apply, uh, they know the rules that will apply and they know how they can apply uh, and when they'll be successful rather than those ones that uh, yourself and the former Deputy Prime Minister dreamt up um, that uh, suited you but didn't actually suit the majority of Australians. So uh, We take these issues seriously. We take integrity and accountability seriously uh, and that's why that we are setting up appropriate funding mechanisms for regional Australia uh, that will be able to benefit from those funds. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. Minister, through you, Chair. Minister, as, as a former minister that actually funded a round that was supposed to open in August this year um, to actually support these types of facilities being um, supported in communities such as I've mentioned in the Mallee. Um, I find it the height of hypocrisy that you have um, the hubris to stand in this place and call out somehow a lack of integrity around how our government administered childcare funding and grants programs across the board. You've failed. You've actually failed in your attempt to categorise spending in rural and regional Australia as wasteful, because it's not. It's not in your seats. It's not where people vote for you, because they do vote for the Liberal, the Nationals, the Country Liberal Party uh, and other independents. They're never going to be voting Labor. You know why? Because every time you get into the Treasury seats, you show exactly the kind of disrespect you are with this legislation and others in turning your backs on the very needs and critical investment required for the nine million of us that don't vote for you, but we are still Australians and deserve access, equitable access to services. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to say a few, make a few comments on the amendment um, that the coalition has put up, uh, Senator Dunyan's amendment. Um, and first up, I must say, it's pretty rich for the Liberals and the Nationals to stand up here and suddenly start caring about early childhood education and learning when it was their government that took early childhood educators off JobKeeper, the first sector that they took off. And they showed their dis disrespect for the sector and the people who worked in that. Also, in the 10 years that they were in government, you know, uh, costs for early childhood education and care have, you know, have become the most expensive in the world, and the affordability, accessibility hasn't improved one single bit. Um, so if you talk about hypocrisy, let's talk about that. But having said that, um, the amendment right in front of us is an amendment that the Greens will support, because it is about accountability. It is about, as Senator David Pocock said earlier, we make these changes here and then we forget about them. It is about making sure that the changes um, that are made today um, and that come into effect in July next year are changes that um, actually have an impact. And if not, then things will need to be changed. You know, what's being proposed in these amendments is a pretty targeted review about the impact of this bill in particular. And given the concerns that we have had about some of the provisions of the bill in terms of you know, how it will meet what is needed to be met in terms of more, more places and um, wage rises and, you know, b making sure that there are educators that are available for those places. I think this review is pretty appropriate. There is no reason why a targeted review can't take place alongside the more expansive reviews that the government 
um, is intending on doing anywhere, like the ACCC and the Productivity Commission. Um, so the Greens, on principle, will be supporting this amendment. Senator Sullivan. Acknowledge the green support for this amendment. Thank them very much for it because it's uh, it's absolutely critical that this review happens, uh, and I'm pleased that on the strength of that that this review will happen. It's very disappointing that the government doesn't accept uh, uh, the, this amendment and and won't be opening themselves up to scrutiny of this uh, of the impact of this bill. Uh, I just want to very speak very quickly just about the uh, the, the importance of of looking at uh, Indigenous children's attendance. Uh, in childcare, noting that this bill does increase the number of hours that uh, uh, Aboriginal families are able to uh, access, uh, for lifting it from I think 25 to or 24 to 36 hours uh, across a fortnight, uh, without um, uh, having to undergo the activity test. Uh, the, the, the questions that we asked through the committee stage that weren't uh, able to be answered and still haven't been answered, uh, I understand. Uh, is, is what is the average number of hours that Indigenous children are taking up already, even though they're eligible already for 24 hours? Uh, what is the, uh, what, what, what is the, what's the average number of, uh, that, that, that's actually been taken up? Uh, given that this bill will open it up to 36 hours, well, if, if the current average is below 24, then you know, just increasing the number doesn't actually change anything. It doesn't actually change anything. What needs to happen is there needs to be much greater emphasis put on uh, activation and put on engagement in Indigenous communities in, in helping people. And of course, you need to have places for those people to go to in the first place. Uh, so these sort of measurements, uh, this review is, is really, really critical uh, to, to ensure that, uh, that the objectives of this bill are in fact met. Because it's a lot of money, $4.7 billion, a lot of taxpayers' dollars that are going into this, into this, uh, into this program, and we've got to make sure that, uh, that it's actually targeted and it's meeting, meeting the needs. Now, right now, in Western Australia, we have a, an absolute crisis, absolute crisis going on in, in Indigenous communities across Australia. Uh, not just in remote and regional parts, but indeed even in the capital city of Perth, uh, where there are young people, young teenagers uh, in particular, that are committing crimes, that are, that are out and about, uh, that are you know, particularly in, in the remote parts of the country, uh, places like Kununurra and even, even in Broome, you wouldn't consider Broome remote, but there's, there's now barbed wire fences that have been put up uh, around uh, uh, around, around premises uh, to, to stop young children from going in and, and breaking into these places at night. Now, I hazard to guess that uh, the, the issues that, that are occurring in these communities uh, are a result of there being a failing in, uh, in the early years, in the early years development uh, of, of those, those children. And uh, I'm not in, in any way saying that we need to institutionalise Children by, you know, just sending them off to uh, off to um, uh, childcare, uh, but uh, I, I think there is a, a real need to make sure that there is an investment put into the development of of, uh, of children, and particularly in those early years, we know that that, that children's brains grow by 300% in the first three years of their lives. So we know that uh, by the time they're they're five. Uh, the, the brain has already grown to, to 90 per cent of an adult-sized uh, brain, and, and the, in those early years, the, the frontal lobe of the brain is where the de is, is developed. Um, uh, uh, development uh, and, and emotions like empathy, like, like, like reasoning, is all developed in those early years. And if children aren't given the very best chance uh, at life by being provided with uh, uh, the correct the right environment that uh, that enables them to grow and develop, then we know that they're going to be impeded for life. And so right now, Bankshire Hill Correction Centre, the juvenile correction centre in Perth, is um, is at a crisis, at a crisis point, and it's sadly filled with too many, uh, too many, too many uh, Indigenous kids, and uh, and and a lot of these children. I used to go in there as a youth worker many, many years ago, and. You would uh, encounter children that have got no empathy, they've got no 
sense of the impact of their crime and what they've, what they've done. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of that stems back to how, uh, to what happened when they were young, very young children, uh, the, the environment they were exposed to. And, and for, sadly, for many, it's the fetal alcohol spec spectrum disorder that they were born with uh, because of the, uh, the consumption of alcohol in, uh, in utero. And uh, so th these are issues that, that need to be resolved. Uh, and I think uh, early learning and early childhood development plays a critical role in helping families, particularly young families, uh, and particularly, you know, we, we've got situations where there's uh, children that are having children, you know, t young teenagers that are now uh, mothers and, and, uh, and are struggling in raising their children. Having the services there in communities to help them is absolutely vital to ensure that they can be uh, they can go on to live uh, those children can go on to live productive lives and uh, if the mothers themselves uh, weren't provided that opportunity when they were infants and when they were very young children then we're going to make sure that we stem the flow that we actually break that cycle and so it's really really critical and I'm hoping that uh, this 4.7 billion dollars uh, that is being put in will go uh, will go as Senator McKenzie was saying uh, into regional and Remote Australia. We can't be sure that it will because there's no modelling that's been done. But I'm uh, I'm pleased that this review is going to happen because we will actually be able to check the uh, the progress to see whether or not, in fact, it does impact on the ground where it's necessary. That we're able to ensure that young families uh, and young children, in particular, in disadvantaged communities, are given the very best chance. At, um, at, at life, and so uh, just having a review that actually looks into this, that checks whether or not there is access, uh, and in fact it does actually lift while you're lifting it from 24 to 36 hours, uh, the number of hours that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families can access uh, services without being uh, going through the activity test. I think uh, just actually seeing if this bill, if this change actually does make that impact then uh, that's a very good thing. And I urge the government to consider actually joining with their partners in, in, in government uh, in supporting this, uh, in this amendment, because I think it's going to be very important and be a good show of faith to the Australian people and indeed to regional and rural Australia that you are on their side. Senator Knappert, Chairman Bill Price. <coughs> Colleagues, I concur with the concerns um, Senator O'Sullivan is expressing with regards to ensuring that some of our most marginalised children in this country get the best start in life. Um, it is a deep concern with regard to attendance rates, whether it's in childcare for Indigenous children, whether it's in schooling for Indigenous children. Uh, the relationships between families and schools, uh, education, begin with early early childcare. In a former life, I, um, I was very, very privileged to be able to uh, bring messages of uh, education uh, and health uh, and um, a better way of living to an early childhood audience, to early childhood audiences throughout um, the Northern Territory in remote communities, throughout Queensland in remote communities, throughout New South Wales, throughout South Australia. Uh, I understand how important it is for those relationships to begin during my previous um, life on the road, presenting to children in, in musical fashion, engaging with those families and ensuring that those families started their relationships that the parents were attending um, in attendance while the wonderful Yamba the Honey Ant was um, presenting to those children, often kicked off those relationships, the importance of those relationships with parents in schools and in child cares. That's where it all begins. So I concur with my, my colleagues here and his concern. It also offers the opportunity to intervene early in a child's life. We know that Indigenous children uh, experience some of the highest rates of domestic and family violence in their homes. They are, uh, experience the highest rates of child sexual abuse, which is why our leader of the coalition is calling for for, is calling for a, a royal commission into the sexual abuse of Indigenous children, because it is, it is much needed. These are all issues that Indigenous children are confronted with, and particularly our most marginalised in regional Australia. Uh, this government would be, um, it'd be 
in their best interests to ensure that they are keeping um, these children front and centre with this particular bill and ensuring that they are getting what they need. But another issue that concerns me uh, is that this bill seeks to legislate a new definition of an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander child into the Family Assistance Act. Uh, this appears to be the first use of such a definition in Commonwealth primary legislation. So some concerns have been raised regarding this new definition as it doesn't exist in the Family Assistance Act currently and it is different to the definition within the Social Security Act. Currently the Commonwealth programs define an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person as one who is one of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent, two identifies as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person and three is accepted as such by the community in which they live or have lived. And this def definition has been used by the courts, or the ordinary definition, in many cases, including the Marbo versus Queensland case and the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. So changing this definition to identify as a person of descent um, is accepted by the community in which the, community, the person lives uh, as being of that descent. There seems to be little research or evidence as to why um, this change should come into effect. Now, the government hasn't been able to demonstrate how they're going to increase numbers of um, attendance of Indigenous children, and I would hope that this is an, an activity um, to allow parents, um, caregivers, to be able to tick that box, to claim Aboriginality. But as we know, this is a huge issue of concern amongst Indigenous Australians. It's been brought up very recently. Um, SBS um, ran a program on it, on Insight, and there are deeply concerned members of the Indigenous community who have seen an influx of individuals in this nation uh, claiming Indigenous um, indigeneity. Uh, in fact, in the uh, 2021 census, 92,300 Australians for the very first time in their life ticked that box. So what does this mean when this, when in this new definition that a child doesn't necessarily have to be of descent but can um, be accepted by a community? Um, there, there are huge questions around this and huge implications that I don't think this government has certainly taken into account. You know, we, we, we don't just give out indigeneity out of cornflakes boxes, do we? It's, it's, it's deeply insulting for Indigenous Australians um, with true identity, but <laughs> it's, it certainly might be able to boost the numbers of what appears to be more uh, Indigenous children um, attending childcare, but it doesn't get to the heart of the point that some of our most marginalised in regional Australia are being forgotten about, because certainly people in the cities can tick that box. Uh, resources are drawn away from them. They are left high and dry. They're out of sight, out of mind. Uh, this idea of a voice is, is about uh, apparently giving them a voice, but this is, again, another uh, push by the elites to continue to control circumstances uh, for mo our most marginalised Indigenous Australians. So I would like to understand from the minister, can the government provide their justification for this new change? And can the minister clarify whether an adopted, non-biologically related child um, adopted by an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander family qualify under this new definition? Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Nipitipa Price. Uh, the definition of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child in the bill is based on the definition in the Australian Education Regulation that has been in place since 2014. The three-part test is consistent with the common law approach descent, self-identification and community acceptance. Um, we referred the Chipper Child Care Bill to the Education and Employment Legislation Committee and the report came back with no concerns raised over how uh, the definition was in the draft legislation. Epichimba Price, Senator. Minister, what was the input from any Indigenous members of the community? Was there any such input from um, significant Indigenous members of the community or organisations, or was it purely um, the Education Department? Minister, you have the call. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, we did consult with First Nations advocacy representatives with whom the department um, were tasked with consulting with. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, look, I just briefly wanted to uh, comment on this bill. I didn't get the opportunity to second reading speech. I do support the uh, amendment being put forward by Senator Dunningham, but I don't support the bill as a whole. And I briefly wanted to outline the reasons for that. I do support more assistance uh, uh, for families um, uh, needing to fund childcare, especially those on low incomes. Of course, this bill does also provide significant assistance to families up to earning $530,000 a year, which is, uh, of course, not a not a poor man's wage. Uh, I, I am I am opposed, though, to spending another four and a half billion dollars uh, on extra childcare assistance while we apparently cannot fix the issue of an underfunding and a uh, grossly uh, unfair tax system uh, for families that look after their own children. Uh, we've spoken a lot today about the uh, lack of uh, childcare in, in parts of our country. There's a whole workforce uh, uh, out there that could be used to, to look after children. They're called parents, they're called mothers and fathers, uh, but they are penalised by our tax system every day if they had to make a choice to look after their own children. Right now, if you're a single-income family on $150,000 a year, you will pay $17,000 a year more tax than a family uh, that splits that income, uh, say 60 say per cent, 30 per cent, $100,000 or $50,000 across each parent. So same household income, $150,000 a year, same number of kids. <laughs> the difference in tax is $17,000 a year. Uh, the decision to look after your own child should not be the most expensive financial decision you have to make in your life. We should be encouraging that because all of the evidence shows that a child who can be looked after by their mother or father, especially, especially at young years of their life, uh, does, does really well. It's really, really good for them to have that parental care, especially in their first year of life. And I just want to quote from some research done by some researchers, including um, uh, Dr Baum, uh, where he says, this article identifies the effects of maternal marketplace work in the initial months of an infant's life on the child's cognitive development. Results suggest that such work in the first year of a child's life has detrimental effects. Where significant, the results also indicate negative effects of maternal employment in the child's first quarter of life. That is the stats. We spend so much money on education, on schools and all these things, and the people we have out there that can do the best things, some of the best things for a child's cognitive development, the mothers and fathers of that actual child are discouraged from looking after their own children. I just briefly want to read into the Hansard too. An excellent article was written by uh, Virginia uh, Tapscott in The Australian a few months ago. Senator Mackenzie obviously read the same article. She is a stay-at-home mum, somewhat unexpectedly. I should say I don't like using that term, stay-at-home mum. They really work-at-home mums. They were working at home before it was cool. It's much, much harder work than I do. When I've had to look after my five kids, I need a break and to come to this place and get a break from them. But my wife doesn't always get that. Uh, she works a lot harder than me. Virginia says in this article that I think it's a ridiculous notion that women need to position themselves in a workplace in order to be valued and earn respect. The unfinished business of feminism is demanding respect for women in all of their roles. Before becoming a mother, I championed individual success and completely envisaged myself as a working mum. I was socially conditioned to expect this by the Women Can Have It All movement, and it made my transition to motherhood awkward as hell. When my first turn, son turned one, I felt a sense of urgency and panic that I should be getting back to work, that if I didn't go back now, I'd never be allowed back in. We are perpetuating that psychology uh, across our community, which uh, ridiculously places work ahead of the home. Uh, the home is the most important thing of our nation. Every profession out there is actually there to defend the homemakers. They're the ones uh, that bring up the next generation. It's the most important job in our community. And any, anyone thinking that staying back late, working for a big investment bank or a consulting firm doing spreadsheets or PowerPoint slides is somehow more rewarding in your life than changing nappies or making lunches has a warped sense of priorities. And this bill perpetuates that warped sense of priorities. We should be respecting motherhood, we should be respecting fatherhood, and we should be funding it through our tax system. Does any uh, senator wish to make a further contribution in respect of sh the amendments on sheet 1731? Otherwise, I'll, I will put the question. Senator Roberts. You're talking uh, just the sheet 1751? Uh, 1731. Which just is... that sheet. I, I want to make further contributions later yeah, you're, on. You're able to. I was... You want to make further contributions, but not necessarily on one... My, on my amendments. Oh, yes. I'm not... We're not moving to those amendments. Does any other senator have, make, wish to make a contribution 
on the amendments on sheet 1731. Otherwise, I'll put the question and then we'll move on to other amendments. I intend to put the question. I put the question on, on the amendments moved by Senator Dunningham on sheet 1731. It is amendments 1 and 2. They're being moved together by leave of the committee. I put the question that the amendments be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against? No. I think the ayes have it. We are now uh, to sheet 1720, the next amendment, which is moved, which is going to be moved by the government. Oh, but Senator Faruqi, you mm -hmm. may wish to call. I think it's oh, sorry, Australian Green. Amendments. Sorry, no, yeah, I, yeah. My, my mistake. My apologies. Um, that's all right. Thanks, Chair. Um, I seek leave to move um, amendments one to eight on sheet one seven two zero in global. You're seeking leave to move them together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Um, thank you, Faruqi. Chair. Um, these amendments um, are to ensure that early childhood education care providers are subject to a strong transparency regime um, that families can have confidence in. We heard during the inquiry to this bill that stakeholders supported a need for greater transparency in the early childhood education and care sector. Um, and the bill makes a start on, on that, definitely, by introducing new reporting requirements for large early childhood education care providers and allowing the Secretary of the Department to publish the information. Uh, but there is no reason that these requirements should be arbitrarily limited to large providers. And as the Center for Policy Development argued in their submission, they should really apply to all early childhood education care providers. Um, this amendment that I will be, uh, that I'm moving, will extend the reporting requirements to all early childhood education care providers, and will require the secretary to publish the information reported to them. Um, it shouldn't really be left up to their discretion whether they publish the information or not. And though education is what the Greens believe should never be for profit, the unfortunate reality is that there has been a proliferation of for-profit early childhood education care providers in recent years. Um, these providers receive substantial public money um, and there is so little visibility and accountability as to how they spend that money. There is a compelling need for them to be subject to stricter disclosure requirements than those which apply to community and not-for-profit early childhood education care providers. Um, so we are therefore moving amendments which respond to recommendations from the Center of Future Work and the United Workers Union to require for-profit early childhood education care providers to report their full finances, including profits, dividend payments, other disbursements to shareholders, executive compensation, wages expenditure, rental costs, and fee increases. I think this is absolutely necessary when huge amounts of public money are now being used for profit. And again, the secretary will be required to publish this information to contribute to this greater public awareness of how for-profit providers are using public money. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, the government is committed to improving transparency of the sector. Uh, large early childhood education providers will be required to report financial information, uh, which includes profit and revenue, uh, which will be published online. Uh, during the committee's inquiry, this approach was described by some stakeholders as essential and completely reasonable. Uh, large providers account for over a third of the early childhood education and care sector, but the government is conscious of the need to balance increasing transparency with the regulatory burden, and particularly those in, that imposed on small businesses. Uh, separate to the bill, work is underway to further enhance the Starting Blocks website to ensure it is a reliable one-stop shop for families seeking information about their early childhood and education care options. Uh, so we believe we have uh, the appropriate transparency mechanisms in place uh, and don't support the amendment uh, put forward by Senator Faruqi and the Greens. Senator Dunningham, are you inclined to put a position? No? Um, no as I'm, you don't necessarily need to. I'm just giving you the offer of the call. 
Does any other senator wish to make a contribution on the amendments proposed in sheet 1720? Otherwise, I intend to put the question. I put the question uh, that the amendments be agreed to, which and the amendments I refer are the ones moved by Senator Faruqi on sheet 1720, which by leave of the committee, amendments 1 to 8 are moved as 1. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Yeah. Division required. Mm -hmm. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question before the committee is that 
the amendments moved by Senator Faruqi on sheet 1720, amendments 1 to 8, by leave of the committee, should be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, against to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator McKim, and teller for the noes, Senator Scar. I'm glad you've got someone in the end there, Chair. Um, you've got me as teller. One, Honourable Senators, there being 13 ayes and 30 noes, it's passed in the negative. I'll give honourable Senators a moment if they wish to leave the chamber before we continue with the committee. Now come to sheet 1727, Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Chair. I move um, Greens Amendment 1 on sheet 1727. Um, and this amendment is about abolishing the activity test. As I said during my second reading speech, the Greens support, obviously support the new baseline entitlement to 36 hours a fortnight for, of subsidised early of childhood education and care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, regardless of the activity levels of their parents. Uh, and this change has been a long time coming. But really, it is also leaving so many other families and children um, out in the cold. Uh, it does not go far enough. The activity test needs to be completely scrapped. Um, it is causing harm now. We heard from so many um, witnesses during the um, Senate inquiry on this bill, um, who told us how the activity test was cruel, it was punitive, and it really was beyond repair, and then it, it had to go because it denies access uh, for the most disadvantaged children and then punishes families who are not in, in, in secure work or who are in casual work. Um, some 126,000 children from the poorest households in the country are missing out on early education because of the activity test. Um, and the activity test is denying access, um, as I said, to the most disadvantaged children. Witnesses to the inquiry, many of them completely supported the abolition um, of this test. Um, so this is what this amendment does. It abolished the activity te test, um, test and takes us a long way, a long way towards delivering universal 
and fairer access to early childhood education and, and care. And I do really ask uh, my colleagues in the chamber to support this. If we do care about access um, to as many families, and especially disadvantaged children and families, then this activity test really has to go, and we have the ability to do that today. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And uh, the government does believe that the activity test uh, needs reviewing, but we think the uh, best way for that to be done, or the most appropriate way for that to be done, uh, is through the Productivity Commission, uh, which the government has tasked with uh, looking at the sector uh, and providing a comprehensive review of the sector. Uh, so we think that the review should look at whether those activity test settings are appropriate. Uh, and that's what the government will do, and that's what we think is the appropriate way to deal with the activity test. Senator Hanson. Thank you. I'd like to ask the minister, would the government please explain to me there are activity tests now at the moment as it stands? Minister. Um, thanks, uh, Senator Hanson. Um, so uh, the uh, activity test um, uh, that we're focused on uh, here today um, which the government has said we'd task the Productivity Commission uh, with conduct conducting a comprehensive review of the sector, uh, which will include reviewing whether the current activity test settings are appropriate. Uh, we expect the review to commence in the first half of next year. Um, however, we thought that uh, there was an urgency to act uh, in the current environment, and particularly those to support uh, education outcomes for Indigenous children. Uh, in 2021, for the first time, the proportion of First Nations children developmentally on track in all five domains went backwards, um, so the gap actually is getting bigger, not smaller. Um, we need to turn this around, and that's why this bill, bill provides a minimum of 36 subsidised hours a fortnight for First Nations children, uh, benefiting at least 6,600 families. Uh, according to the 2021 Australian Early Development Census, uh, two in five Indigenous children are developmentally vulnerable uh, in one or more domains when they start school. That's compared with one in five children who are from a non-Indigenous background. Uh, last year, the proportion of Indigenous children assessed as developmentally on track in all five domains was 34.3 per cent, uh, which is a drop from 35.2 per cent in 2018. Um, so, as the Prime Minister has said, uh, we've tasked the Productivity Commission Senator to Hanson. investigate affordable. Sorry, excuse me, Minister. Senator, is this On relevance, um, the Minister is not out answering my question. I asked what is the activity test at the moment. He has not even gone anywhere near explaining what the activity test is at the moment. Thank you. I draw you to the, back to the question, Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, so the activity test level uh, each fortnight is uh, less than eight hours. Um, the hours of subsidised care for each fortnight is zero hours uh, if you earn above $72,466, um, 24 hours if you earn uh, $72,466 or below. Um, for more than eight hours to 16 hours, uh, the subsidised care each fortnight is 36 hours, uh, more than 16 to 48 hours. Uh, the subsidised care each fortnight is 72 hours, um, and the activity level each fortnight, if it's more than 48 hours, the hours of subsidised care each fortnight is 100 hours. Senator Hanson. Can you um, explain to the chamber, people who are not working, how much uh, care is given to them, who are those people who are not employed, and what do they have to do? They have to have uh, charity work, studying, or what's their requirements to get that childcare? There's a lot of other factors involved there, Senator Hanson. So it would also depend on um, whether they're studying or doing some type of training as well. Um, so it's a really hard one to um, give a simple answer to because there's other factors at play. Senator Hanson, I ask the question. Is child care paid by the government or the taxpayer, I should say, is it given to, to families who are not working at all? And how much? Mr. 
Minister. If, if they're not working, uh, then they don't get any subsidy. Are there any other contributions at this time? Because I intend to put the question to the to the request moved by Senator Faruqi. I don't see any honourable senator indicating that they wish to make a further contribution. So I intend to put the question. The question is not that the amendment be agreed to. The question is that the request for an amendment be agreed to, because Senator Faruqi's amendments need, need to go back to the other chamber as a request, because it deals with money clauses. I intend to put the question. I put the question that the request for an amendment be agreed to. The request deals with uh, request one on sheet 1727. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is that the request for an amendment be agreed to. The amendment is request number one on sheet 1727 as moved by Senator Faruqi. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, against to the left. I point as teller for the aye, Senator McKim. I point as teller for the no, Senator Cadell. Honourable Senators, there being 12 ayes and 29 noes, it's passed in the negative. We now come to sheet 1735. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that this bill makes some useful update to the administration of the federal government's childcare subsidy. One Nation supports largely those changes. One Nation, though, opposes many of the provisions in the bill. Before moving my amendment, I'll put it in context and ask four questions of the Minister, because this bill has not been thought through. Firstly, this bill will add $4.5 billion over forward estimates to the cost of childcare to the federal government, taking the annual cost above $10 billion. Childcare, or early learning, is an industry worth $14 billion a year, employing 133,000 Australians to care for 1.3 million children. The government is promising this bill will make childcare more affordable, and the expectation is to allow more families to put more children in childcare. But it's difficult to see how. Remember, subsidies always make services and goods more expensive. A family earning Australia's median wage of $52,000 will see an increase in the government subsidy from 85 per cent of the cost of childcare to 90 per cent of the cost, just a five percentage point increase. At an average cost of $80 a day for a preschool place, this saving will amount to $4 a day. For long day care, around $8 a day. How fast will this benefit be eaten away through inflation? Well, it already has been eaten away. Childcare centres starting to put prices, starting to putting their prices up straight after Labor's election victory in the expectation of this increase in the government subsidy. As rising energy prices, rising wages, insurance and overheads impact cash flow, childcare centres will raise their prices further. According to a Mitchell University study, childcare was unaffordable for 386,000 Australian families, 
and this was keeping 73,000 people out of the workforce. What's missing from the explanatory memorandum, the Bill's Digest and Committee report, was any proof that making childcare $4 to $8 a day cheaper will have any effect on childcare update. Did anyone ask why these everyday Australians could not afford childcare? Had this question been asked, we would find everyday Australians not only find childcare unaffordable, everyday Australians can no longer afford their electricity bill, their rent, their mortgage payment and weekly grocery bill. Did anyone, Minister, ask if these families could not afford childcare because they can't afford a car to get there or the petrol to go in that car? So my first question, why has the government advanced this solution, this bill as a solution to childcare affordability without actually doing the work to prove this bill will make childcare more affordable? What about tax reform to enable families to look after their children, the best form of care, respect for families and parents? What about the modelling? I'm pretty sure it won't do a damn thing for everyday Australians, this bill. Thanks to the economic policies of the previous Liberal National Government, which Labor supported from opposition, inflation is now running at 8 per cent. I've spoken previously about the inflation that has resulted from wasteful COVID spending, funded through increased debt and money creation using electronic journal entries. That's where the problem is. Wages going backward from runaway inflation due to government spending. Government spending that's already out of control. What does this bill do? It adds another $4.5 billion to government spending. Chair, if everyday Australians are not benefiting from this bill to any useful degree, where's the $4 billion coming from? So figure one is a handy chart from the Bill's Digest and it's most instructive. The biggest financial benefit in this bill to existing recipients goes to families who are earning $170,000 a year. The biggest winners overall are families earning between $360,000 and $530,000 who did not get childcare subsidy before, yet now will. Does this sound like a measure to help working Australians? No, it does not. To One Nation it sounds like the government is spending billions to make themselves popular with urban professionals who voted Greens and Teals in the last election. What about rural and regional Australians? Urban professionals are the winners from this bill. Working and regional Australians get scraps. That's a cynical political decision from Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Let's turn next, secondly, to One Nation is compelled to raise another issue arising from this legislation. Qualification for free taxpayer-funded childcare is being based on race rather than need. While we fully support evidence-based measures to improve Aboriginal workforce participation, childcare support should be based on the needs of the individual, not the colour of the individual's skin. Aboriginals and all Australians are worthy of respect and fairness. I support Senator Nampajimpa Price's comments on the definition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. This bill has not been thought through. Third, this bill includes a provision that will have the effect of prohibiting the million or so Australian families using childcare from paying cash for their childcare in for paying for their childcare in cash. And by cash, I mean cash or cheque. Australians, Australia's two million small businesses often deal in cash. Rural Australia still needs cash. Anyone in a flood, a blackout, or with a hacked bank account has to pay in cash. Family members help each other out in cash. And yet the globalist billionaires have told Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Minister Stephen Jones to ban cash, and now we have snuck into this bill a provision that all payments made to childcare centres must be made using electronic funds transfer. No cash allowed, Minister. This continues the Liberal Nationals' war against cash. As the Reserve Bank of Australia admitted to me in Senate estimates hearings, that it is working on a CBDC, a central bank digital currency for Australia, and working with other nations' central banks to develop a global digital currency, a global digital currency. The predatory billionaire said jump, and Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said, how high? Now an entire industry worth $14 billion a year can no longer accept cash payment unless the minister writes a specific exemption, which the minister will not write because the whole idea of banning cash payments is to ban cash. There is no reason for this new provision. The king's currency, our national currency, is by law legal tender across the nation and must be accepted. If this government wants to stop Australians using cash, then have that conversation and bring on that legislation. 
I understand some childcare centres are not collecting the, the gap fee and relying instead on the 85 per cent, now 90 per cent, government payment as their full revenue. Taking payment for the gap in cash or any other measure and not declaring it is already Ill illegal under the law. Not taking payment for the gap is already illegal under section 201B, clause 1 of, the, of a new tax system, Family Assistance Administration Act 1999. Criminal and civil penalties are provided, $12,000 per offence. Under section 201B, subsection 1A of the same act, the minister can prescribe rules that could be used to ban a childcare centre from accepting cash if they are caught rorting the system. However, if they are caught rorting the system through use of cash or any other method, they lose their licence anyway through failing the fit and proper person test to work in childcare. Some welfare groups raised concerns with this provision in the committee inquiry. I suggest more would, would have if they were more aware the measure was hidden away in the bill. I note that the word cash is not even used. That's sneaky. The provision to ban cash payments in the entire childcare industry makes no sense if judged on the reasons the government itself states. It does make sense if the intention is to make another incremental removal of cash from common use as part of a wider agenda to force every Australian onto a central bank digital currency linked to a digital identity. Last week, the New South Wales government announced a digital identity for New South Wales, not just linked to state government paperwork, but to be used for liquor purchases. Government and the private sector working together like one big corporate state. One Nation was successful in fighting the cash ban bill in the previous parliament, with help from the Citizens Party. The Senate rejected a cash ban in 2021, and I asked the Senate to reject a cash ban again today. Countries in Europe that have tried a cash ban are now winding measures back. What makes sense to inner city elites makes no sense at all in the real world. I foreshadow that we need to remove this provision that will stop Australians paying for their childcare gap in cash. We have one flag above this building. We are one community. We are one nation. And the King's currency cannot be refused. Minister, in addition to the previous questions, why is Labor joining the Liberal Nationals in banning cash? Your dwindling glass grassroots members said resoundingly last year, no, keep cash. Why are you banning cash? Before I give the minister the call, Senator Roberts, would you like to move uh, your amendments? Yes, I would. Move my amendments on sheet 1735. Do you seek leave to move them together? Well, they can't be moved together. They have to I, be moved well, separately. We, we can do it either way. So separately. Uh, okay. So you're you're moving, uh, I think, amendment two first on sheet one seven three five. Correct. Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Senator Roberts, for that contribution. So uh, the cost of early childhood education uh, is a concern, and it's gone up by forty one percent over the last eight years. And what this bill actually seeks to do. Uh, is cut the cost for over one million families. So uh, that is what we are doing. That is part of our plan, uh, retackling the cost of living uh, and the challenge that we inher inherited on that front. Uh, but also the complementary measure, measure that we have in place um, to ensure uh, that we have uh, fairness in pricing uh, is the government has committed $10.8 million for an ACCC inquiry to commence next year as well uh, to work in complementary fashion uh, with this legislation if it hopefully pass. Uh, the ACCC will investigate the drivers of rising uh, early education costs uh, and it will examine the impact of these childcare subsidy changes on out-of-pocket fees and it will consider the effectiveness of the current mechanisms designed to put pressure on fee growth. Uh, so that is uh, our response and how we uh, think is the best response to tackling uh, that challenge when it comes to uh, cost of living and ensuring that fees uh, are responsible. Uh, in terms of uh, who will benefit from these changes, and if you are a family on an income of $60,000, you'll get a 90 per cent subsidy, uh, which is worth $14,580 a year. Um, so that, for me, shows you the substance of the package um, that we put forward before the election and what we're delivering on in government is uh, those people on a modest income of $60,000 uh, will be the ones who get the most subsidy uh, as a result of these changes um, if we are to get them implemented. Uh, in terms of uh, the electronic payment of gap fees, uh, so this from our point of view is purely 
an integrity measure. Um, the government is making a significant investment to cut the cost of childcare, uh, but we must protect this investment from fraud and ensure families receive the benefit uh, and that taxpayer funds are used appropriately. The bill sets out a requirement for electronic payment of gap fees. This will allow the government to test whether gap fees have been paid and it will present a significant obstacle for fraudulent services that try to claim childcare subsidy for care that isn't occurring. Uh, so I think that for anyone who's concerned about the use of taxpayers' money and the fact that it should be used appropriately, uh, this is an important measure that goes to uh, tackling that problem to ensure uh, that people can have trust in the system as well. Uh, many key peaks and providers support this move, including Early Learning and Care at Council of Australia and Outside School Hours Care Australia as well. Uh, there are many forms of electronic payment that parents can choose from uh, which do not incur costs, uh, and that is what we think is an appropriate way to deal with any potential fraud. Senator Roberts. Minister, Minister, could you tell me please why you haven't done the analysis already? Why is this bill being pushed without the analysis being done? You're saying we'll have the analysis next year. Why not do it now and understand the cost pressures of childcare centres? And why not do it now so that we can face up to the fact that your government is putting huge cost of living pressures on people through energy policies, taxation policies and other policies already? Give these people a break. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And uh, as we've been uh, very upfront about this uh, from the beginning, and this is something that we talked about in opposition for many years, uh, and are committed to delivering on in government. And for us, uh, there obviously is uh, the the economic focus of these reforms that are, enable uh, more people to get back into the workforce. And um, for me, and I spend many uh, much time in rural and regional Australia, um, the workforce shortage. Um, is acute in the cities, but it's also acute in regional areas as well. Um, so for me, this policy is one that will benefit so many communities across the country because it will enable more people to get back into the workforce, which will help ease uh, that, that labour shortage that we've got in so many communities around the country. Um, it does reduce the fees for one million people who will be better off from a cost of living point of view, but for me, the longer term economic benefits to so many communities um, will be widespread. Uh, and that's why this government is committed to delivering on it. Uh, it was an election promise. Uh, it also helps restore that integrity and trust with the Australian people from oppositions going to elections and promising things, but then delivering on them in government. Uh, and that's what we intend to do today. That's right. Senator Payne. Oh, Senator Payne sought the call, and then I'll come back to, to Senator Roberts. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Senator Roberts, uh, for your. Uh, indulgence. Um, Chair, I want to ask the Assistant Minister uh, a question in relation to uh, his response to Senator Hanson uh, earlier. Um, as I understood the Assistant Minister, he indicated uh, in relation to Senator Hanson's question about whether you needed to be working uh, to receive uh, subsidy support, that the Assistant Minister said uh, that that was not the case, uh, that you did not receive subsidy support if you were not working. But clearly, uh, you'll see the Services Australia website, uh, apart from any other um, instructive piece of information uh, I'd point the Assistant Minister to, does talk about accessing, for example, up to 36 hours of subsidised childcare uh, per fortnight if uh, your activity is volunteering, for example, or actively looking for work, for example. It uh, talks about the receivers of carer allowance. It talks about when you have mutual obligation requirements, you can access 36 hours of subsidised care per fortnight. Uh, it also indicates, of course, that um, if you are actively seeking work, uh, if you are doing training to improve work skills or employment prospects, you're doing an approved course of educational study, all of which point to the, I think, the matters that were being raised by, uh, by Senator Hanson. And I wondered whether the Assistant Minister would like to correct the record. Minister. I was uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I was re responding to Senator Hanson's question, which went if people were doing nothing. <laughs> Um, and I did make the point that if people were training and doing other things than they were uh, meeting the eligibility test, uh, the activity test, uh, then they would be eligible. So uh, it's entirely consistent with what I said. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Minister, the government can keep its promises 
the pre-election promises and provide good governance simply by doing your analysis up front. Do the homework and get the job done properly so that we have a proper bill before us. Why aren't you doing that? Minister. We have. Senator Faruqi. I want to make some comments on Senator Roberts' amendment. Um, the Greens will not be supporting this amendment because, as I understand, and the minister said earlier, these changes to prevent gap fees payment by cash are needed so providers do correctly report and to prevent any fraud caused by providers not reporting correctly. Um, we do acknowledge, though, that there need to be exceptions for cash payments for disadvantaged vulnerable families, which I understand will be in the regulation. And if the minister could just confirm that, I'd really appreciate it. And we will work with the government to ensure that these exceptions are fair. Thank you. Minister. Um, yes, that is the case. Senator Roberts. Minister, isn't it true that not taking payment for the gap is already illegal under section 201B, clause 1 of the a new tax system, Family Assistance Administration Act 1999. Criminal and civil penalties are provided, $12,000 per offence. Under, under Section 201B, subsection 1A of the same Act, the minister can prescribe rules that could be used to ban a childcare centre from accepting cash if they are caught rorting the system. You already have this power. Why do you need to ban cash from everyday Australians? across this country when it is absolutely essential. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And um, those measures are in place in an attempt to prevent fraud, um, which is why um, they're in the legislation you describe. Senator Roberts. Can you wait until I allocate the call? Thank you, uh, so that we can make sure your microphone's turned on. Are you seeking the call, Senator Roberts? Exactly, Minister. These provisions to stop fraud are already in the bill. You can apply them. You don't need to ban cash to do that. Banning cash is being driven by another motive, the same motive that the Liberal Nationals use to get rid of choice and freedom for people. Why are you banning cash, Minister? Thanks, Chair. Um, there are penalties for fraud in the system, but this is also focused on the prevention of fraud, um, which is what we've sought to do um, in this legislation. Senator Roberts. Minister, surely the purpose of having a law, simply, enact, simply enforcing that law, is, is, a, is a justification for not is, is preventing criminals from perpetuating the, perpetuating the breaches. Surely that's the case. Why don't you just enforce the law instead of banning cash from all Australians? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And um, we think that there is um, fraud in the sector, and we think that this is the best way to deal with it, to ensure that taxpayer funds are being used appropriately uh, and for the measures um, that governments intend. Senator Roberts. Your government's responsibility is to enforce the law. If you've already got the law, enforce it. You don't need to tack on something else that's got nothing to do with it, just to take cash away from Australians. Why won't you enforce the law? You've just admitted you won't. Minister. Um, uh, that is complete nonsense, Senator Roberts. Um, what this is is about the prevention of fraud. Um, surely that would be the best way to deal with fraud, is to prevent it from happening in the first place, um, which is what we intend to do with this legislation. Senator Roberts. We already have these under Section 201 of the Act I just, just uh, spoke about. You already have them. You're admitting that you won't enforce them. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Minister, you talked, about you talked about the shortage of workers in regional and metropolitan areas around the country. We agree. Why don't you let those mandated back to work, mandated without getting injections, back to work? That's where a lot of people are being trapped right now. 
They can't collect welfare. They can't get, they can't get an income. And they're, they're a burden on society for simply not agreeing to put something in their bodies. Minister, this needs a comprehensive approach. Taxation, energy, cost of living, not just fiddling with a few people. And while you're at it, please answer the question, why are you supporting welfare for the top 1 per cent of income earners? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, Senator Roberts, uh, if your family is on an income of $60,000, you'll get a 90 per cent subsidy uh, worth $14,580 a year. Um, so that is uh, the biggest beneficiaries of the reforms that we are making, uh, and that will ensure uh, that uh, more people can, achieve, can uh, get into uh, affordable childcare, um, which will be good for the children, but it will also be good for uh, the economy at the same time. Uh, throughout rural and regional Australia, as well as the cities. Senator Roberts. Minister, the biggest winners overall from this bill, your government's bill, are families earning between $360,000 and $530,000 a year who did not get childcare subsidy until now. Why? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, that just isn't the case, Senator Roberts. As I've said, um, the biggest beneficiary of those are on lower and middle incomes, uh, where they'll get a 90 per cent subsidy worth almost $15,000 a year. Um, that is uh, who we believe are the biggest beneficiaries of these changes. Senator Roberts. <laughs> the fact is that families currently earning between $360,000 and $530,000 do not currently get the childcare subsidy. Yet if this bill passes, they will get it. Why are you giving welfare to the top 1%, people in the top 1 per cent of earners? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, and I think the key point of difference here is, Senator Roberts, is we don't see this as welfare. We see it as an economic reform, and we've been upfront about that um, for many years now, and particularly in the lead-up to the budget uh, when we announced our uh, plan to implement these changes. Uh, and if you can't understand the economic of impact, uh, impact of this reform, given what the country currently con confronts, then I don't think you'll ever understand it. But it is going to be uh, so beneficial uh, to so many people and their ability to get back into the workforce, uh, and that is predominantly women, but also goes to those challenges that I've talked about now repeatedly with you about uh, the impact in many communities where there is a, a labour shortage. Uh, this will be uh, a significant impact on ensuring more people are available to work uh, in the industries that we need them to, uh, and that is why it is an important economic reform. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I just want the minister to clarify something for me. Um, did you or did you not say that people in excess of $360,000 a year don't get childcare subsidies whatsoever? Is that the case? Minister. No, Senator Hanson, I never said that. I said the biggest beneficiaries are those on lower and middle incomes. Senator Hanson. Right, then I'll ask the question. Do people on incomes in excess of $360,000 will receive child support benefits under your legislation? Minister. Uh, absolutely, Senator Hanson. Uh, someone uh, on that wage will, uh, and that is why we are focused on this important economic reform because it will enable more people to get back into the workforce, uh, which is exactly uh, how we've detailed and talked about this for many years. Uh, and we think that is important um, in any economic situation, but particularly now, um, given the challenges the nation confronts. Sen Senator Hanson. Up to what income are you going to be giving child subsidies in excess of $360,000? Up to what amount? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, up to $529,999. Senator Hanson. Will you give me an explanation of the variance of the child subsidies that will be paid out to these people on that income? For a matter of fact, look, just tell me, what, or the people of Australia, 
Um, someone on, on that over $500,000, what child subsidy will they get back? Minister. Well, there's obviously many components to uh, that, Senator Hanson, but if they had uh, a single child subsidy, uh, would be 6 per cent or $970 annually. Senator Hanson. I just want to ask you another question where you're actually saying that for fraud reasons, so cash won't be used again now. Um, just clarify also, is this for everyone who uses childcare will not be able to use cash at all? Is that it? Everyone, right across the board? Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, there will be provision for exceptions that would be made in consultation with the sector. Senator Hanson. Explain who? Minister. Um, there'd obviously be consultation um, with the department, but uh, we envisage potentially uh, remote Aboriginal um, centres uh, or uh, remote geographic locations um, where it would be necessary. Senator Hanson. So they can use cash, but other people throughout the, the country can't use cash. So it's just basically we're going to say it's to, for Aboriginals because you have white um, families, not Aboriginal families, but everyone else who actually do live in remote areas as well, who possibly may need, have the use to need, um, the need to use cash. Are you going to give, make provisions for them as well? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. It doesn't take long for Senator Hanson to try and play the race card. Um, but uh, what we've done in a sensible way uh, is say that there may need to be uh, exemptions that are made in consultation with the sector. Uh, they would be dealt with um, by the department. Um, for instance, it could be someone in a domestic violence um, situation um, where they wouldn't want to make uh, an electronic payment. Um, so there would be a level of common sense um, that is applied uh, in consultation uh, with the sector, um, and I'm sure uh, that is uh, appropriate. Um, but the fundamental aim of the change um, is to ensure that there is uh, no fraud in the system. Um, so that is what we are focused on in delivering with this measure. Senator Hanson. Um, let me ask you the question. Under section 51.12 of the Australian Constitution, it starts to talk about legal tender and coinage. Therefore, it says the government to uh, allow that to be used um, by the people of this nation in, for good governance. Did you receive legal advice before putting this into your bill that people of Australia cannot use legal tender? Minister. I'm advised that we did, yes, Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson. Could you please um, uh, present that to this uh, chamber, that legal advice that was given to you? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, as you know, Senator Hanson, government does not provide uh, its legal advice on issues such as this. Senator Hanson. You've got to be kidding me, surely. If you put this in the bill that the people can't use legal tender, that you're saying that that should not be provided to this chamber, to the people of Australia, to know where you actually got that legal advice, or there's something that you've just come up on the hop just to, to satisfy me or, or to put me off from asking this question, because you are denying people the right to use legal tender in this country, and you're going to make it your, um, up to you or the department who you allow to use it or not. I'd like to see that, and I think you had an obligation to this chamber and to the people of Australia that you have to give that legal advice. You stated there was legal advice. I'd like to know and see that legal advice, and we have a right to actually see that. Yeah. At Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Minister, the family is the best form of care for raising children. Mothers and fathers should have the option to work. So let's get away from the word welfare. Can you please explain to me why people 
families earning between $360,000 a year and $530,000 a year who do not currently get childcare subsidy will, if this bill is passed, receive a gift from the government of a childcare subsidy. Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, because it's an economic reform, Senator Roberts, as I've been over previously with you. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just on that point of being an economic reform, um, and I accept that. I think uh, supporting families who seek to work to be able to do so is important. Uh, if I just can go back to the modelling around the economic outcomes of the bills we're looking to pass here, if you could give me an indication perhaps of the increase in workforce participation as, as a result of these uh, bills passing. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And, uh, what the Treasury analysis indicated is that there would be 37,000 additional full-time workers as a result of these changes. Um, so we think that is a significant economic boost uh, to the economy. Um, we think it's particularly acute now, uh, given, as I've said repeatedly, the challenges that uh, we face as a nation um, and the labour shortages that are holding uh, many parts of the economy back. Um, so we do feel as though uh, we do believe that this is an important economic reform. Uh, it's part of uh, a suite of changes that we took to uh, through the budget process as well um, that deliver uh, partly on cost of living relief, but doing so in a responsible way to ensure um, that we don't put additional pressure on inflation at the same time. Um, so that is what uh, we set out to achieve. That's why um, we're proud to. Uh, talk about these reforms, uh, and we're absolutely determined to deliver on them in government. Senator Dunningham. Oh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just further to that, um, has Treasury or the Department of Education modelled the impact of this policy uh, change to GDP? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, what I what I can say in regards to uh, the modelling is that um, the analysis that was done by Treasury um, was the same or used similar Treasury modelling uh, that the previous government did for the high, higher childcare subsidy. Um, so that is what we've been relying on in terms of um, how we've been talking about the economic impact, um, but also the number of people who will be allowed back uh, into the workforce as a result of these changes. Um, so that is, for us is the a significant factor. That's what's been motivating us, uh, and that's why we think it is good uh, for the economy and the country on the whole. Senator Dunningham. Thanks. So, just to confirm, no new modelling for a very big new policy. Um, I'm pleased the amendment passed earlier on about the review. Um, has the uh, Treasury or the Department of Education modelled the supply and demand impact of this policy? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, and, uh, as we went through uh, in detail at Senate Estimates, um, what our focus has been on is delivering on the policy, uh, and we know the work that Treasury have done on some of their analysis. Uh, but what we also know is that uh, when you uh, make these changes around making childcare more affordable, uh, is it will see more people wanting to take up these services. Uh, and that is what we are confident of. That is what we are aiming to deliver on. Uh, and that's why we have some of those other changes that we're making, uh, whether it be um, the ACCC or the Productivity Commission, um, to look at this policy and the impact. Um, and also, I suppose, uh, the other focus we've got on in terms of uh, tackling some of the workforce issues that we confront as well, uh, which are uh, large now but are going to be more challenging into the future, um, which is why we've got substantial plans around uh, fee-free TAFE, uh, obviously the, the 20,000 additional Commonwealth-supported places at university. Uh, some of those go to um, early childhood educators as well. Um, so we've got uh, many prongs in terms of how we're tackling this challenge uh, and intend on delivering in government, uh, expecting that there will be an uptake uh, in services given that um, it will be more affordable for um, families to uh, send their child to attempt to send their child um, to get them an early childhood education. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Chair. So, major economic policy, and we don't have modelling on the change to GDP or supply and demand impacts. Can the minister outline specifically whether Treasury or the Department of Education has modelled? And you referenced this in your 
contribution just then, uh, changes to workforce requirements, that is, the additional workforce required to meet the demand. Some numbers would be helpful. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. And what we do know is we inherited a significant mess when it comes to uh, early childhood educators and uh, a lack of a plan um, from the previous government. Uh, the National Skills Commission repeatedly told the previous government that over 20,000 educators uh, would be needed for the next few years, uh, and they took no action. Um, what we're doing uh, is uh, delivering more university places, uh, teacher bursaries, uh, more fee-free TAFE places for early childhood education, uh, and that will be a real focus from us in terms of uh, rebuilding uh, the TAFE sector. Uh, we also supported the Fair Work Commission's minimum wage increase that resulted in a 4.6 pay rise for around 113,000 early childhood educators, uh, and I believe the current opposition opposed uh, that wage increase. Um, we are legislating to remove unnecessary limitations uh, on access to multi-employer agreements, uh, which has resulted in some of the highest paid early childhood educators um, in the country. Uh, in Victoria, 70 centres combined in pay negotiations, and as a result are paid at at least 16 per cent above the award. Um, these centres still had to register the agreement in 70 different times, uh, and this is the kind of thing multi-employer bargaining reform will make easier. Uh, we're strengthening the ability of the Fair Work Commission to order pay increases uh, for low-paid workers in female-dominated industries. Um, also uh, supplementary to this, uh, obviously given the immediate challenge that we confront, uh, migration has to be part of the mix as well. Uh, which is why we have increased the number of permanent migration visas available this financial year from 160,000 to 195,000. Uh, and we're also uh, looking at more substantial migration reform uh, next year uh, with a comprehensive review uh, due to report by the end of February. Um, so, uh, additionally, National Cabinet has tasked early education and early years ministers with identify further opportunities for collaboration to address workforce shortages. Um, that work is underway now to achieve the changes that we need to ensure that we have the workforce into the future. Senator Hanson. Much. Minister, this bill is going to cost the Australian taxpayers another $4.5 billion a year, and it's actually going to then send the cost of over $10 billion. Has the government done an audit on childcare centres to actually extrapolate out how much it actually does cost um, the centres for childcare, or are you just coming up with a figure, we're going to pay you more money? Has an audit been done of childcare centres of actually how much does it actually cost for childcare, and can you justify what it's going to cost Australians of $10 billion a year. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, so uh, what we know is from a result of these changes, there will be around 1.26 million families who will be better off as a result of these changes um, if they are passed. Um, uh, we also know uh, that uh, as part of the plan um, that we are delivering on uh, is that Every family and every child would have benefited from our election promise, uh, benefits from the cheaper childcare bill, uh, and we're committed to delivering uh, that promise in full. Uh, in terms of uh, the point you make around, uh, Senator Hanson, I want to go to point of relevance. Um, the minister is talking about something that I, the question I did not. I asked him a direct question: Was an audit done into the childcare centres? Uh, the, um, the relevance of this increase of $4.5 billion. We are talking about, yeah, um, you, know, you, you say that cost of living has gone up, that's understandable, and everyone knows that. But we are looking at $10 billion a year taxpayer subsidies that's going to this, um, and I believe that some of it is a childcare industry that's going on out there. And we've known that people have actually ripped the system off. Senator Hanson, so uh, just my to question clarify your point of order. Been done of these childcare centres to justify an increase of 4.5 billion and an overall cost of 10 billion dollars to the Australian people. Thank you. I give the call to the minister. Thanks, Chair. And uh, that's why I've spoken uh, repeatedly around the 10.8 million dollars. 
uh, that we've been uh, that we've provided to the ACCC uh, to undertake a price inquiry into childcare, uh, which will consider the effectiveness of the existing price regulation mechanisms, uh, such as the rate caps, and provide recommendations to the government. Um, so that is how we think is the appropriate way uh, to deal with those issues that you raise. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Minister, it seems we agree on something. You inherited a significant mess from the previous government with inflation and you're continuing their policies. You have not thought this through. There is no part of a comprehensive plan for managing this economy, freeing people up, freeing the economy, supporting families. How many families currently earning $360,000 to $530,000 per year will be among those families better off? Minister. Uh, thanks, thanks, Senator Roberts. Uh, and uh, what we know is that 96% uh, of families will be better off as a result of the changes that we're making uh, in this legislation. Um, that is why we think it is uh, of benefit to the economy, but it also goes to that uh, important challenge that many families are facing at the moment around cost of living. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that it is done in a responsible way um, without putting further inflationary pressures on the budget. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Minister, you didn't answer my question. How many families currently earning $360,000 to $530,000 a year will be better off? And can you justify taxpayers on far lower incomes paying taxes to help these wealthy families that are in the top 1 per cent of Australian earners? Minister. Um, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, what I can confirm, Senator Roberts, is only around 2 per cent of families who benefit from the changes earn over $360,000. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Minister. What about the other part of my question? Do you think it's fair that taxpayers earning far, far, far less than this amount are paying a gift to these taxpayers to, to these families that are currently in the top 1 per cent of Australian income earners. Minister. Thanks, thanks Chair. Well, uh, as I've detailed significantly, 96 per cent of families or around 1.26 million, uh, million will be better off Thank as a result you, of these changes. Uh, as it is now 1.30 p.m., the committee will report to the Senate and we will now move to two-minute statements. Oh. <laughs> Senator Nampajimpa Price. Thank you, Acting President. Recently, the ABC's Four Corners program highlighted the prevalence of homicide, domestic and sexual violence faced by Aboriginal women, particularly in places like the NT. While the ABC should be commended for the program highlighting a crisis of epic proportions, it was wrong to frame this issue as if, as if it has never been highlighted before. It was, in fact, one of the reasons why the Howard government initiated the intervention. The ABC failed to consult former NT Minister for Women, Bess Nungare Price, who worked alongside my fellow Senator Michaela Cash to develop the first national action plan to address DV. As part of the former country Liberal Party government, she made 23 separate media releases and made five presentations to the floor of parliament on the issue. Over the last two, decade, sorry, two years, there have been approximately 82 separate occasions where DV against Indigenous women have been mentioned in a speech, question or response to a question in the Senate and House of Reps. Yes, the justice system needs to be better, to better support victims, but every single one of us needs to be honest about the contributing factors that myself and women like my mother are vilified for highlighting and why the media, like the ABC, pretend we don't exist. We live the cultural factors that contribute to the violence and demand responsibility from our families, communities and perpetrators. 
I commend the work of the Tungandjira Women's Safety Group, but it disappoints me, however, that their CEO, Walter Shaw, in 2016 attacked me after my Ending the Violence National Press Club address by calling me an oxygen thief and putting me on notice. He has accused me of politicising DV and stopped me from speaking at White Ribbon Day events in my hometown while obstructing any involvement to support the Tungandjira women. It is no wonder Aboriginal women cannot come together to demand change when we are not only victimised at 40 times the national rate, but we are constantly being controlled by the Aboriginal patriarchy, who get away with their behaviour because they too are classed as victims because of colonisation. Let Aboriginal women have our feminist movement, not just white leftist women. Senator Stirl. Yeah, thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I just want to highlight to the Chamber and anyone listening that this week the SDA and the TWU are calling out the disgraceful behaviour of Amazon, Amazon rule worldwide. In this nation and around this country, Amazon, where the owner of Amazon is worth no less than $117 billion. And good luck to him. I wish I had $117 billion because I wouldn't be sitting in here whinging about him and Amazon. So I have no problems with people earning money, but I have a serious problem when they're making huge amounts of money off their workforce. It is a well known factor around the world, and in this nation, Amazon workers are too frightened to collectively bargain, to come together for the threats of being dismissed. It is a well-known fact in this nation why some people applaud Amazon that are stealing food off the table of workers from other retail companies such as Woolworths and Coles, who do pay the right money to their people, who do pay the superannuation, who do make good-paying jobs full-time, who do supply all the good stuff that goes around that in holiday pay, maternity pay, sick leave, rostered days off and overtime. So how the heck can we put our hand on our heart and, and, and look up to Amazon? So the TWU and SDA have a, a, an online retail campaign going. They've been having it going for years. They work with other unions around Australia. And I would just urge every Australian consumer that we all want the same thing. We all want what's best for our children. There's not one person I've ever met who doesn't wake up in the morning saying they want to deliver for their children. Well, if you want to deliver for your children, and I'm not preaching to you, we know they have to have good education and good paying jobs. But not every Australian kid wants to go to university. Not that they can't. I know I didn't want to. I couldn't think of anything worse. I wanted to get out and start working, and I wanted to be rewarded for the effort I put in. I commend the TWU, I commend the SDA to keep the campaign going against the greed of Amazon in Australia and worldwide. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today I'm going to read out a speech from 11 year old Ida Adams from my home state in South Australia. In fact, she goes to primary school just around the corner from where I live up in the Adelaide Hills. It's been written uh, as part of the Raise Our Voice in Parliament campaign, which amplifies the voices of young people and their visions for the future. So Ida says, I'm passionate about making this place a better world for humans and animals alike. There are many significant problems in the world, including world hunger, homelessness, violence and lack of biodiversity. But by far, the most important is climate change. Australia is an amazing country and we are also fortunate to live in it. But it may not stay one. Our leaders need to understand what climate change is and take action. It is no longer just plastic pollution or, but overuse of electricity, fossil fuel mining, vehicles, food production and so, so much more. These things tragically result in multiple consequences such as weed and pest invasion, salt invasions, extreme temperatures, etc., resulting in an unlivable climate for humans, plants and animals alike. Australia can't stay this way. If we keep polluting it, it will get worse. This problem is major and you cannot ignore it. We need to figure out solutions and replacement for oil, gas and water and other resources. But more importantly, we need more government funding for research for this to happen. We created the problems so we can fix it together for a strong and healthy Australia. But the leaders of today need to have insight, see what is wrong and step up for what is right. The solutions to problems of tomorrow are in the hands of politicians today. That's a statement from Ida Adams in South Australia. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. Meeting the human rights challenge across the world can at times be overwhelming and sometimes it can be difficult to find progress. But last week we heard the fantastic news that Professor Sean Tennell, an Australian citizen, was released 
with almost 6,000 other political prisoners in Myanmar. This is the time to harden our resolve against the military regime in Burma. Over a million people have been displaced. Thousands of children have been killed. Tens of thousands of homes have been destroyed. Villages have been burnt to their ground. And it is now time for Australia to do more. Professor Tunnell's release is great news. And we should take that as a demonstration that Australia can now do more to support the Burmese people in Myanmar, but give life to the aspirations of the Burmese diaspora in this country. This is the time for Australia to strengthen its voice with its regional partners. This is the time for Australians to do more in demanding greater international effort. This is the time when Australia can do more to support those people on the ground in Burma, refugees in India, refugees in Thailand, so that they can see, in Sean Tunnell's release, hope for themselves. I call on the Australian government to now act harder. I congratulate them on their efforts and the efforts of our ASEAN neighbours and everyone that was involved, indeed the many thousands of Australians who argued for Sean Tunnell's release. But now is the time for the Australian government to do more. Not my wish, but the wish of the Burmese diaspora Thank in our Senator country. Smith. Senator Sheldon. Thank you. Well, Australian workers have suffered through a decade of declining wages and working conditions, and it is unprecedented. But this plague is not an act of God. It hasn't fallen from the sky. It is a deliberate outcome of anti-wages, anti-worker and anti-union policies by companies like Qantas and Amazon. If your wages go backwards, you can thank Alan Joyce and Jeff Bezos, corporate thugs who have pioneered new ways to game our industrial relations system. If we continue to let Amazon and Qantas drive a race to the bottom, then every other employer in Australia will be forced to do the same to survive. Around the world, governments and workers are standing up to these corporate guerrillas. Governments from New Zealand to the European Union are moving to back multi-employer bargaining, to give workers a voice and a say over their wages and conditions, to give workers a voice to make sure they can have that say. And this week, in the lead up to Black Friday, workers and unions around the world, including the Shop and Distributive Allied Employees Union and the Transport Workers Union here in Australia, are telling Jeff Bezos that enough is enough. No more starvation wages, no more union busting, no more worker surveillance, no more tax avoidance, no more workers being forced to urinate in bottles to meet deadlines. We say no more to American Amazon's flex workers being paid below the minimum wage. We say no more to the Americanisation of wages and working conditions in Australia. Amazon's 19th century work practices are not welcome here, and it's time to make Amazon pay. Senator Roberts. Thank you. In a previous speech, I called for Australia to reject the World Economic Forum's Great Reset and instead mount a great resist. These were not idle words. Video is circulating online of World Economic Forum crook and mastermind Klaus Schwab bragging about penetrating the cabinets of Western democracies with his young global leaders. Some Klaus Schwab disciples are in this Senate and one is in the cabinet. How this has not triggered a national security investigation is beyond one nation. We certainly would be taking a much closer look given the coordination we are seeing in the policies being enacted by WEF disciples like Jacinta Ardern and Justin Trudeau. One Nation will resist the transfer of wealth from everyday Australians to predatory billionaires. This was the inevitable and deliberate outcome of profligate government COVID spending that the Liberals, Nationals, Labor and Greens waved through this parliament. One Nation will resist exposing our children to adult sexual content in our libraries, in school textbooks and now in kids' programs on the ABC. One Nation will resist the dehumanisation of women through genderless language that erases the very concept of a mother and of a woman. We will not allow the family to be undermined. 
One Nation will resist the reduction of sex to a soul-destroying, meaningless transaction, the very thing Aldous Huxley warned us about in The Brave New World. One Nation will resist the war on farming that seeks to destroy family farms, rewild the bush and shift food production to corporate-owned, near-urban, intensive factories producing chemically driven food-like substances for everyday Australians to eat, while the elites gorge themselves on red meat and seafood. Something they did again last week at COP27 in Egypt, indulging in luxury while spreading poverty. Disgusting. We are one community, we are one nation, and parliaments belong to no one but the Australian people. Senator Macdonald. I rise to congratulate the people of my hometown of Cloncurry and all the descendants of Qantas' founders for making this month's centenary of the first Qantas flight so remarkable and so memorable. Country Australia is responsible for so many great ideas and inventions, and Qantas is one of them. Qantas' story began in 1919 when a grazier, Fergus McMaster, his broken down car in the bed of the Cloncurry River, and a veteran World War I pilot, Paul McGuinness, who stopped to help. You can just imagine how the conversation went. Perhaps McMaster saying, Wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to drive cars so far over such rough country out here? I think an air taxi service would be ideal. And McGuinness perhaps saying, when I was flying in the war, we could cover distances the poor blokes on the ground could only dream of. And from this chance meeting, Qantas was born. First passenger, Alexander Kennedy, when it flew its first commercial flight in November 1922. From Qantas came the Royal Flying Doctor Service and a partnership with Australia Post, and all are still going strong today. I was incredibly honoured to be invited to the centenary this month, a celebration of an idea, of the Anzac spirit that was born in a town that has given Australia so many great institutions. I've mentioned the Flying Doctor, but Cloncurry was also the first Queensland site for School of the Air, an organisation I'm proud to have been educated by. I really want to acknowledge Cloncurry Mayor Greg Campbell and all the councillors and all the council staff who did a terrific job with the centenary. Because it is important that we celebrate our heritage, and Qantas is an important part of that. Cloncurry and many other places in remote Australia have always been home to dynamic, hard-working families, and I pay tribute to them, both in the past and those who are still there, for how proud they are of their towns and their willingness to carry on the spirit of positivity and determination embodied so admirably by the Qantas founders. Senator Payman. I'm grateful for this opportunity to deliver a speech written by Kira Fuller, a 16-year-old from Western Australia, as part of the Raise Our Voice program. And she says, Imagine what Australia could look like and feel like within the next decade if Parliament listens to diverse perspectives and actively seeks out young people's assistance in decision-making. I believe there should be more opportunities and connections for young people First Nations, people of colour and LGBTQI plus people to be involved in decision making in Parliament. Politicians have so much power over the legislation, laws and opinions of Australians. However, these views and opinions are often from the same types of people. As young people, we cannot vote until we turn 18, but we have so much to contribute. There is a stereotype that young people are uneducated on the real world that I wholeheartedly disagree with. Australia's youth have access to so many different resources that keep us informed and in touch with environmental and humanitarian problems we are facing. We have so much knowledge and experience on what it's like to live in our modern day Australian society. We question everything and have the determination to change things. Our voices are so valuable if only people in power are willing to listen, if only they're willing to work with us, not just for us. With accessible channels open to communication, we could have a more widespread current view on many topics and ensure they are actively resolved, creating a more equal and inclusive Australia for the world to be inspired by. Our voices hold so much value and we're right here, ready for the opportunity to share that with Australia. Thank you, Kira. I am so proud to read your words in Parliament and can assure you that this government takes your voice very seriously and I look forward to meeting you. Senator Rice. Thank you. Today is an important, important day. It's Tibet Lobby Day. 
And Tibetan delegates are in the building today, meeting with members of parliament from across the political spectrum to advocate for peace, for freedom and for human rights in Tibet. And I particularly want to acknowledge the delegates of, who are seated in the gallery today, including Mr Tenzin Funsok Doring, the member of the Tibetan parliament in exile for the electorate of Australasia, and Mr Kama Singe, representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Australia. And I had the, priv the privilege of travelling with Mr Singe to Washington DC in June this year for the 8th World Parliamentarians Convention on Tibet. So, and one of the issues that the Tibetan delegation are raising with members of parliament, which I spoke to them about this morning, is the succession of the Dalai Lama. In 1995, Chinese security forces kidnapped a year-old Tibetan child, Gedun Cherki Nima, following his recognition by the Dalai Lama as the Tibet's Panchen Lama. And tragically, he hasn't been heard from since. Today, he would be over 30 years old. Tibet's traditional practices, culture and Tibetan Buddhism are under threat. Carrying or possessing a photo of the Dalai Lama brings with it harsh penalties, including imprisonment. The Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected and protected for all peoples in all countries, and that applies here in Australia as well. And we will speak out about human rights abuses wherever they occur. We urge the Australian government to oppose any effort to interfere with the practices of Tibetan Buddhism and only recognise a Dalai Lama appointed via Tibetan Buddhist traditions and practices. And I have lodged a motion to this effect on the notice paper today, and it was something that I will continue to raise in this place through every means possible. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. Do you want to know how desperate Daniel Andrews is? I'll tell you how desperate. He has taken to labelling his political opponents Nazis and racists. That's how desperate. Now, when Andrews said at the weekend that there was no place for Nazis, racists or bigots in the Victorian parliament, well, I could have been forgiven for thinking it was a resignation speech. That's what I thought. Now, sadly, Andrews will not remove himself from power. He's dug in there like a tick. Only the people of Victoria are able to do that, and that's exactly what you need to do this Saturday at the ballot box. When you are an abject failure, failure as a premier, all you've got left is to call your opponent's names and less than a week out from the most important election in Victoria's history. That's where we are. Daniel Andrews can't talk about the health system. It's a disaster. He can't talk about the Victorians' finances. They're a mess. He can't talk about integrity, not with five IBAC inquiries under his belt. He can't talk about unity. Even his colleagues despise him. He can't talk about hotel quarantine because he doesn't remember. He can't talk about his handling of the pandemic. It was brutish. So what has he got left? The Victorian Premier has been reduced to funding, funding woke netball teams and accusing anyone who doesn't approve of him of being a Nazi. He gave this woke netball team $15 million. Taxpayer money. That could have paid for approximately 200 paramedics in a state where people are dying at home waiting for an ambulance to show up. Just when you thought he couldn't divide the community anymore, he starts defaming anyone who thinks differently. What happened to the kinder, gentler politics federal Labor promised? Where is that in Victoria? There are no Nazis in the Victorian parliament, but there is a tyrant, a tyrant who needs to go. Senator Antic. Thank you. If you've been paying attention recently, then you'll have noticed the term myocarditis and died suddenly has featured quite a lot. Now, we know that myocarditis and pericarditis are two heart inflammation conditions well associated with the COVID mRNA injections. Even the Therapeutic Goods Association admits that. Yet, despite this well-established fact, the injections were mandated to thousands of Australians and speaking out about these incursions on freedom got one labelled an anti-vaxxer or a peddler of dangerous misinformation. Now, I've obtained data through Freedom of Information from SA Health in South Australia regarding the number of cardiac presentations per month in South Australian public hospitals since 2018. The data reveals that cardiac-related presentations for 15 to 44-year-olds remain steady at 1,100 per month from January 2018, but drastically spiked in July 2020. 
2021 through November 2021, peaking at 2,172 per month just as these injections were rolled out. They almost doubled. Then there was another spike in February of this year, right around the time when the boosters were being mandated. These injections are harming and, in many instances, killing our young people. So what does SA Health have to say about this? Nothing. They continue to roll out the injections. They continue to push the injection narrative. This injection campaign is going to go down as the greatest scandal in medical history. And none of you said a single thing. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. You know, doing this job, you come across some wonderful people doing really great things. It makes your heart warm and fuzzy. I had one of those moments last week when I went to visit the self-help workplace in Youngtown. Self-help workplace is staffed by people with special needs. They started 60 years, ago, 60 years ago and have grown into a very successful business. They operate in five different industries, timber production, hospitality, retail, and they run a mean op shop grounds maintenance and commercial solutions, helping with mass mail-outs. You can tell when you visit that this isn't just a workplace. They're a work family. Just take a look at Monica. She's been there for almost 45 years. 45 years. That's a record in any workplace, I reckon. And whilst Monica made some little jabs about working there, it was clear that she wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Watching the employees work, it was pretty obvious that they loved what they do and felt empowered doing it. There are over 50 employees at Self-Help Workforce. Almost all of them are on NDIS plans. The business doesn't just give them a job. It gives them a clear purpose to get out of bed in the morning. It helps them to interact with others and learn new things. The team also helps their employees to learn life skills and be more self-sufficient at home. For example, doing laundry with the donations for the op shop. It can help them how to learn how to do their own laundry at home. Politics is often about doom and gloom, but seeing businesses like the self-help workplace reminds you of all the good that is happening in our state. I think if we all took a leaf out of their book, we'd do a lot better off. Donna, I know you need a bit of help with the weeding in the veggie garden, and I've promised that I'll be there in the new year, bring a few veg and help weed it out. Thank you for having me along. It made my week. Senator Thorpe. Thank you to the amazing Acting Deputy President. As the 2022 FIFA World Cup kicks off today in Qatar, human rights advocates, players, fans, football associations, migrant workers and their families are continuing to bring attention to the human rights violations and migrant worker deaths that have occurred in the lead-up to the tournament. Over a dozen national football associations and 15 countries have supported calls for FIFA and the Qatari government to establish a remedy fund of 440 million US dollars for migrant workers who have suffered human rights abuses and for the families of those workers who died, currently estimated at at least 6,500 workers that have died. This request has so far been dismissed by both FIFA and the Qatari authorities. Football Australia and the Australian government have not joined this call, instead choosing to remain silent. Shame. It is about time this country took its human rights obligations seriously. But again, we are lagging behind in both our domestic obligations and international advocacy. Tomorrow, I will table a petition with 5,800 signatures from soccer fans, advocates and concerned citizens calling on Football Australia to push more strongly for justice for migrant workers killed or injured in the construction of the World Cup, and demanding that the Australian government step up and tell the truth about ongoing human rights abuses in this country and abroad and hold accountable governments and international organisations like FIFA. Senator Van. Madam Acting Deputy President, last week I had the privilege to attend COP27 in Egypt as part of a delegation of coalition members of parliament, thanks to the Coalition for Conservation. In what was an incredibly enriching experience, I was able to learn a great deal 
from legislators from all over the world and from both sides of the aisle, but particularly from those from the UK Congress and the UK Parliament. One of the key messages that was continually repeated was on the importance of not putting all our eggs in one basket and how the transition to net zero future will not be easy. This means we must have a diversified source of options to allow this transition to occur, which is why it was a shame that, despite the coalition being so well represented at the conference, the government seemed to be missing in action. Yes, the minister showed up for a couple of days, the last couple of days, and that was quite embarrassing. My key takeaway from Egypt is that the transition ahead of us will be long, hard and expensive and that there will not be any one solution that works for every country. And also that while renewables are an important part of the solution, they are not the whole solution. Why? Because you can't have re renewables without some form of firming technology. It was interesting to be standing no more than a few feet away from the US presidential envoy for climate change, John Kerry, was emphasising how important small modular nuclear reactors will be, and hearing from the Icelandic government talking about how important carbon capture and storage will be. And this government needs to wake up to the fact that this transition will have to occur, and this means us investing in diversified sources of energy options right now. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On the 19th of November 1941, uh, 645 sailors lost their lives on HMAS Sydney II uh, while it was defending Australia, and the ship was sunk by the Cormoran, the German merchant raider. On the weekend, I was able to join uh, commemorations with the Chief of Navy, Admiral, uh, Vice Admiral Mark Hammond, and also. Uh, the acting uh, administrator for the territories, and I'd like to express particularly to the uh, Christmas Island residents, uh, especially the Shire of Christmas Island, uh, for coming together. In 1941, when the ship sank, it was three months later that a life raft turned up on Christmas Island with a body on the raft, and that person was unknown, but the Christmas Islanders were able to bury him there, knowing that perhaps he was the unknown sailor uh, from HMA Sydney. His body laid on Christmas Island, buried for many, many decades, until it was exhumed in 2006 and taken to Western Australia. And only last year, in November, uh, were we able to identify uh, who that was in terms of um, his identity. And I'd like to just say that uh, able seaman Thomas Wellsby Clark will always be Thank remembered. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. The time for this uh, two-minute statement has expired. We'll now move to question time, and I'm calling Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The Treasurer has stated that the government is acting with some urgency in relation to the soaring cost of gas prices. Minister, will you bring about an end to the uncertainty of the government's policy on gas prices by the end of this sitting fortnight? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister. Oh, my goodness. Number one, number two, uh, Senator number Watt. Three, number four, number Senator five. Watt, I've got the minister on her feet. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Hume for the question, even though I'm uh, a little bit surprised at the way it was framed. Will we end the uncertainty? Um, we ended the uncertainty with the election of an Albanese yeah, government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We ended a decade of uncertainty, a decade of energy policy uncertainty. How many times did you try and land a policy? 22 and counting, and didn't land any of them. Didn't land any of them. No, you didn't. You didn't. And everywhere we went, the private sector were saying, "Can you provide certainty? We want investment certainty. We want to understand the approach that government policy will take, so that we can make investment decisions." And and Senator Hume asks me about the uncertainty. I'll tell you what we've done. In fact, since coming to government, 
uh, Minister Bowen left the swearing-in ceremony to deal with the fact that the lights were going to go right. out. Exactly. The swearing-in ceremony. We then uncovered a 20 per cent increase mm. in the price of electricity that, that Mr Angus Taylor covered had covered up, had taken the unprecedented step of covering up and hiding before the election so that it didn't become an election issue, because guess what? You were told that electricity prices were going to go up and you weren't honest with the Australian people. What we have done is put in the budget the information we have about the increase in energy prices and what the Australian people have is a government that's working hard to look at what options are available for us um, to deal with Senator it. Senator Gallagher, Minister, uh, sen pre pre order. President, President, point of order. order. Sen Senator, uh, Senator a, Hughes. Senator Birmingham. Sen Senator, Birmingham. Senator Birmingham, just a moment, please. I'll wait until there's silence from those on my right, Senator Birmingham. Point of order on the question of direct relevance. Senator Hume's question was quite specific to the matters of intervention in the gas market uh, and quoted the Treasurer as saying the government would act with some urgency on that. Senator Hume purely asked whether the government would clarify its position by the end of this sitting fortnight. I ask you to draw the minister, who's had ample opportunity to traverse a whole range of other energy policy questions, to the specific direct question that was asked. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator Wong, on the same point. Thank you. On the point of order, I'd refer you to some of the rulings of Senator Ryan, who made the point that uh, opposition members or senators should not be surprised if there's a political statement in the opening of the question if the response to the question is somewhat wider. Uh, the, the senator chose to frame her question in terms of certainty or, or lack thereof. Uh, I put it to you, uh, um, President, that consistent with past rulings, the minister is entitled to pick up the issue of certainty, Thank which she you. is doing. Senator Wong, <coughs> there, there was a preamble to the question, and uh, it did deal with urgency. And I believe that um, the minister is being relevant um, to the question of direct relevance. Because there's a preamble there, I think the minister is entitled to canvas both the preamble and the specific question. Can I, can I ask you to review the Hansard of that question? The only preamble related to quoting the Treasurer, and then the question, the question, it wasn't a preamble, the question off the back of the Treasurer's statement around urgency went to uncertainty in the gas prices and the gas market. I invite you. you to look. It was a very <coughs> tightly worded question, President. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Um, Senator Wong. Certainly. There was a preamble to the question, however it's phrased. There was, uh, and the minister is entitled to go there, but I will review the Hansard. Um, but my ruling remains. Um, Senator, Minister, you've got 22 seconds. The second thing we did was deal with the lack of supply, um, the supply shortfall that we were advised by the ACCC. And what we're doing now is to sensibly work through options to deal with ensuring we get reasonable prices into the market. That's what the government is doing right now. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume, first supplementary. <coughs> Thank you, Madam President. Earlier today, <coughs> the Treasurer told journalists we have made it very clear that we are interested in a temporary, meaningful, responsible, sensible intervention in the energy market. Minister, why is it that the government, who couldn't make up their mind pre-budget, they couldn't make up their mind before the sittings this week, now, Order. Order. now, Order. Can't, <clears throat> now can't commit to doing so before the parliament rises for this year? Um, before I call the minister, I'll remind senators that the person asking the question has the right to be heard in silence, as does the minister, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And, uh, in terms of what this government is doing, we're keeping the lights on, we're addressing the supply shortfall, now we're looking at options around price. Yep. After nine years of delay, neglect and you know, disorderly co kind of conduct across there because no one could agree on what to do. We are cleaning it up. In fact, in terms of power, we had four gigawatts of dispatchable power exit under your watch and only one gigawatt come in. So we're dealing with all of these issues. In six months, we have done more, much more, than you did in your three terms in office. And we are working hard to resolve it. We are 
explaining, and the Treasurer there couldn't have put it better myself in terms of the language he used. It is complex. If there was a silver bullet, don't you think someone would have deployed it by now? We are working through the options sensibly and meaningfully in a temporary way, as was explained during the estimates hearing. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Hume, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, the government's budget actually cut policies and programs designed to increase Australia's future gas supply. And at the same time, it abandoned its promise to reduce electricity prices by $275. Isn't it a fact that only gas market policies that, actually, that have actually been announced by the Albanese government are making a difficult situation worse and not better? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Madam, uh, President. We're doing exactly what we said we'd do. Where we have um, cut programs, it was because Perhaps there wasn't a business case. There wasn't information about what was going to happen with that money. There were decisions that were taken but hadn't been funded. We're cleaning up your mess again there. In terms of passing the climate legislation, we have done that. We're doing exactly what we said we'd do. We're implementing Powering Australia. And the simple fact of the matter is renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. So if we can get more renewable energy into the grid through our Powering Australia uh, plan, then that will put downward pressure on prices. That is, we are doing exactly what we said we'd do. And in terms of these short-term pressures caused by the war in Ukraine and the neglect of the last nine years, we are working through options that will provide some relief to manufacturers, businesses and households where we can and working with states and territories on that. Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. On Friday last week, I travelled to Forbes and Yugara and saw firsthand the utter devastation caused by last week's flooding events. Minister, can you please provide an update on the recent floods across the country and what the Albanese government is doing to support impacted communities? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, I recognise and thank you for your commitment to flood-affected communities, particularly as the government's special envoy for disaster recovery. In Australia right now, there are currently around 200 local government areas which are disaster declared and receiving state and federal support. Many of those are in New South Wales, where 75 local government areas have experienced severe flooding. That's around 60 per cent of all the council areas in New South Wales. These floods bring real tragedy, and our thoughts are with the family and friends of the 10 people who have lost their lives in New South Wales and Victoria to date. These floods are, are deadly, and they are, in many areas, repeated. These floods have a real human cost, and people are hurting. Uh, Senator Sheldon, I know that you visited Central West New South Wales last week, as did the Deputy Prime Minister. And we've all heard devastating and inspiring stories of resilience and survival. Yesterday, I met with locals in Yugara, where homes were literally washed down the road and house roofs came to rest on cars, among much other damage. I spoke with Snow, who pulled 12 people out of floodwaters to safety, and Kim, who was rescued from her roof by helicopter. I heard stories of neighbours checking on one another and helping with the clean-up. Understandably, the people I met with are deeply affected by these traumatic experiences, and I know they have the support of this entire chamber. I know other communities are going through similar horrors. While in Rochester in Victoria just over a week ago, I saw the damage from heavy, from heavy rains on the local school. I've seen similar damage on homes, crops and businesses in, in Echuca, Moree, Forbes and Parks just since Parliament last sat. I want to commend the heroic work we're seeing from local communities and from local SES, police and fire services. The federal government is currently deploying 200 ADF personnel in central New South Wales as we speak, uh, and it's been terrific to see support from our international friends in New Zealand and Singapore as well. Everyone is supporting okay, these you, communities Senator right Walker. now. Time has expired. Um, Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Minister, I'm aware over the past month you have visited communities across Tasmania, Victoria and South Australia which are out of the immediate disaster and are now entering the long-term recovery. Minister, we know that flood recovery will take months, if not years, and these communities will be reliant on our support. What financial assistance is currently available for flood-impacted communities? Minister. Uh, thanks again, Senator Sheldon. This 
this severe weather is very widespread, with disaster declarations for the September-October floods and storms now in effect in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and Queensland. As I mentioned earlier, in Australia there are currently around 200 local government areas which are disaster declared and receiving state and federal support. This in includes a combination of support for individuals, financial help for councils and homeowners for clean-up and repairs of roads, bridges and other infrastructure, supports for primary producers, assistance for small businesses and hardship grants for non-profit groups. <laughs> Currently, we're delivering support that will help communities' immediate needs as we continue to assess the longer-term supports that will be necessary to help towns recover and rebuild. The Albanese government continues to work very closely with state governments and councils to make sure that appropriate support is getting where it's needed. I'm very pleased to see such bipartisan spirit, and I acknowledge the, uh, the contact I've had from Senator Davey in her shadow role, Thank along you, with uh, other um, members of the Senator National Sheldon, Party. Second supplementary. While I was in Western New South Wales, many community members raised the state of the roads and their concerns about getting produce in and out of flood impacted areas. What support is the Albanese government providing to help fix the roads in these communities? Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Sheldon. We understand that road repairs are a major concern for a lot of regions who have experienced flooding. Roads are the arteries of regional Australia and we need to try to keep them open as quickly as we can. Support for road repairs is currently available in New South Wales, Tasmania and Victoria through the disaster recovery funding arrangements, which are jointly funded by the federal and state governments. These funds provide immediate help for states and councils to repair roads, footpaths, bridges, tunnels, flood levees and stormwater infrastructure. And the National Emergency Management Agency and Resilience New South Wales will be meeting with councils in New South Wales this week to help them with information about what kind of support is available. I'm very conscious that these floods are not just happening in New South Wales. They've been happening in a number of other states, and our friends in South Australia are watching with concern about what might be coming down the Murray River shortly. And that support will continue to be in place for every state and every community to repair the roads and infrastructure that we're seeing destroyed. We are standing with these communities, and we will continue to do that for as long as is necessary. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, Senator Cash. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, what modelling has been undertaken by Treasury into by how much workplace productivity and real wages will increase as a result of the government's industrial relations legislation? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I um, thank Senator Cash for the question. Well, as the senator would know, Treasury does a range of detailed modelling on the economy, and all of that is presented in the budget. It's updated regularly to factor in changing economic conditions as well as policy decisions over time. Uh, the legislation we went through this at estimates. Um, the legislation that this chamber will hopefully debate before the end of the year uh, hasn't been settled yet. Um, so, um, you know, the the modelling that the Treasury done has done and the forecasts on wages, assumptions, etc., uh, are all part. You know, uh, have not taken into consideration the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill because it hasn't been settled. Uh, Senator Cash, first supplementary. By approximately how much will real wages increase as a result of the government's industrial relations changes? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, the government has made no secret about the fact that we want to get wages moving again after again after. Um, almost a decade of stagnant wages. Um, we wanted to see wages grow in a responsible way. We're seeing some early signs of that with the wage price index that was, um, I think, released last week, which had wages increasing to 3.1 per cent. But you can see the wage forecasts, the wage price index forecasts that are factored into the budget um, on, in uh, one of the budget books, and that has wages growing at three and three quarter percent in 22-23, three and three quarter percent in 23-24, and in 24-25 at three and a quarter percent. Uh, Senator Cash, second supplementary. Uh, Minister, given your government's budget papers show real wages are declining and productivity is decreasing. When will Australians and which Australians will see an increase in their real wages? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Well, again, um, you know, if I can just go through the record of what happened uh, under the previous government. Well, well, there's some context that should be. I know it's an uncomfortable truth. 
I know it's an uncomfortable truth about Order. what happened to wages because it was a deliberate design feature of your economic architecture to keep wages low. We are dealing with an inflation challenge at the moment, uh, and no one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation. But we are seeing wages growth. We are seeing wages growth. When we look at what happened to you, 2.2 per cent a year under the previous government, and we have already seen the wage case, the minimum wage case, deliver uh, over 5 per cent. We have seen the aged care workers, all of the low-income workers that you fought against ever getting a pay rise. Remember, your submission had the benefits of low-paid work in it. We actually want to see um, low-income workers get a pay rise, and that's what they'll get Thank under you, this Minister, government and under the laws that we're going to pass. Senator Cox. Is to Minister Wong, uh, the Minister uh, representing the Minister for Climate Change. Um, this government went to COP27 telling the world that they are back, which begs the question: back from where exactly? This government has refused to commit to phasing out fossil fuels and continues to give billions of dollars to fossil fuel companies. And today, like every other day, uh, people in this place have the opportunities to stop billions of dollars being given to fossil fuel companies, particularly on First Nations lands. Uh, to stop the destruction of land and sea country. My question is, when will this government actually commit to the global call to action by stopping public money to fossil fuel companies? Minister. Thank you, um, President, and thank you to the senator for her question. And, uh, uh, she started her question by asking, from where are we back? We're back uh, from uh, the uh, position uh, the illogical, irrational, ideological position that was held by those opposite for so many years uh, after uh, we lost government. As people will know, there was no action at home when it comes to certainty, certainty to the energy markets, and there was a very clear view into, about how to behave internationally, which I do not believe is shared by most Australians and certainly not shared by this side of the chamber, including the Greens. Now, you asked about being back. I'd make the point that we were represented by two ministers at the COP, uh, along with the assistant minister, Senator McAllister, as well. I'm pleased to advise the senator that our increased ambition on climate and willingness to engage as a constructive and active global leader has been warmly welcomed by the international community, including the Pacific. We played a constructive leadership role at the COP. Uh, and we have made, uh, as um, you know, Senator climate Wong. change a Senator priority. Wong. Please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Cox. Point of relevance. My question was when will this government commit to the global action, <laughs> uh, call for action on public money to um, fossil fuel companies? Thank you, Senator Cox. And there was also a very long preamble, and uh, the minister is entitled to answer uh, those parts of the question as well. Minister. Thank you. And I understand, Senator, that. The international narrative sometimes doesn't fit your domestic political objectives, but it doesn't. It doesn't. So I want to tell you what Palau said. Palau said, a member of the Pacific family singled out Australia for our help in, de to, in delivering the loss and damage fund, saying that the tireless work by Australia and others, others reinforced our belief in multilateralism and our unwavering belief that we can solve global problems only by listening to each other and by working together. So this is Palau speaking. And so I understand you want to put a particular position because of your domestic political agenda. You know, we're actually interested in being part of the solution internationally. Uh, and I'd prefer I'll come back and talk to you about what Alok Sharma said at the COP as well, because I think it's instructive and it's useful Thank to understand you, how far out of touch those opposite were. The question work. has expired. Senator Cox, first supplementary. Uh, yesterday, an agreement was reached in the final text at COP27 regarding the loss and damaged climate fund, which will provide monetary support for countries hit hardest by the climate disasters caused by fossil fuels. Will the government commit to providing its fair share to the loss and damage fund, particularly those here in Australia, but also the developing nations, especially our Pacific neighbours? Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator, Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, I, I will just I'll respond to uh, loss and damage first, and I might also uh, give the senator perhaps the benefit of hearing what um, the Glasgow COP26 president, Alok Sharma, said. Uh, as I said in my primary answer, Australia did help deliver the loss and damage fund. Uh, as Palau said, we, we contributed to others uh, and reinforced— uh, 
Order. Well. Order. You, you, you really, <laughs> you just. Minister, you, please continue. <laughs> uh, it's just, I mean, one. It's hard to know where to start, isn't it? When, when we, when we have the Pacific saying to us that they, they appreciate that we have contributed to the loss and damage fund becoming a reality in the multilateral system. We understand, uh, of course, uh, that loss and damage is about developed countries helping developing countries deal with the impacts of climate change. It's obviously not about reparations or compensation. Uh, and obviously, from, uh, we contributed uh, respectfully uh, you, to the, the architecture. Uh, Senator Cox, second supplementary. This government has committed to co-hosting COP31 in 2026 with Pacific Nations, and Vanuatu's climate change ministers said their support will be conditional on no public money being given to fossil fuel right. projects. Will this government respect Vanuatu's position, and if so, what is the timeline for meeting this request? Thank you, Senator Cox, Minister. Uh, I know Minister Reganvanu, and, uh, and I respect him. I, I would make the point that that is not a demand that has been publicly made, nor even privately made, to me uh, uh, in the discussions with many Pacific Islands around the conference of the parties that we want to co-host. We understand the position that the minister and other Pacific Island nations have have put forward. Uh, we understand that they have seen Australia over and over again, over years, uh, take a position on climate which, climate which did not reflect the reality of their lives. Did not reflect the reality of their lives. But we want to work with them, and we want to elevate their voices. We want to elevate the real experience, lived experience of Pacific Island nations, uh, because they have a powerful voice when it comes to climate, and so should they. As Alok Sharma told a Pacific gathering, we now have in Australia a government that is back on the front line of the fight against climate change, and I'd like us to cheer that now. We're very grateful for that support. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Professor Sean Tennell arrived back in Australia on Friday after 650 days in a Myanmar pr prison. What efforts were made to secure Professor Tennell's release? Thank you, Senator Payman, Minister. Thank you. Uh, our senators uh, will have seen, and I'm sure all of us welcome, that Professor Sean Tennell has arrived safely back here in Australia and has been reunited with his wife, Havu, and family after more than 21 months of unjust detention in Myanmar. And his return will be an enormous relief to family, friends and supporters of his across Australia and across the region. Uh, there have been enormous efforts across the Australian government to, to secure Professor Tennell's release. And we will continue to provide whatever consular support he and his family require. Can I at the outset particularly acknowledge the tireless work of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade? This outcome was the result of sustained strategic engagement and diplomacy by the government and by the department. DFAT officials in Canberra and across many posts in our region played a critical role in bringing Professor Turnell home. And I particularly want to acknowledge the work of our head of mission, Angela Corcoran, her predecessor, Andrea Faulkner, as well as all of the Australian and locally engaged teams at Posts. Amongst their many duties, uh, they delivered support packages to Professor Turnell in satchels with the Australian coat of arms, uh, which, as he described both the Prime Minister and I in our, co our separate calls with him, he proudly displayed in his cell. As he said to me last week, he, his line was, don't mess with the, kangaroo, the emu and the kangaroo. I also wish to thank DFAT's consular operations team, led by Ian Gerard, for their extraordinary de dedication and focus, and for their commitment and sensitivity to keeping Professor, Professor Turnell's family updated throughout the period of his detention. Uh, one of the finest accolades that anyone could give was given by Professor Turnell, who told me, but due to the work of DFAT and others, he never felt alone. Uh, I commend DFAT and all those who had a role in this extraordinary result. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, what role did Australia's partners in our region play to, achieve, to help achieve the release of Professor Turnell? Minister. Thank you. And whilst the efforts to free Professor Turnell were led by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, there are many others around our region who played a crucial role in advocating for his release. So I thank in this place all those who have advocated for his release, uh, including regional partners and especially members of ASEAN. 
Uh, I particularly want to acknowledge Cambodia and Brunei Darussalam, the ASEAN chairs of the term of his detention. I'm, I know that Senator Payne also engaged with them, and the special envoy of the ASEAN chair on Myanmar. I acknowledge the roles of our friends outside of ASEAN who advocated on our behalf. They include India, Japan, the UK and the United States. Uh, we appreciate the arrangements that were made by Myanmar authorities for Professor, Professor Turnell's release. We welcome also the news of the release of other prisoners alongside Professor Turnell, including uh, uh, Myanmar citizen holders and also foreign nationals from Thank the United you. Kingdom, Mr. US and Japan. Expired. Senator Payman, uh, second supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline to the Senate how the Albanese government will continue to support the people of Myanmar? Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator Payman. Well, uh, I think we all remain deeply concerned about the deteriorating security and humanitarian situation in Myanmar. And we continue con to condemn the regime's brutal behaviour at every opportunity, including in our regional and international advocacy. We will continue to advocate for the release of the remaining political prisoners, including Do Aung San Suu Kyi. We will continue to speak up for human rights in our region, and that means we will continue to engage with those who do not agree with us. As I did decide to directly engage with the Myanmar military regime in order to seek to secure Professor Turnell's release. I did so not because we agree with them, but because we have to deal with the world as it is but seek to shape it for the better. That is why this government will continue to support the humanitarian response in Myanmar and Bangladesh, including $135 million this financial year to assist with the delivery of life-saving food, water, you, shelter Senator and Wong. other essential for this question has expired. Senator Roberts. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. It has been four weeks since the Australian Bureau of Statistics published data showing a 67 per cent reduction in Australia's monthly birth rate between July and December 2021 as compared to the long-term average. A startling decrease. I drew attention to this data during Senate estimates, hoping for some reassurance. None was forthcoming. So let me ask again, Minister, why has Australia's birth rate declined from, from June 30, 2021 to December 31, 2021, revealing a 70% reduction? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Thank you, President. And um, I thank Senator Roberts for the question. And I recall the discussion that we had at estimates and the fact that um, certainly. Um, we requested from Senator Roberts uh, some time to go through the information that he tabled in that hearing. I haven't got that information back, but I, I think the advice given um, by the chief health officer, who I was sitting next to, or chief medical officer, and uh, myself, was that, that the data that you were using was, didn't align with, with information that we had, that we hadn't seen a drop-off of that size. That would be quite noticeable. Uh, and in fact, that that financial year of reporting, which incorporated births, was actually the strongest birth record uh, achieved so far. That we'd seen more births um, during that period of time. So, I, but I do, I do think we have to come back to you because you tabled some documents in that meeting. Um, the Department of Health took them away, and if there's anything further I can advise you, um, I will do so. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, second, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. That's not as I remember it, but we'll we'll wait for your response to come back. Is there any systematic information sharing between the Australian Bureau of Statistics and Department of Health to keep an eye on key indicators reflecting on our COVID measures, or does the Australian Bureau of Statistics just publish critical data like this in due course and hope that somebody notices at some time? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Uh, well, the ABS. Uh, thank, thanks, President. I thank Senator Roberts for the question. ABS does uh, work alongside other um, departments very closely with the data they are collecting, um, and uh, keeps an eye on on tracking any significant changes. So, if the ABS saw something in their data that would concern them, which I would imagine the the um, numbers that you're citing about declines in birth numbers in one month uh, would, would raise um, attention, um, would be dealt with across government. Um, certainly the ABS is looking at um, 
I think ABS, in their cause of death uh, publication, did report that there had been 15 deaths due to the COVID-19 vaccine in 2021, and that was against uh, vaccinations of 42.5 million vaccines administered in that year. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, what specifically is the government doing to get to the bottom of this staggering decline in births? Minister. Um, thank you. Well, to the first thing, and I, I, I remember this quite clearly from estimates, was that we undertook to have a look at the information that you had tabled in that hearing um, and align that with some of the data that the APS was actually collecting. They collect their um, births and deaths data as soon as they are available based on data from the state and territory registries of births, uh, deaths and, ma and marriages. Um, but I think from the first thing we need to do is, is get to the bottom of the numbers that you had um, provided uh, and just make sure that um, the data that we got from the ABS, certainly that I saw in that hearing, didn't align with those numbers that you had tabled. Thank you, Minister. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Minister Watt. The mining industry has told the government that tens of thousands of jobs are at risk due to Labor's IR legislation and mining tax 2.0 thought bubble. Minister, will you admit that 33,000 jobs could be lost due to Labor's latest proposals? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, and again, I note that the shadow minister for IR has been banned from asking questions about IR issues, uh, and that can only be because, of course, that everyone remembers uh, the work that the Sen that Senator Cash did as the IR minister. Uh, where she inflicted conflict and low wages on the Australian Order. public. But I'm, of course, happy to hear Order. those questions. I'm happy to take questions Order. from Senator Macdonald, who I know does have a genuine interest in the resources industry. The, um, the, I completely reject the claims being made by some employer groups that the government's industrial relations plans will cost the sort of job numbers that are being thrown around. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons the government is pursuing these IR changes is because they offer the opportunity to deliver a win-win to both employers and to employees. This, under the former government and the policies that they pursued, we had persistently low productivity uh, in, uh, in, in, in inflicting a conflict-based system on employers and employees. And at the same time, they of course delivered uh, some of the lowest wage growth that our country has seen on record. Uh, we can have every confidence that as a result of the government's IR changes, should the Senate pass them, and I sincerely hope they do, uh, that employers will win through higher productivity, and that includes mining employers, and that workers will win through getting the pay rise that they have been denied by the former government for far too long. Uh, the kind of claims that we're seeing being made uh, by some groups in the community, backed in by the coalition, uh, are, are not based on fact. Uh, they are not based on the experience of every other country around the world that has pursued the kind of changes that our government is pursuing. Uh, our changes are about driving up productivity and giving workers the pay rise that they finally deserve after waiting so long. Thank you, Minister Watt. Um, Senator Macdonald, first supplementary. The mining industry has told the government that $77 billion of resources projects are now at risk due to Labor's irresponsible IR legislation and mining tax 2.0 thought bubble. Minister, how many of the 140 projects in the pipeline will not go ahead due to Labor's latest proposals? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Macdonald. Again, the sort of figures I, I, I respect the fact that the mining industry and other employer groups are out there at the moment running a political campaign uh, against what our government is trying to do. They have every right to do so, but they also have a responsibility to put facts on the table rather than, um, rather than put facts and figures out there that have no basis in reality. Um, anyone who has any contact with the resources industry at the moment, and I'm sure Senator Macdonald does in her shadow capacity, and I certainly do as a Queensland-based minister, knows that the resources sector is incredibly excited about the opportunities that exist for investment in a, in a range of commodities. Uh, of course, critical minerals, um, massive opportunities in that front, particularly 
in the north of our country. Uh, in some of the more traditional minerals as well, there are massive opportunities there as well. And I have every expectation that while ever commodity prices remain high, as they currently are, mine, the mining industry will invest in those projects so that they can generate those profits. Thank you, Minister. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. With $100 million cuts, budget cuts to critical minerals funding, irresponsible IR legislation, a mining tax 2.0 thought bubble, can the minister confirm how many of the 46 <coughs> critical minerals projects currently in the pipeline will not proceed under Labor? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. S uh, minister. Well, <laughs> I, I'm not the minister representing the Minister for Resources. Um, so I'm happy to come back with a specific answer, or perhaps Senator Farrell, as the minister representing uh, the Minister for Resources, is better, is better prepared to answer a question of that nature. Uh, but again, this government, our position on critical minerals has been clear for some time. We have been the ones out there for the last 10 years, while you guys have been arguing amongst yourselves about whether climate change is real and whether we should have renewable industry energy. We've been the ones actually calling for the kind of investment in critical minerals Order. that will allow those kind of developments to occur. <laughs> um, so please don't give us some lecture about critical minerals and who wants to actually bring on the kind of transition towards renewable energy uh, and batteries and all the kind of things that critical minerals involve. <laughs> Our government has been backing that ever since we were elected, and we were backing it a hell of a lot earlier than that. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Shoebridge. Order. Order. I just called Senator Shoebridge and he couldn't hear it because of the noise in the chamber. Thank you, President. <clears throat> um, pre President, my question is directed <laughs> to the Honourable Penny Wong, representing the Minister for Climate Change and en Energy. Minister, communities across the west of New South Wales are experience experiencing record floods, with lives lost, property destroyed and towns in shock after an already devastating 12 months, with major flooding affecting the Lachlan, Murray, Murrumbidgee rivers, amongst others. <laughs> Residents in Forbes, Condobolin, Daniloquin, Yugowra, Walgett, Collar, and Abri, town after town, are being subject to major floods. Minister, do you accept that these major flooding events are being driven by and exacerbated by climate change? Uh, thank you, Senator Shoebridge, Minister. Th thank you, President. Well, Senator Shoebridge, I think I'm on the record for many years in accepting uh, that there. Uh, actually, since I was climate minister in 2007 and in the 2007 <coughs> campaign, where we campaigned for an emissions trading scheme, which you also supported at the time, I've been on on the record for many years, well over a decade, which shows you I've been here a bit, <laughs> a fair while, uh, in in accepting the scientific advice about the consequence of climate change. I, I recall reading a CSIRO report many years ago in the last decade, which told that which forecast that unmitigated climate change would see the goiter line move south of Clare. For those of us who come from South Australia and understand uh, what that means, that was horrif horrifying. Uh, it's all, that is what has informed, in part, uh, my commitment and our government's commitment, certainly in government last time, uh, to implement an ambitious emissions trading scheme, which I, I realise you weren't there, but your party voted with the coalition against. That's, right. That's why in government we delivered uh, uh, a climate scheme uh, when the Greens did decide to vote for it. Uh, perhaps not quite as ambitious, but uh, important nevertheless. And that is why for nine, for nine years we, in opposition, have argued each election, notwithstanding the challenge of that, uh, for uh, a clear, credible, uh, ambitious position on climate. Uh, and I am very pleased that after years of irrationality that the Australian community has returned not only a government— um, Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, Senator Shoebridge, I have already drawn to your attention you do not start saying point of order the minute you stand. You wait. I give you the call and then you tell me what the issue is. So, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, it's relevance. We're a minute and a half into the answer on floods and the terrible floods that are happening now, and the minister has not once addressed them. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Senator Shoebridge. Order, order, order. I have the minister on her feet. Minister, uh, Please go ahead. Thank I'll you. remind you the question was about the floods. Yes, uh, and as I said at the outset, I'm sorry if the senator needs me to repeat it, but I am on the record for de for over a decade. In ex well, 
Would you like to speak, Senator Wish Wilson? I notice you always want to interject. Would you like to? You go right ahead, mate. <laughs> Senator Wish Wilson. I, I did get an invitation. Uh, Senator um, Wish Wilson, President, do you have no? a point okay. of order? No, thank you. Minister Wong. If. He's, always so he's always so keen to interject, particularly on some people, that uh, we'll give you leave, mate, eh, if that's what you want. Senator Shoebridge, I'm sorry, I, I was actually genuinely trying to answer your question. I have always accepted the scientific advice about the consequences of climate change. I also recognise, and this is where our parties do differ, uh, that uh, you need to actually have policies to meet a target and recognise that uh, the, ensuring that you meet a target of reductions in emissions Thank you, Minister. Your time uh, is has a tough expired. policy. Senator Shoebridge, first supplementary. Uh, Minister, when Brisbane was devastated by flooding in 2011, we all had to pay to clean it up through a flood recovery levy. Now we're making our children pay through increased government debt, and all the while coal and gas companies are still making billions and fossil fuel subsidies of a staggering $11.6 billion a year. Why won't your government make coal and gas companies pay for disaster preparedness and to rebuild and support these devastating communities? since they created the problem in the first place. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Uh, well, the, the problem, I appreciate that the, uh, the, the, the political ob uh, object of that question is to try and, and suggest that only one part of the economy has responsibility, only one sector in society has responsibility. The reality is this is a whole of economy, a whole of society response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a whole of economy and a whole of society response, and we, we, we'll be able to deal with it if we deal with it together. But if all we do is point the finger at different parts of our society or different parts of our economy, we will never get that. The hard reality is this country has prospered greatly. We have all prospered greatly, including with, our, with the education system that has been funded th uh, uh, through, through government revenue uh, from uh, the exports that we have made over decades. And now what we have to do is transition our economy over time to a world that will be a net zero emission world. That is a big challenge, and it's not one by, that's achieved by pointing the Thank finger. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Shoebridge, second uh, supplementary. Minister, many Australians are pleased to hear the change in rhetoric on climate. Uh, myself, I'm pleased to hear that change in rhetoric on climate, some of which you've repeated here. But how is that rhetoric? going to protect us from the carbon emissions of the coal and gas projects that your government keeps continuing to support? And how are you going to answer that to the people in Western New South Wales who have climate-induced flooding right now? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge, Minister. Uh, well, well, what we will do is do what we said we would do before the election. Uh, and that is to put this economy, which is a highly inten carbon intensive economy, onto a, an ambitious 2030 target of 43 per cent reduction and a 2050 target of net zero. And unlike, and what we will do in government is not simply do rhetoric, but actually do policy which delivers it, because that is the key. We actually have to change the direction in which our economy, along with the global economy, is heading. And no amount of, as I said, blaming others and looking to the past and pointing the finger is going to actually achieve what is, what is, what is an ambitious transformation of our domestic economy and the global economy. I wish, I wish that the world at Copenhagen had done more. I really do. It was, it, was, it was one of the saddest moments I've ever been involved with in politics, for the reasons to which you have it. Thank you, Minister. Your uh, time has expired. Well, we Thank you, Minister. Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Minister Watt. Um, the government intends to reform Australia's workplace relations laws to get wages moving. Can you outline for us what the changes are and why they are necessary and what the urgency is? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Grogan. And I know that you have a very long record in standing up for the interests of workers, and it's great to see you continue that work uh, since you've been here in the Senate. The Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill delivers on the Albanese government's commitment to a fairer workplace relations system which provides Australians with job security, gender equality and sustainable wage growth. 
For nearly 10 years, wages were kept low by the coalition as a deliberate design feature of their management of the economy. None of us will ever forget that infamous interview with former Senator Matthias Cormann, where he belled the cat on the economic policy of this government and its desire to keep wages low. In contrast, the Albanese Labor government is taking action to improve workplace conditions, wages and job security by implementing our election commitments and outcomes from the Jobs and Skills Summit, which brought employers, unions and the community together in a way we had never seen under the former government. The truth is that the current workplace relations system is not working well for workers or employers, and it's not fit to meet our economy's current challenges. In particular, the bargaining system is broken. And we've all heard over recent weeks, Senator Cash in particular, that, but other members of the opposition say that what we're proposing to do is terrible, it'll make the sky fall in, it'll have all these kind of consequences. The one thing I can guarantee you is that if we don't make changes to Australia's bargaining system, if we do persist with the, uh, with the regime that was in place under the coalition, we can guarantee the same outcome, which is low wages and low productivity well into the future. The current system, presided over by the coalition, is not delivering the fairness, gender equality or economic growth that Australia needs and that Australian workers deserve. The bill aims to tackle insecure work, gender inequality and flatlining wages. And as for why this bill is urgent, Australian workers have waited long enough. Uh, they've been waiting a very long time for a decent pay rise, for wages to keep up uh, with the cost of living and to, do, and to help them with the cost Thank of living, you. and Your we're going to do something expired. about it. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister Watt. That was very useful. Um, you referenced the Jobs and Skills Summit, uh, which I was honoured to attend. Um, since that time, we've seen many, many scare campaigns, which I've been quite surprised about um, regarding these new proposed laws. Um, could you please outline for us uh, where the errors are in these scare campaigns? Minister. Thank you, Senator Grogan. And I'm not surprised that Senator Cash is feeling a bit sensitive about scare campaigns because most of them have come from her. Uh, but here's a few facts for Senator Cash. And, and, and uh, Minister Burke took the National Press Club through this the other day, but, but in case Senator Cash missed it, I'm here to repeat them. The first scare campaign that we've been hearing from the opposition is that this bill will produce coast-to-coast -coast strikes. In actual fact, the bill makes industrial action harder with an additional requirement for mandatory conciliation before industrial action can be taken. Ballots need to be agreed on by an employer Order. by employer basis as and per the current Senator rules. Watt. And don't they react? Senator don't Watt, they... oh. please resume Sorry. your seat. I'll just wait until there's quiet. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister. Don't they react when the first of their scare campaigns get called out? But you know what? I've got about four more to go through. Uh, the second scare campaign is about pattern bargaining. Uh, but in actual fact, the restrictions on taking industrial action when the bargaining representative is engaging in patent bargaining are already in the Fair Work Act. Uh, and they are not changing, not a word, not even a comma. So, in fact, what we're hearing from the opposition is a scare campaign about their Thank own you, policy. Minister. And I've got the three time more. has expired. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Uh, Senator Watt, I wonder if you would uh, be able to, uh, Minister Watt, I wonder if you'd be able to um, step out for us the difference in the workplace laws from previous approaches, because I think it may be very beneficial for those in this chamber to hear the detail of that. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Watt. I would be delighted, Senator Grogan, to, to point out how our plans for workplace laws differ from those that we've seen previously, because the contrast between the Albanese Labor government's approach and the coalition's when it comes to workplace laws could not be starker. On the one hand, we have Labor wanting to get wages moving again. On the other hand, we have the coalition for whom low wages was a deliberate design feature of the economy. For under Labor, you have higher productivity for businesses. Under the coalition, you have lower productivity. Under Labor, you have more agreements, a workplace relations law system that encourages more agreements. Under the coalition, you hear exactly what we're hearing over there, which is more conflict. They are addicted to conflict in the workplace and they want to hang on to it. We actually want to bring in more agreements between employers and employees. For the coalition, it is never the right time for a pay rise. For years, they told us that low unemployment would deliver pay rises. We now have unemployment and we're not getting the pay rises going on with it. We saw Senator Birmingham on Insiders yesterday mumbling and fumbling his way through Thank you, the Senator answer to the Watt. question about how uh, you get wage rises has moving. Expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. 
Over the last three months, the Iranian regime has been accused of killing more than 300 civilians standing up for human rights, particularly Iranian women and girls. When the Prime Minister was asked by the opposition two weeks ago why sanctions had not been applied to the Iranian officials responsible for the killing of its citizens, he said that the government was considering the implications of doing so for Australian businesses. The Iranian-Australian community has been calling for weeks for the Australian government to hold the Iranian regime to account. Has the government now applied any sanctions, and if not, why not? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Wong. Minister Wong, beg your pardon. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Well, the senator did canvass some of this uh, in uh, estimates, and I, I will repeat what I said to Senator on that occasion, uh, which is uh, uh, there is, uh, I think. Uh, bipartisan or multi-party uh, condemnation of what is occurring in Iran, uh, which is also why the, the government uh, has been very forward-leaning uh, in, in its public statements of condemnation, uh, its engagement through DFAT with the Ashage uh, here, and also at the UN General Assembly. Uh, uh, and I went took the, the senator through. Uh, the interaction the government had had, including the, the statement at the, the General Assembly on the human rights situation in Iran. We supported calls for a special session of the Human Rights Council to address the deteriorating human rights situation in Iran. Uh, I, uh, uh, on social media, expressed support for the Canada, New Zealand, Australia, New Zealand statement at the UN Security Council, highlighting our concerns about Iran's membership of, uh, on the UN Commission on the Status of Women, a body that Iran joined under, whilst the coalition was in government. Uh, we joined Canada and New Zealand in expressing those concerns to the UN Security Council. We delivered a uh, further statement uh, to the UN uh, Third Committee Interactive Dialogue. Uh, and uh, I can go back further. Uh, I've engaged with uh, counterparts, including Melanie Jolie, as recently as last week about this, this issue. In relation to sanctions, as Senator Payne and Senator Bishop uh, and Ms Bishop would have said before me, we don't uh, engage in public speculation about sanctions, and you will understand why not. Uh, but I would encourage the senator. I understand uh, that uh, this is an issue um, that many people are concerned about. This isn't a partisan issue. Thank you, Minister. This is an Your issue we are all expired. joining. Senator Chandler, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Since the Prime Minister's comments, the Iranian government has used its military to fire on and kill innocent civilians, including children like nine-year-old Kian Pifalek, who died after security forces opened fire on the car he and his parents were in. When will the government do more than give lip service to the women and girls of Iran and the Iranian Australians calling for Australia to take action? Uh, thank you, Senator Chandler, Minister. Well, look, uh, I, I, don't, I disagree with the lip service point. That seems to suggest the only way in which uh, a government can express its view with the many regimes and, in, and countries with which we do not agree is by sanctions. And if that is the case, then there were almost no expression. There was almost no expression in support of human rights under the coalition, almost none. So my point, my point is, my point is this: um, there are a great many states in this world, uh, some in our region, uh, whose actions we do not agree with. And sometimes you're right. Sometimes you know, we, we look at what are the hardest form of expression of that. Uh, you know, the UN, UN sanctions are an example of that. Uh, the, the, the sanctions on North Korea and Russia are an, are an example on that, on that. But what we also should do is what Australia has been doing, which is bilaterally and multilaterally add our voice at our voice in condemnation of what is occurring Thank in Iran. Thank you, Minister. Iran. The time has expired. Senator Chandler, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Since the Prime Minister said Australia was still thinking about taking action, the international community, including the United States and the EU, have imposed sanctions on companies and individuals involved in the production or transfer of Iranian drones that have been used by Russia in attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. When will Australia catch up to the rest of the international community, and when will the government use the Magnitsky-style laws passed by this parliament for the express purpose of holding to account those responsible for the most egregious human rights abuses? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister. I, I think that, yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> thank the senator for her question. We, we actually implement the full suite of UN Security Council mandated sanctions on Iran, uh, an autonomous sanction regime to pr prohibit uh, the transfer of conventional arms to Iran. Uh, in fact, it's on this basis that we have imposed previously, and I acknowledge um, this is, I think it was Ms Bishop from memory, but it may also have been Senator Payne who continued them, targeted sanctions on Iran's Islamic Re Revolutionary Guard Corps as a whole and a number of IRGC, um, uh, Iran Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, Corps linked officials, financial and travel entities, which I think may have been imposed by Senator Payne. Uh, in relation to the uh, provision of armed drones and missiles, uh, that is a deeply concerning uh, report. We condemn any arms transfers to Russia uh, to support its illegal aggression against Ukraine, and we, have call, we call you, upon Minister. all Your countries for, to refrain Senator from supporting Colin. Russia. Thank Senator. you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. Could the Minister outline the government's approach to trade policy? Thank you, Senator Pollock. Minister. Thank you. And, uh, yes, I, yes, I can, uh, <coughs> Senator Polly. And uh, thank you for the wonderful job you do on the behalf of the people of Tasmania. And I know, I know you know all of the benefits that. Uh, Come to, uh, come to Tasmania from free trade. And open trade is a net positive for Australia. Uh, recent uh, analysis uh, show that uh, one in four jobs is uh, related to trade in this country, and many of them in Tasmania, I might add. Uh, and jobs and export industries pay 5 per cent above the national average income. As uh, outlined in my speech on the 14th of November to the uh, APEC Study Centre in Melbourne, there are four principles guiding uh, Australia's approach to international trade and investment under this government. The first principle <coughs> is that to meet the challenges of our time, we need to deepen and diversify our trading relationships. Placing all your trade eggs in the one basket has proved bad economic strategy. Secondly, Australia is working collabor collaborati collaboratively with like-minded partners to support an open, rules-based, multi-trading system that works in Australia's interests. And thirdly, we're investing in ourselves using industry policy to ensure Australia's exports are more complex, of higher value and more sophisticated. And finally, uh, the fourth principle is that trade uh, must be a driver of inclusive economic growth and greater economic well-being for all Australians. More trade, not less, is a key part of how we build an economic future uh, that we want in Australia, a future of secure, high-paying jobs. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Polly, first supplementary. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Thank you for that informative answer, Minister. How will the new free trade agreements support the government's trade policy agenda? Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you Senator, for that other uh, question. And uh, thank you, uh, President, uh, for the opportunity to answer a terrific question. Um, a key plank of our trade policy agenda is trade diversification. This means helping Australian businesses grow and develop new markets for their exports and to find new and deeper sources of investment. Today, our government is delivering this commitment by debating legislation uh, in the House of Representatives, which will bring the uh, Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement and the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement into force. The India Free Trade Agreement will eliminate tariffs on 90 per cent of Australians, uh, Australia's exports to India. The Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement—well, you didn't do it. You had a chance to do it, and you didn't do it. But we're doing the job. We're doing the job. The Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement will el eliminate— Thank you, Minister. The time oh, has expired. The... Senator Polly, second supplementary. The minister recently participated in trade negotiations to launch the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. What is the framework and how will participation 
support Australia's trade policy agenda, Minister? Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the chair, thank, thank you, uh, Senator Rapoli, for that. Um, President, President, recently, recently I joined uh, ministers from 13 other partners across the Indo-Pacific in Los Angeles to launch negotiations on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF, as it's known. IPEF members uh, include eight of our top ten trading partners and key regional allies like the United States, Japan, Korea, India, Indonesia and, of course, our Pacific neighbour, Fiji. The framework will cover new and emerging trade issues, including supply chains, clean energy, infrastructure, tax and anti-corruption. IPEF is an important part of the Albanese Labor government's trade policy agenda. That will help businesses expand and support high-paying jobs. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Wong. Thank you. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. And Senator Birmingham, I was a bit incomplete before. I'll review that question and, if necessary, come back to the chamber. Thank you. Senator McGrath. Thank you. I um, rise to take note of all answers to all questions asked by coalition senators. I'm going to begin with the, the question asked by, by Senator Hume in relation uh, to, to gas policy and gas prices and energy prices. And we shouldn't forget, and it's hard to forget, that the Labor Party 97 times, that's 97 times before the election, 97 times, Senator Cadell, promised 97 times that they would cut power bills by $275. It was one of those core promises of the Labor Party. They were going to cut your power bills by $275. 97 times they said that. And yet we find in, in the budget, in the budget papers, and it was in very small font, I think about font size eight or nine, that, that, that actually power prices under the Labor Party are going to go up 56%. 56 per cent they're going to go up, uh, uh, Mr Deputy President, and that's, that's not 15.6 per cent or 5.6 per cent or 0.56 per cent. That is 56 per cent. So we have a Labor Party who are in power who promised to cut power bills by $275, and yet we find a Labor Party who instead are going to, through their policy in action, and actually through the decisions they are making. So it's that axis of any decisions they do make are going to be the wrong decisions, and the decisions they don't make are also going to be the wrong decisions. So we're going to end up with, with power bills going up by 56 per cent. Indeed, the, the average Australian family are going to be $2,000 worse off by Christmas because of the policies of, of the Labor Party. Mr Deputy President, Labor are always going to cost you more. They're going to cost you more with your power bills. They're going to cost you more with, 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 with your interest rates. They're going to cost you more when your rent goes up. They're going to cost you more when unemployment goes up, which is going up at the moment under the policies of, of, of the Labor Party. Because what we're seeing, what we're seeing with the Labor Party and, and their, their radical and their extreme industrial relation policies, and Senator Wong is laughing, but we've got radical and extreme industrial relation policies that are so, so, so anti, so anti small business. And I, and I stand here as, as, a, as a senator for Queensland and a strong and proud proponent of small businesses across all of Queensland. And the ones that I speak to, and, and when I was um, left home about, about a week ago, I was, I was chatting to—I um, won't probably name them because I don't want the Labor Party and the unions picking on them—but some, the, some of the people I, I buy stuff from in, in Warwick, and they are terrified, terrified about the radical and extreme industrial relation policies that are going to come down, because they don't want to get caught up into this vortex of the Labor Party paying back their union, their union paymasters. Mr. Deputy President, and that's what, what we're seeing with these radical and extreme industrial relations policies. So the poor, poor Australian people, not only do they have Mr. Albanese as Prime Minister, heaven help all of us, but they've got 56 per cent rises in, in power bills and they've got radical industrial relations policies. And when you look into, when you look into what 
that the government is not doing or doing in relation to gas, you should be very scared. Because not only did the government in its, in its recent budget uh, reduce support for gas exploration, reduce support for ensuring that we have reliable energy across Australia, what they did was they gave $10 million to the Environmental Defender's Office. $10 million to, to the radical, to the extreme Environmental Defender's Office. So effectively the Labor Party are funding extreme left-wing greenies to stop the progress of, or the progress of, 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 of commerce and business and of resource development in Australia. So if you wonder in about a year's time or two years' time why your power bills have gone up so much, it is because of the policies of the Labor Party. The policies that, 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 that the ministers today could not answer questions on in relation to what is going to happen with whether it's your power bills or whether it's in relation to how much your, your pay may go up. And we all want, we all want um, Australians' pay to go up, but the minister was asked a direct question today about how much will, will people's pay go up under the Labor Party, and all we got was, was a bunch of waffle. Uh, a lot of waffle, uh, and it's not like the, the waffle that you can, you can get and eat uh, that comes out of a jaffa line. It was the waffle that just causes you to lose the will to live. Listening to those answers, so it is very, very sad that the Australian people will have higher power bills and actually will not get the pay rises they deserve because of the policy and action of, of the Labor Party. Senator Urquhart. President, well, what a load of waffle that was from the best waffler in this place, I must say. Just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, honestly, we heard the most ridiculous questions coming from that side. I mean, the question that Senator Macdonald asked Senator Watt about the mining industry and the loss of 33,000 jobs. What a ridiculous statement to make. Absolutely ridiculous. What they haven't listened to is the fact that the Minister for Industrial Relations has listened to feedback. We on this side actually go out and talk to people when we form policy. We've, we've gone out, we've listened to feedback about how to make sensible improvements to practical applications of the bill. That's what we're doing. And we are continuing to consult as the bill progresses through the Senate. So those discussions are continuing to happen. The Minister for Workplace Relations and his department, putting you to sleep, am I, Senator Dunham over there? making you yawn. Well, listen, you might hear something. We talk to people. We actually go out and talk yeah. to people. Senator Urquhart, to resist uh, commenting on the disposition of the members to my left. I don't need assistance. Senator I Dunham. couldn't help it. He was yawning while I was speaking. <laughs> he was yawning continue, while I was Senator speaking. Um, and I no. thought I was loud enough to keep him awake, Deputy President. No, he doesn't. He doesn't please don't reflect on the, on the disposition of the member the, to my um, the Minister for Workplace Relations and his department have consulted closely with businesses, the businesses that the people on the other side have pretended are scared, with unions who actually represent the workers in this place, even though they don't like to use that word, they actually do represent the, the workers and they have a place in, in businesses and civil society. And we've, we've dealt with all of those and we've consulted and we will continue to consult with all of those during the design of those reforms. And as I said, we are continuing. We're continuing to have cons consultations with stakeholders around concerns that small businesses have raised and the better off overall test to ensure that no worker is left off. I don't know why on that side you have a problem with workers getting a pay rise. Do you ever go out and talk to workers? Because we do. Workers like me who used to work in a factory many years ago struggle. They're struggling today to make ends meet because for 10 years, while you guys were in charge, they had no wage increase. In fact, their wages were driven down and they had no ability. Low paid workers, aged care workers, uh, cleaners, child care workers, laid pay, uh, low paid workers who helped us through the pandemic that we had, who worked day in, day out to provide for us to be able to get through the pandemic. And all you want to do is suppress their wages and keep them down while the costs of living are rising. And we know that. This, there is an inflation challenge. Senator Gallagher said that in her answer to the question to Senator Cash, and we know that. But there is times when workers need wage rises, and they need it now. 
And I think the scaremongering about job losses is just simply that. It is scaremongering. It is not, it is not a reality. We know that under, this, under the previous government, under, over that side of the chamber, wages were the lowest growth on record. Low, real wages went down for years and years and years under you guys over there, and workers really struggled. There's, we know that higher productivity is when, you, when workers get good wage, wage rises, we know that they get higher productivity. That is demonstrated by, by workers who are paid proper wages. But of course, you don't know about that because you kept wages down for 10 years. The, we had hearings of this inquiry. There were five days of hearings, and I might say that was more public hearings than any other workplace-related bill inquiry since the first uh, Fair Work Act commenced over a decade ago. So more hearings on this bill than what you people had over there when you made changes to the Act. And we heard from uh, employers, the committee that run that, the Education and Employment Committee, heard from employers, employer groups, the ACTU, in individual unions, workers, not-for-profit organisations, academics and the Department of Employment Workplace Relations. We know that there is a consultation that is still happening, as I said, as it moves through the Senate. We have consulted. And you guys should stop that scaremongering because it just frightens people. And it's ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. People uh, deserve to get wage increases. People look to us and they will get a wage increase through the Labor Party and through the government now. And they deserve it because for 10 years you kept them suppressed and their wages Thank suppressed. You, Senator, Kurt. Senator Smith. Very much, Mr. Deputy President. In these final two weeks of Parliament, the matter that will be top of mind for many senators will be discussions, the debate, and the resolution of the Labor government's new industrial relations platform. West Australians are confused. The government, it's fair to say, enjoyed strong electoral support in Western Australia. It won the seat of Pearce, it won the seat of Hasluck, it won a Senate spot. So West Australians can't understand why is it now that this Labor government has decided so quickly, and I think today marks the six-month anniversary of the election of the government, West Australians can't understand why this new Labor government is now turning its back on West Australians and, importantly, turning its back on what is a critical part of the West Australian economy, indeed the most critical part of Australia's prosperity, and that is the mining and resources sector. There are six words that West Australians should not forget. It's not our policy, said Jim Chalmers. Jim Chalmers said before the election that wholesale industrial relations reform was not the policy of the government. Now, after the election, Jim Chalmers and the Prime Minister and Labor senators are saying it is the central piece of their so-called economic plan to improve wages in Australia. It's not our policy, said Jim Chalmers, for everybody to hear, and just six months later we are now in the Senate chamber, and it is the centrepiece of the last two weeks of this parliamentary sitting period. So let's just be very, very clear about why this is so central, why it is important for coalition senators like myself and Senator Cardell and others to stand up and argue against this industrial relations plan, which will damage the mining and resources sector in Western Australia and indeed across the whole country. Let's be clear about this. The mining and resources sector earns for this whole country $43 billion of export revenue. 
Secondly, it employs over 277,000 people. And importantly for the government, which makes it more surprising that it will be turning its back on the mining and resources sector, is that it generates just over $43 billion in tax revenue for Australian governments. So West Australians have a right to be very, very distrustful so early on in the term of this government. Why is it, having enjoyed such electoral success in Western Australia six months ago, they are now in the final two weeks of this parliament deciding to turn their back on such a significant, if not the most significant industry in Western Australia and such an important industry across our whole country? The problem with Labor is that you can't believe what they say. You can't believe what they say. Coalition senators on this side of the Senate are surprised that so early in the term of this new government their mistruths, their lack of honesty, their ability to wholesale change policy commitments given prior to the election are now there for the whole community to see. And West Australians have seen it with great clarity. These industrial relations reforms will damage the mining and resources sector. The sector itself says 33,000 jobs are at risk as a result of the multi-employer bargaining changes, in addition to new taxing proposals that are proposed by the government. We know, the industry tells us, that this will imperil $77 billion worth of projects. 140 projects subject to pre-final investment decisions will now be at risk as a result of new taxes and these industrial relations reform. Labor has betrayed West Australian voters. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. It's pretty tough to sit through the faux concern this question time around Labor's policies on energy and particularly our policies on power prices when we've just sat through a decade where we had 22 failed attempts to deliver an energy policy in this country. Now, those failed attempts weren't just a catastrophic failure of policy aptitude. They left businesses, they left many in our community without the, the certainty they needed to be able to make investment decisions, to be able to make decisions on behalf of their businesses, to drive investment and growth. And that lack of policy certainty has left us behind on an international scale when it comes to Australian businesses and our approach and responses to climate change. For a decade, we saw the other side argue about whether climate change existed, not doing the hard and detailed policy work required to deliver an energy policy that would deliver certainty to Australian businesses. And that's what they now have under an Albanese Labor government. Already we legislated 43 per cent by 2030, net zero by 2050, policies enshrined by law to give that certainty to our business community to drive investment in renewable energy and technology. And that's backed up by our Powering Australia policy, which is designed to put more energy into the grid, renewable energy, which is our cheapest form of energy, which will put pressure on energy prices. So I would argue that the concern expressed in question time today was faux concern if you were really concerned about getting the policy levers in place to make a meaningful difference on energy prices and indeed on climate change, you would have spent the last decade designing an energy policy that you could deliver. Now that's not to say the impact of energy prices at the moment in the cost of living challenges before us isn't very real and isn't very serious. Of course it is, and that's something that our government is looking at and work is underway, as Minister Gallagher has said in question time today. And that's in addition to the other measures we're taking to address the cost of living crisis, measures like making access to early learning and education more affordable for over one million families, a piece of legislation being worked through the Senate today. Expand, extending pay, uh, pay parental leave by six months to 2026, delivering cheaper medicines and more affordable housing. And yes, as was discussed today, 
getting wages moving again. Now, unlike the other side, where keeping wages low was a deliberate feature of the economic architecture, we are unashamedly keen to put to get wages moving again. We've supported an increase to the minimum wage. We've supported a wage rise for aged care workers. But there is more work to do to fix the brokening, broken bargaining system that we are currently dealing with in Australia. And that's what the legislation that I hope we will be debating in this chamber soon will seek to deal with. Addressing wages for workers like our early childhood workers who do some of the most important work in our country, nation-building, life-changing work, and whose wages have failed to keep up with the value they are contributing to our community. We need to fix the broken bargaining system so we can support workers like our early childhood workers and indeed many low-paid workers across our economy who are being left behind by our current industrial relations system. So I welcome a debate on that and I welcome the debate which will happen in this chamber in the next few weeks. Deputy President, uh, the other Senator Smith mentioned that today is indeed the six-month anniversary of the Albanese Labor government and it's an anniversary uh, which I think is worth celebrating. Already our government has taken significant action to fix the mess and the failures of the previous government over the past decade. Failures in aged care, failures in early learning, failures on wages fixing our overseas relationships. Overwhelmingly, what I hear most often as I travel around South Australia is that it finally feels like adults are in charge of the government and doing the work that they expect their government to be doing. That's what our government is about, not uh, feigning faux concern over policies you know, you actually had a decade to do something about it. If you really genuinely cared about getting wages moving, you wouldn't have made low wages a deliberate feature of the economic architecture. If you really cared about tackling energy prices and tackling climate change, you would have delivered an energy policy one time along those 22 attempts which actually worked and actually delivered for Australians. It's faux concern. We're doing real work. Senator Little. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, it's now clearer than ever that Labor is not committed to the resources sector, that is, those jobs for many locals in associated industries or FIFO workers. Mining companies are now warning that up to 33,000 jobs are at risk from a potential new mining tax 2.0 from Labor, as well as their multi-employer bargaining changes. Senator Watt rejected those numbers. So who are you listening to? Yes, your favourite unions? This would imperil projects valued of up to $77 billion, spreading investment uncertainty and contagion. Who would invest amid an environment of operating and investment uncertainty? The mining sector has identified 140 projects subject to pre-final investment decisions that would be at risk from new taxes and ill-thought-through industrial relations changes. Of those 140 projects, 46 of them are critical minerals projects, critical minerals which are supposed to be part of the renewal technology supply chain Labor keeps talking about. Mining companies themselves are saying these changes will slow down Australia's energy transformation and that we need more lithium for batteries, more copper for solar panels and more cobalt for electric vehicles, not more uncertainty and risk that will simply chase away investment from our shores at this crucial hour. On multi-employer bargaining, not to mention the risk with Labor's rushed industrial relations policy, which will only lead to more strike action and which will put mine developments at risk of cancellation or delay. The proposed workplace changes represent the most radical shake-up of Australia's industrial relations systems in decades. Such reform with so little consultation, except with the unions. Labor have made it clear they want to hand over all workplaces to the unions. Small, medium and large businesses opposed it. I've heard it myself. Industry-wide bargaining will be devastating for the mining sector and the broader Australian economy, leading to widespread strike action, including potential sympathy strikes by those unrelated to a particular dispute, just like we saw in the 1970s. In my own state of South Australia, 
SA mining production is worth in the vicinity of $5.4 billion a year. What's the risk to that under this policy? The introduction of multi-employed bargaining is a brief breach of faith with all Australian businesses who took the Treasurer at his word when he said last year that industry-wide bargaining was not, that is, was not Labor's policy. I heard it, and so did the Australian public. This needlessly threatens the mining industry that earns over $413 billion in exports, employs over 277,000 Australians in high-paid jobs and contributes $43.2 billion in taxes in 2021. In the last 20 years, employment in mining has tripled and wages doubled, benefiting hundreds of thousands of Australians, especially in regional areas. In what is a recurring theme, Labor has no plan to support jobs in the economy. Labor is not supporting Australian families struggling with increasing cost of living. And clearly, Labor does not support the resources industry. While the coalition wholeheartedly supports mining and the jobs it creates, Labor is beholden to its own left wing and their allies in the Australian Greens who want to shut down the resources industry and the jobs of thousands of Australians, including those in regional and remote areas. Who are they listening to? Businesses actually delivering jobs for Australians in those areas? They don't like that you didn't consult with them on the common interest test or multi-employer bargaining or the removal of the ABCC. Your union masters like it, though. I'll put the question to the motion moved by Senator McGrath. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Mr Acting Deputy President, I rise today to take note of the questions asked by uh, my colleague Senator Cox to uh, the leader of the government in the House here, Senator Wong, in relation to the government's commitment on uh, climate action and why on earth Australia continues to fund fossil fuel subsidies. Of course, Senator Cox spoke eloquently about uh, the uh, COP27 negotiations, and we know, of course, that this last fortnight has been uh, a, tough, uh, a tough two weeks, not just for those negotiating uh, the final text at COP27, but a tough week for the planet. Because what we saw out of these negotiations is, while steps forward in some respects, terrible steps backwards in others, and of course a intransigent uh, attitude from those governments uh, who continue to want to fund uh, publicly uh, the uh, expansion and continued operation of fossil fuels. And the reality is, when we look at the science, it is crystal clear that we, can, we cannot continue to expand and open new fossil fuel projects if we are to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees. In fact, even if we want to keep temperatures below 2 degrees, there is no way we can continue to open uh, more uh, gas, gas, coal or oil projects, not just here in Australia but around the world. And Australia, of course, has a huge role to play in this. We remain the third largest export in the world of fossil fuels. Do you know what that means, Mr Acting Deputy President? That means we are the, we are the third largest exporter of pollution, dangerous climate change pollution in the world, and we have to take some responsibility for that, which is why Senator Cox asked the government today in question time, when will we stop funding? Uh, fossil fuel companies to continue to expand and grow? When will we end in this country the uh, unneeded, unnecessary, dangerous fossil fuel subsidies that litter our national government budget? And of course, we didn't get a response uh, from Senator Wong. Uh, but what we did hear uh, from um, both this government and others was a reluctance to do anything 
um, that is needed in relation to winding back those fossil fuel subsidies. There really also was a question, of course, uh, that goes to an important element of the discussions and negotiations uh, that were had at COP27, and this was in relation to the loss and damages commitments. This is an important step forward. That rich, wealthy countries, those who do have done a lot of the polluting already, help to pay for those less wealthy countries who are suffering now because climate, the climate crisis is here and is only going to get worse. And it is important that we have a proper commitment from the Australian government in relation to this. And I just want to make a point that while we were in Senate question time here in this place today, over in the other place, the leader of the opposition, the man who thinks that he should be prime minister, decided to attack the world's poorest people, to attack the, the poorest countries in, on the globe over this particular clause that was negotiated at COP27. That is, of course, Mr Dutton, the same bloke who laughed at the suggestion of water lapping at the doors of uh, the, our Pacific neighbours, laughing at the horrors that these countries now face because of the pollution that Australia continues to export and the climate crisis that our nation continues to drive worse and worse. The man who wants to be Prime Minister in this country, the leader of the Liberal Party, is laughing and now playing the dirtiest, lowest politics of all. He suggested that we shouldn't, Australia should not play a role in this because charity, quote, starts at home. I mean, is this really the attitude from today's Liberal Party that not only do they not believe in climate change, now they think that they can also rip off the world's poorest people? And I'd like to know, in this place today, whether the moderates in the Liberal Party, Senator Birmingham, for example, from my home state in South Australia, what do you say about the fact that the Leader of the Opposition thinks the world's poorest should just drown? I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There you go. <laughs> I shall now proceed to the placing of business. <laughs> Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? <laughs> Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator McAllister for today on account of ministerial business and Senator O'Neill from the 21 to 21st to the 24th of November 2022 on account of parliamentary business. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Bragg for the 21st and 22nd of November for personal reasons. Senator Hughes and Molan for the 21st to the 24th of November for personal reasons. And Senator Rustin for the 21st to the 24th of November for a parliamentary delegation. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. I now proceed to the postponement notification. Clark. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General business, notice of motion number 39, standing in the name of Senators Pogok, Barbara and Waters, from today to the first sitting day of 2023. General business, notice of motion number 79, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, for today to the 23rd of November 2022. And business of the Senate, notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young from today to the 28th of November 2022. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I note no senator has made a request. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Honourable Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on 
8 November 2022 of the Honourable Peter Keeston Reith AM, a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Flinders, Victoria, from 1982 to 2001. I call the minister. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of Peter Reith. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the Senate records its deep sorrow at the death on the 8th of November 2022 of the Honourable Peter Keeston Reith AM, former Minister for Defence, Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business, and Minister for Industrial Relations, and former Minister, Member for Flinders, places on record its gratitude of his service to the Parliament and the nation and tenders its profound sympathy to his family in their bereavement. I rise on behalf of the government to express our condolences following the passing of former minister, the Honourable Peter Keeston Reith AM, who passed away on the 8th of November 2022 at the age of 72. I do so as the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations in the Senate, recognising the portfolios held by Peter Reith for the majority of his ministerial career. As I begin, I wish to convey the government's condolences to Ms. Mr Reith's family and friends. I particularly acknowledge members of the Reith family who have travelled to be present for condolence motions in the House of Representatives and the Senate today. There's no doubt that Peter Reith was a con controversial figure in Australian politics, particularly for those on our side of the chamber. I do not say this, respectfully, this disrespectfully, but to recognise that for many people he was the personification of policies they opposed vociferously and tenaciously. But Peter Reith was equally as vociferous and tenacious in his promotion of those policies, particularly in, in industrial relations, and the extent to which some of them became entrenched in Australia's legislative architecture are a measure of, of his efforts. So too is the regard in which he is held amongst those on his own side of politics. Whilst his life and contribution will be remembered differently on different parts of the Australian political spectrum, Today, we all recognise his impact on our nation. Peter Reith was born in Melbourne and was educated at Brighton Grammar School and then at Monash University, from where he graduated with qualifications in economics and law. He worked as a solicitor in Cowes on Phillip Island and was then elected as a councillor and later president of the Shire of Phillip Island. Active in the Liberal Party from his teenage years, he gained federal pre-selection after defeating, amongst others, Richard Alston, who would go on to become a senator and cabinet minister alongside him in the Howard government. Peter Reith entered federal politics in 1982 after winning the seat of Flinders in a by-election to replace Sir Philip Lynch. Serving first under the leadership of Malcolm Fraser, he lost his seat the next year but was then re-elected to the House of Representatives in 1984 and further returned in 1987, 1990 93, 96 and 98. Mr Reith retired prior to the 2001 election. Some might say the timing of Peter Reith's election was unfortunate, given it co coincided with a sustained period of Labor government under P Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. But in many ways, the time Peter Reith served in opposition was an extensive apprenticeship and preparation for a sustained period in government. He was a loyal warrior under four Liberal leaders, Andrew Peacock, John Hewson, Alexander Downer and John Howard. He held office as Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party from 1990 to 1993, shoulder to shoulder with John Hewson. In addition, Mr Reith filled a number of shadow ministerial positions in portfolios including Housing, Sport, Attorney General, Treasury, Defence, Foreign Affairs and Industrial Relations. In these, particularly as the shadow treasurer responsible for selling tax reform, with a consumption tax as its centrepiece, he travelled the hard road in pursuit of his beliefs. Paul Keating once described Peter Reith as, and I quote, one of those inflatable clowns with sand in the bottom, and you knock them down and they bounce back up. I'm pretty sure that was a compliment. He also, Mr Reith also earned a reputation as an indefatigable head kicker and strong policy opponent, such as through his part in defeating the 1988 referendum proposals. The big defeat of the Keating government in March 1996 heralded a big change in Australian politics. Whatever you think, John Howard led a transformational government that would have a lasting impact on our nation. 
It was not a transformation that those of us on this side of the chamber agreed with necessarily. And Peter Reith stood alongside John Howard as a key lieutenant, charged with implementing some of the most contentious elements of the coalition's policy agenda. He held the positions of Minister for Industrial Relations and then Minister for Employment, Workplace Relations and Small Business from 1996 to 2001. In addition, he served as Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Public Service from 1996 to 1997 and Minister for Defence in 2001. Peter Reith's political legacy is undeniably extensive, and his pursuit of his vision for workplace relations reform was tireless. The reforms he put forward as the minister responsible for workplace relations made a significant impact on Australia in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And although the Albanese Labor government has a very different vision for getting there, reforming the workplace relations system to underpin productivity is an important policy goal. And it's fair to say that we will put as much energy into reforming our workplace relations system as Peter Reith did in his time. Peter Reith will always be remembered for the role that he played in a series of waterfront disputes in the late 1990s, one of the most significant periods in Australian workplace relations history. Under the Howard government, following the Keystone 1998 High Court decision to prevent deunionisation of the waterfront, Mr Reith implemented significant workplace changes. It's fair to say that this decision and this time was one of the most polarising periods of Australia's workplace relations history. There are images and headlines that are seared into the collective memory of the union movement and of businesses, and these are not going to be forgotten, even though it happened more than two decades ago. Outside of his ministerial responsibilities, Peter Reith campaigned for a republic prior to the unsuccessful 1999 referendum. Its defeat welcomed as he reflected a preference for a directly elected president as opposed to the model put to the Australian people. In the final year of his ministerial career, John Howard switched Peter Reith to the defence portfolio, which placed him as a key figure in the contentious children overboard affair during the 2001 election campaign, in which the then government falsely claimed that asylum seekers had thrown their children out of a leaky fishing boat, later the subject of a Senate Select Committee inquiry. This was a regrettable end to a parliamentary career that had spanned nearly two decades. Peter Reith was a well-respected colleague and mentor of many in this parliament and in the Liberal Party in particular across four decades. His allies regarded him as a person of integrity and trust. I pay tribute to his undoubted commitment to his community, his dedication to his portfolios and the fact that he was always true to his beliefs. Any chronicle of the Howard government will be incomplete without extensive acknowledgement of the contribution of Peter Reith. Today, we also acknowledge he has passed away at a relatively young age and in circumstances that robbed him and those around him of years and further contributions in his post-political life. I acknowledge that the fight against Alzheimer's disease is incredibly difficult for individuals, their families and their friends. The government again expresses our condolences following the passing of the Hon. Peter Keaston Reith AM and we again convey our sympathies to his family and those who knew him well. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, Peter Keaston Reith was one of the great Liberals of the modern era yeah. and indeed one of the great parliamentarians. Yeah. He came to this parliament committed as a reformer, a man of principle, a man driven by policy, a man of courage in his convictions and a man of ambition for what could be achieved from his time in this place. He dedicated his life to public service and to the pursuit of a better, stronger Australia. Born in Melbourne in 1950, Peter was educated at Brighton Grammar and had an early introduction to politics, joining the Sandringham branch of the Young Liberals at 15, then going on to study law and economics at Monash University. Peter practised as a solicitor in Melbourne and then in the small town of Cowes on Phillip Island. Peter's family had a history with Phillip Island that he too would build a lifelong connection to. At the age of 26, in 1976, Peter followed his brother in becoming a Shire councillor on Phillip Island and later becoming the Shire president in 1981. In those few short years alone, he had an impact having helped to establish the Independent School of New Haven College and in setting up a penguin research facility. Peter almost didn't fulfil his political destiny, as is the volatile nature of politics. He was both the victim 
and the beneficiary of the early calling elections. Bed had been successful in the by-election for the seat of Flinders, held late in 1982 following the retirement of Sir Philip Lynch. However, Peter wasn't even given the chance to be sworn into the House of Representatives before the early calling of an election in early 1983, just months after Peter's election. And there, in that 1983 election, a national swing against the Fraser government saw Peter lose the seat of Flinders without having sat in this place. However, in the first demonstration in public life of him rolling with the punches and ability to withstand setbacks, Peter, having endured three election campaigns to be the member for Flinders over a 27-month period, won the second of those three and regained the seat in the early election of 1984 and from there would continue to represent the people of Flinders for over 17 years. In his first speech, he reflected uh, the ups and downs of those election campaigns, indicating that it is indicative of the healthy political system we have in this country, and that his election to this place had been brought about not by the efforts of a few, by the efforts of very many people in Flinders. But demonstrating a sense of humour and a little cheek and even perhaps a little effrontery, he also went on in that speech to thank and to say, finally, I cannot overlook the contribution of the Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, whose brief foray into Flinders probably put the matter of Peter's successful election beyond doubt. He took the opportunity to invite Mr Hawke to the electorate of Flinders at the next earliest opportunity and at the very least during the next election campaign. But that small quip aside, I encourage anybody who can to take the time to read Peter's first speech. It is clear and even raw in its honesty, but foretelling of the approach he would bring to the issues he would later tackle as a reformer within this parliament. He spoke, for instance, of the outlook of Milton Friedman and of the interrelationship between economic and political freedoms. Peter highlighted that the marketplace is distorted by the inefficiencies of the demands of government. While acknowledging that there is a role for governments to play in the maintenance of minimum standards, he was also very clear that demands go hand in hand with the parallel demand that governments should not impose upon the individual's right to have an economic system where effort is rewarded. There was a consistency from that first speech that would carry all of the way through Peter's years in politics. Peter's analytical and sharp policy mind reflected the positions he would hold as shadow minister across a broad range of portfolio areas, from foreign affairs and defence to education and sport to industrial relations and as shadow treasurer and more. He also operated as a powerful and effective manager of opposition business. His key, most notable and memorable contribution during his time as shadow minister was undoubtedly the most ambitious policy manifesto ever presented by an Australian opposition to a federal election. That, of course, was the Fight Back Policy Manifesto presented in 1993. An article from the Sydney Morning Herald in 1992 recounts a moment when Peter, as then Shadow Treasurer, earned the spontaneous applause of his colleagues after defending the Coalition's Fight Back Policy on four corners following a leaking of Treasury papers claiming an analysis of the Coalition's policy. The article read, and I quote, his performance in the interview was shrewd and calmly aggressive. He conceded nothing of any significance, undermined the government's case, questioned the credibility of the Treasury and cast doubt on the relationship between Four Corners and the government. It was Peter Reid's best performance and one of which any politician would be proud. President, while Fight Back may have gone down in history as a failed election manifesto, Peter's loyalty and beliefs in his party's mantra did not waver. And indeed, many of the policies within Fight Back, in particular the central tax reform agenda contained within it, would later become reforms to Australia's policy regime that last to this very day 
and that have enhanced Australia's standing. The policy ambition shown at that time was nothing short of inspirational, at least to some. And indeed, can I note that it was at that time that I joined the Liberal Party, first campaigning for the party in that 1993 election. Peter served under Liberal leaders Malcolm Fraser, Andrew Peacock, John Hewson, Alexander Downer and John Howard. He demonstrated an ability to work with all, but always to put the policy and agenda of the nation first. Whilst that 1993 election defeat was a setback, Peter Reith typically bounced back. As is common for many who enter the public life of parliament, your opponents, the media and the Australian people can perceive politicians in a very different light to who they truly are, or indeed can see those perceptions change over time depending on the circumstances and sometimes the luck that you face. Senator Watt referenced the Paul Keating quote about Peter Reith, but by 1996 one article described Mr Reith having taken on the ministry and become a leading, fi a leading figure in the Howard government as, and I quote, no longer the political write-off of his critics or the butt of Mr Keating's bouncing clown jokes, the bald and bespeckled politician has emerged as a respected operator who is shrewd intelligent and tenacious. It was those attributes that saw under the Howard government Peter have his most recognisable achievements in government. As Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business, he became the architect of pivotal workplace reform which put the interests of employers and employees first. The 1998 waterfront dispute became one of the most significant moments in Australian industrial relations history. Prime Minister from that time, John Howard, reflected that, however contested the outcome of the 1998 waterfront dispute may have been, it was undeniable that world-ranking productivity replaced the ruinous behaviour which severely damaged some of the most productive businesses in Australia. Standing up to the extreme intimidation of the unions didn't come without its own risks for Peter, whose management of the controversy saw him even offer his resignation to John Howard at one point. But of course, Mr Howard declined. And despite the threats and the months of police protection, Peter Reith remained fearless. As John Howard has said following Peter Reith's death, describing him as a great all-rounder, he said that he had lost somebody that he admired, who gave enormously to the Liberal cause. Mr Howard acknowledged that Peter Reith did fight very hard, but most importantly, he was there to bring about change. Even having gone through tumultuous waters with workplace relations and waterfront reforms, Peter Reith, through the parliament, never lost sight of his time and responsibility to his local community. This was reflected by the age in early 2000 who spent a few days with Peter Reith following him around the Flinders electorate, meeting with local constituents, a young couple who had bought their new home, visiting a nursing home, a visit to the local RSL, and another to a group of people who wanted to acquire a submarine for a tourist attraction. While the article called the latter idea harebrained, Peter Reith nonetheless acted as the effective local MP, picked up the phone and tried to help as best he could. Peter Reith will be remembered for pivotal moments in our Australian political history, and rightfully he should be remembered for what he set out to achieve. He said in his first speech to the parliament that Australia is a lucky country. Let, let us not allow it to become a fool's paradise. We have the opportunity and resources to build up this nation, and I look forward optimistically to the Australia of the future and commit myself to working hard for its improvement. I would hope we can all agree, even if people disagree on some of the policies, that Peter Reith did just that, commit himself to working hard for the improvement of Australia, doing so as the member for Flinders, as a shadow minister, as a parliamentary manager and leader, as the minister for industrial relations, minister for workplace relations, 
Minister for Small Business and Minister for Defence. He was a tough political warrior, but always driven by the best of reasons and instincts. And as his family have indicated, behind the scenes a different character. His family remembering a man who never lost his temper, a man of warmth, of care and of countless dad jokes. On behalf of the opposition and the Senate, to Peter's loved ones, to his wife Kerry and four sons, Paul, Simon, David and Robert, we acknowledge the difficult few years you have faced, the challenges that you have encountered, the loss of time you wished you would have had with your husband and your dad. But we do extend our most sincere gratitude for his service to our nation, for the enormous contribution that he made, and our sincerest condolences to all of you. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Madam President. On behalf of the National Party, I rise to contribute to the motion on the passing of former Liberal Party member, parliamentarian and minister, a great Victorian, the Honourable Peter Reith AM. Elected to the seat of Flinders in 1982, he served our parliament for more than 17 years. He served under Liberal leaders Malcolm Fraser, Andrew Peacock, John Hewson, Alexander Downer and John Howard. His loyalty and dedication are well renowned within the coalition. And even more renowned was his wicked sense of humour, I'm told. Mr Reith was seen as the hard man of the Howard government, not only on industrial relations but also as leader of the other place. He was a Liberal MP over six parliamentary terms, the party's deputy leader from 1990 to 1994, industrial relations minister and defence minister, as others have recalled. His time as industrial relations minister delivered significant reforms to Australia's workplace culture and laws, creating more prosperity and productivity which set Australia up to deliver the longest period of sustained economic growth of any nation in recent memory. His reforms included changes to the structure of the Commonwealth Public Service, a significant reform package for small business and an innovative targeted program for the employment of Indigenous Australians. But he's best known for securing significant productivity reforms which followed the 1998 waterfront dispute where he fought alongside our primary producers, their state organisations, the Victorian Farmers Federation, uh, for a more productive and more prosperous export industry. And that is actually what rural and regional Australia, and indeed our nation, was able to benefit from, thanks to the work of Peter Reith, uh, and then you know, Agriculture Minister Peter McGorran, and a whole suite of other from the private sector and beyond, fighting the stranglehold that militant unions had on our wharves at that time, um, ensuring that we could never actually realise uh, our true potential as one of the great exporting agricultural nations that we have now become. He was an architect of pivotal workplace reforms which put the interests of employers and employees first. As John Howard said recently, However contested the outcome of the 1998 waterfront disputes may have been, it was undeniable that world-ranking productivity replaced ruinous behaviour, which severely damaged some of the most productive businesses in Australia. And the resulting progress, productivity and reforms achieved in the workplace because of Mr Reith's political fortitude and conviction are now at risk uh, with this current government's uh, approach to industrial relations who want to return us to the days of industry-wide industrial chaos, dragging us back to the dark ages of union thuggery, corruption and strikes, where wharves are once again strangled, our export and imports damaged and hindered. And we, I hope, will remember Peter Reith's fortitude in taking on those unions and ensuring that our wharves and our economy more broadly became more productive and prosperous for all. Richard Alston said Peter's, and I quote, efforts in leading the reform of the waterfront mark him down as one of the best cabinet ministers of all time. Peter was fearless in pursuit of the reform objective despite having a 24-hour security guard. He never wavered. 
and public, throughout his public life, uh, he delivered a lot. Um, my own family was a beneficiary of his time uh, setting up New Haven College. Uh, both my eldest sons graduated from New Haven College. It's a great uh, opportunity down uh, in the Bass Coast that we had a choice of an independent Christian offering um, for families that's really super connected to the environment as well. Um, so it's quite a unique education. So thanks uh, to Mr Reith for that as well. At the time, uh, Reith was the Liberal Party's deputy leader, and over almost two decades of involvement in federal politics, he emerged as one of the most significant and toughest coalition government ministers since World War II. During the 1993 federal campaign, an onlooker in Broken Hill, Australia's toughest union town, um, and yes, in the regions, was astonished to see Peter Reith alone on a street corner extolling the virtues of Fight Back, the Liberal Party's uh, the coalition as the, you know, offering at that election free market policy credo. And according to Andrew Clark, and I quote, initially he was ignored, but eventually he was encircled by an increasingly angry and subtext typically bro uh, Broken Hill uh, town of burly miners and furious women denouncing his message. An imposingly big and snarling sort of man, according to Mr Clark of the AFR, Reith was undeterred and returned the Crown's hostility in kind, which eventually saw them disperse in disgust. Peter's political legacy is extensive and lasting, and anyone who's interested in understanding his contribution more, in more detail should head upstairs to our own parliamentary library and check out the Reith Papers, which is an extensive body of work detailing his love of policy across, uh, and reform across a whole raft um, of areas. His combined ideology with conviction, duty and diligence and a relentless pursuit of reform. Michael Kroger uh, said it best when he said he was a man of steel. While all ministers and backbenchers and others ran for cover and when things got hard, Peter never wavered. I want to conclude on a quote from Mr Reith himself, which I think sums up his achievements in public life and attributes of a you know, conviction politician. He said, you could say, well, the government took a beating. Well, every government has taken a beating in the past on waterfront reform. We took a bit more of a beating than usual, but then again, we're the only ones who ever got anything done either. I think there's a lesson for all of us in that. I wish on behalf of the National Party to extend my deepest sympathy to his wife Kerry and his four sons, Paul, Simon, David, Robert and their families, and the very many friends that uh, Mr Reith made whilst he had his time in this place. Vale, Peter Reith. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Cash. Thank you, President. And I too rise to support and speak to the condolence motion. Peter Keaston Reith can be best described as an old-style politician someone versed in the ways of negotiation when trying to achieve the right outcome for the nation, but also someone willing to meet fire with fire when needed. He was without a doubt a warrior and a stalwart of the Liberal Party. Peter was born in Melbourne on July 15, 1950, and later educated at Brighton Grammar School before he attended Monash University. He received a degree in law and economics and practised in Melbourne before opening his own practice on Port Phillip Island, where his family had a long and distinguished history in the local community. Peter and his brother Sandy were both elected to the Phillip Island Shire Council in 1976, and Peter became Shire President just five years later. As we have heard, Peter came into the parliament in 1982 and served for more than 17 years under Liberal leaders Malcolm Fraser, Andrew Peacock, John Houston, Alexander Downer and John Howard, before retiring from politics at the 2001 election. He was loyal to each leader as he was to his party, whether in government or in opposition. Peter's political legacy was forged during the Howard government where he had ministerial responsibilities for industrial and workplace relations, small business and defence. 
I am sure Peter would have enjoyed the irony of the fact that his passing came at a time when we are involved in a critical debate about the industrial relations policy of this nation. As the industrial relations minister after John Howard's 1996 election victory, Peter was tasked with drafting and implementing the Howard government's industrial relations policy. In January 1997, Peter and the Howard government successfully amended the Industrial Relations Act. The aim of that legislation was to foster individual choice in workplace bargaining. This was achieved by reducing the powers of unions to intervene. The legislation also reduced the powers of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission to arbitrate disputes and introduced individual statutory employment contracts. Collective bargaining was also restricted. Those reforms came into play during the 1998 waterfront dispute, in which Peter played a central and critical role. Out of that dispute, Peter was able to secure, importantly, significant productivity reforms and major improvements in work practices. While the exact levels of productivity gains have always been disputed, businesses involved have claimed that within a few years crane productivity doubled and productivity per hour of work more than quadrupled. After Peter's death, John Howard described the waterfront outcome like this, as Senator Mackenzie herself has already referred. However contested, the outcome of the 1998 waterfront dispute may have been, it was undeniable that world-ranking productivity replaced ruinous behaviour, which severely damaged some of the most productive businesses in Australia. People often forget that during this time, Peter had a 24-hour-a-day security guard and was under enormous pressure, but he never took a step back from the battle for reform. Following his passing, Peter's cabinet colleague Richard Alston said, his efforts in leading the reform of the waterfront made him one of the best cabinet ministers of all time. Alston said this, he was peerless in pursuit of the reform objective. He never wavered. I always considered him the most impressive contributor in the cabinet among his ministerial colleagues, quick, creative, consistent, thoughtful and well-informed. During his time as Industrial Relations Minister, Peter also introduced changes to the structure of the Commonwealth Public Service. He introduced reforms for small business and a program for the employment of Indigenous Australians. It's interesting to go back over Peter's first speech in The Other Place. He talked about a vision for a better Australia. He said, a vision of a better Australia, of course, needs the confidence that one can make a contribution to bring such visions to reality. To that extent, I am idealistic. I believe that if Australians work together and pursue common goals, we can achieve a better Australia for all Australians. I do not doubt that honourable members on both sides of this House share a vision of Australia without poverty, where all Australians can have shelter, are well fed and clothed, can receive a good education and can reach their full potential in a country whose sovereignty remains inviolate. It is obvious from the incredible service that Peter Reith provided to our great country over so many, many years that he always worked to live up to that vision. He saw Australia as a lucky country, but he also knew that we had to work hard to capitalise on that luck. Many of his colleagues, including former Prime Minister Howard, have remarked on Peter's sense of humour, describing it in various ways ranging from wicked to laid back. Former Prime Minister Howard said he had seen Peter about five weeks before his passing and that Peter had retained that sense of humour. It's a good reminder for all of us in this place that we can go about our duties with a positive attitude and a sense of humour. 
I too offer my heartfelt condolences to Peter's colleagues, his friends and family, especially his wife Kerry and his four sons, Paul, Simon, David and Robert. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. I too rise to lend my voice to the Chamber's condolences to the Honourable Peter Reef. Peter truly was a giant of the Liberal Party. He had an enormous intellect, and he was what every Liberal minister aspires to be, a true reformer. Last week's funeral was a fitting tribute to the life of a great man who left an indelible mark on our history. He embodied the values and the principles for which the Liberal Party stands. His greatest work, of course, was the reform of the industrial relations system in the late 1990s, and in particular on the waterfront, which has left Australia and Australians more prosperous and more productive. It certainly wasn't without struggle, though. The sheer audacity of this project, the foresight that went into it, the intellectual rigour, the personal effort and, indeed, personal and safety sacrifice, and the self-belief it was really quite an undertaking. So it's little wonder that for policymakers and politicians and really anyone engaged in civic debate, the extraordinary life of such an exceptional man warrants acknowledgement and reflection and indeed reverence. Peter was, I think, what so many of us hope we can be. There are lessons in his life for all of us. As a parliamentarian, he was respected and he was respectful. He was principled and steadfast. He was determined and he was effective. But he was also kind and he, he was encouraging. His staff tell the story that he never swore, never swore, and he never raised his voice. John Howard referred to Peter's team as always a functional office. That's high praise indeed in a place like this. As a professional, whether it was in politics or beyond, you could see in his face that he just loved whatever it was he was doing. It didn't matter whether it was a small business portfolio or defence or industrial relations. There was always a twinkle in his eye. And you could see that particularly when he became a commentator on Sky. And indeed, in his time overseas uh, at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, he enjoyed that even if his first task apparently was to suggest that it be dismantled, much to the fury of his co-board members. As a party man, Peter Reef was someone that we will all aspire to be. He was committed from day one, from university days right through to the very end. In fact, he had, uh, in 2017, while he was campaigning to be the party president in my home state of Victoria, was when he first had a stroke. He was a mentor, and he was a guiding hand and a great friend to so many of us that came after. Most importantly, though, he was quite clearly an extraordinarily extraordinary man outside of politics who was committed to his family first and foremost. His wife Kerry, <coughs> his four sons David, uh, Simon, Paul and Robert, and his 13 grandchildren who gave such a beautiful tribute to him at his funeral, who clearly loved him so much and who he clearly adored in return. If the measure of success in life is to love and be loved in return, Peter Reith was a very successful man. So farewell to our vanished but never vanquished friend, a man whose trumpet never sounded retreat. He was one of the very best among us. Thank you, Senator Hume. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Madam President. Like all in his Liberal family, I am very sad about the passing of Peter Keston Reith AM. Peter was one of the finest Liberals ever produced by the Victorian Division. He was an incredible warrior for Liberal values, a true reformer and he was courageous. As we have heard in this condolence motion, especially from Senator Cash, his successful IR reforms following the 1998 waterfront dispute are legendary. As a Liberal candidate and then as the member for Corangamite, Peter provided me 
with wise counsel from time to time, for which I was most grateful. He was practical, good-humoured and refreshingly blunt. Those traits will be very much missed. Elected to the seat of Flinders in 1982, Peter Reith served as, the member, as a member of the House of Representatives for more than 17 years. In his maiden speech, Peter described Flinders as one of the great places in Australia to live and enjoy. He kept his promise of representing the people of Flinders to the very best of his ability. He served under Liberal leaders Malcolm Fraser, Andrew Peacock, John Houston, Alexander Downer and John Howard. He was renowned as being loyal to each leader, as he was to his party, whether in government or opposition. As opposition leader Peter Dutton said in paying tribute to Peter Reith, Peter Reith's analytical and sharp policy mind was reflected in the positions he held as a shadow minister from industrial relations and education to foreign affairs and defence to education and sport and more besides. He was also a powerful and effective manager of opposition business. But as we've heard, his main achievements came under the Howard government where he had ministerial responsibilities for industrial and workplace relations, small business and defence. Peter's political legacy is extensive. He will be remembered most, however, for his fearlessness in the face of extreme union intimidation, especially by freeing up the waterfront to ensure Australia had a more productive, forward-looking economy. He was an architect of pivotal workplace reform, which put the interests of employers and employees first. As we've heard also in this condolence motion, Peter Reith's work in Fightback formed the basis of much reform that was to come in the years ahead. I was honoured to attend Peter Reith's funeral, to listen to the special memories and tributes of his family, a former staff member, one of his closest friends and former Prime Minister John Howard, who described Peter Reith as a great all-rounder. And Mr Howard said, I have lost somebody that I admired very much, who gave enormously to the Liberal cause. He, Peter Reith was in Parliament someone who brought about change. He was unrelenting when it came to change. In the montage of pictures of his life that we saw at the funeral, there were countless images of Peter with his beloved grandchildren. It was clear that he really loved his children and his grandchildren. Peter Reith died way too young from Alzheimer's disease. A stark reminder that life is short. Make it count. Peter Reith certainly never wasted a moment in making his life count. I join with my fellow senators and members in the other place in offering my heartfelt condolences to Peter Reith's colleagues, his friends, his broader Liberal family and to his own family, especially his wife, Kerry, and four sons, Paul, Simon, David and Robert. Vale Peter Reith. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. I also rise to add my voice on the significant life and legacy of the Honourable Peter Reith. Like his funeral in Melbourne, which brought together many distinguished Australians from all sides of politics, the tributes to Peter Reith in this place have reflected the high regard in which he was held. John Howard was correct to call Peter Reith a great all-rounder. This well-deserved title represented Peter Reith's many achievements as a minister in the Howard government as well as his prior service to the Liberal Party during years spent in the shadow of the Hawke and Keating governments. As we've heard, Peter Reith began his political career by winning the by-election for the seat of Flinders in December 1982. John Howard is said to have jokingly remarked Peter Reith that his victory in Flinders was the straw that broke the camel's back, leading to Bill Hayden being replaced by Bob Hawke. Peter Reith would lose his seat in the 1983 election but come back in the substantial swing towards the Liberals in 1984. He was the deputy leader from 
April 1990 to March 1993 and would campaign with John Hewson for a broad-based consumption tax, which, in a policy document known as Fightback, was the inception of the future GST. And it's this work with Fightback that made Peter Reith a household name amongst West Australian Liberals. West Australians endorsed the Fightback reform agenda like no other state. In 1993, at the general election, it was Western Australia against the odds that won the marginal seats of Stirling and Cowan. A great triumph for the West Australian Liberal Party on the back of the great work of Peter Reith and John Hewson. Of course, Peter Reith will perhaps be most widely remembered for his roles as Industrial Relations Minister, cleaning up Australia's waterfront and as Minister for Defence in strengthening Australia's borders. It's easy to forget what was actually achieved on the waterfront after April 1998. The Productivity Commission at the time had found container stevedoring charges were higher than overseas, shiploading and unloading were slower and services were less reliable. But Peter Reith's reforms had worked and by 2003 the Productivity Commission had reported net crane rate for terminals at Australia's five main container ports exceeded the 25 containers per hour target for the very first time. Peter Reith's passing is an opportunity to remember the life of a great and wide-ranging parliamentarian. A long time Peter Reith's staffer had reminded his peers that Peter Reith had often championed lesser known causes. One of those was a local constituent who had been sexually harassed while serving on the HMAS Swan. A government inquiry prosecuted then by Peter Reith in opposition led to changes to how women were accepted and treated in the Navy. And as we've heard, another was his low, adv low key advocacy for Indigenous employment conducted during a se series of trips throughout regional and rural Australia without the media in tow. His staff have often said that Peter Reith was someone who believed that there was no point in being in Parliament unless you were going to do something. Peter Reith sometimes held unique and surprising positions on various topics, like being a supporter of citizens-initiated referendums and direct elections for an Australian head of state. But Peter Reith always took a very principled position and campaigned against the Republic model in 1998-99, often copping criticism because he believed he did not believe it was the best form of governance for Australia. Of course, inside the Liberal Party, opponents found it difficult to pin on him a faction or a camp, which again I think is why Peter Reith was a great all-rounder someone who practised pragmatic and practical politics, but always delivering lasting, tangible results. After he retired from politics in 2001, he continued to be an active member of branch politics. And in 2010, Peter Reith shared the Liberal Review for the 2010 election and discussed the benefits of party plebiscites for pre-selection nearly a decade before they became a commonly accepted mechanism. Our party is a stronger party for the contribution of Peter Reith. And this afternoon I add the condolences of every West Australian Liberal to his family and to acknowledge his tremendous strength of character, his policy foresight and, as has been mentioned, his tenacity. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I, uh, sorry, Madam President, I rise to pay tribute to Peter Reith as a values-driven reformer and a great Victorian Liberal. And in doing so, I want to associate myself with the remarks of other senators, in particular my coalition Senate colleagues. Like many, uh, I was the beneficiary of Peter's wisdom, his advice, and his mentorship. And what I admired most uh, about Peter is that he did not review, view reform as a technocratic exercise or a process of bland consensus building, he believed it was an opportunity to put liberal values into action. For him, those liberal values were the dignity of individuals and the power of free markets, and he looked for every opportunity uh, to be bold in implementing them in government. Fight Back, of which he was the principal author and intellectual driver, is of course historically judged as a political failure because of the way in which it contributed to uh, the Liberal Party's loss in the unlosable 1993 election. 
but viewed with the benefit of time, it is undoubtedly and unquestionably a policy success. Uh, its agenda for the GST, uh, industrial relations, privatisation and tariff reduction were all ultimately implemented by the Howard government and largely remain intact today. In fact, the only undealt with element of fight back which remains to be considered by future parliaments is his view that we should introduce a more user pays uh, system in the public health system. I think it is very timely for us as Liberals to reflect on Peter's legacy now as we find ourselves in opposition. Peter is someone who used his time to reflect and think deeply about what we should do if and when we were returned to government ultimately in 1996. I think it's one of the key reasons why the Howard government was so effective when it finally returned to office. We should be very proud if we can use our time in opposition now as productively as Peter Reith did in the 1980s and 1990s. He also distinguished himself in that time in opposition, uh, leading the, uh, the campaign on behalf of the coalition against the then Labor government's ill-judged Ill and poorly thought-out 1988 referendum proposals to change the constitution. My thoughts today are with his wife, uh, his four sons, his many grandchildren, and particularly his brother Sandy and his sister Janet, who I am very proud to call friends. We have lost a great Victorian Liberal. Thank you, Senator Patterson. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify their assent to the motion. Thank you, Senators. The motion is carried. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Senator McKim, I, I did give the call and I saw you were ruffling through your papers. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Ring the bells. We have quorum. Senator Cox. I ask that uh, business of the Senate no notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. 
Is there any objection? There being no objection, Senator I, Cox. I move the motion and I seek leave to make a one-minute statement regarding this motion. Is leave granted? No, you actually you don't need leave. You can... right. just... oh, someone's... Yeah, I, just, I haven't heard. Someone's, someone has denied... I'm, I'm not, I don't have a whipping sheet, so just bear with me. Uh, it's been ejected too, so you don't have leave. Minister. One minute statement. Uh, this is leave granted? No, I bet any, any, senator, any senator can deny leave. That's why I'm looking around the chamber, that's all. That's, so I'm just, leave is granted. Uh, we do not support the disallowance of this instrument, which would undermine the contractual arrangements already entered into by the Commonwealth and Golden Beach Energy in good faith. The former government fixated on a gas-fired recovery, which has turned into a bin fire. The Albanese government is fast-tracking the uptake of renewables through its Powering Australia plan. What we won't do is push over projects that have made commercial decisions on the basis of committed, contracted government funding that has already been delivered, all for the sake of political point scoring. We, we look carefully at existing government programs through our audit of wasteful spending. The government has redirected more than $50 million in gas infrastructure spending from the previous government's accelerating priority gas infrastructure measure. Agreeing to this motion would undermine existing contractual arrangements, pose risks for the Commonwealth and create sovereign risk for investors. I put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells.
Order, order. Lock the doors, lock the doors. Those, uh, Senator, Senator Thorpe, I'm about to put the question. The question before the chamber is one moved by Senator Cox, a disallowance motion. Those for the question move to the right of the chair. Those against to the left. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator McKim. Teller for the no, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe, can I ask you to restrain yourself? Your, your own teller needs to concentrate. Senator Thorpe, please. Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe, there's plenty of opportunities to debate at other times. Senators, there being 13 ayes, 32 noes, it's passed in the negative. Honourable uh, Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe. Uh, item business of the Senate number two has been postponed. We now move to general business number 72, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Um, I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 72 relating to an order for the production of documents before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is the amendment changes the return date from the 21st of November to the 28th of November. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There be no objection. I call the senator. Okay, I move the motion as amended. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Is a division required? Yes. Ring the bells.
No, no, just hold. No, I, that's good. I'm not thank you. I'm not. No, the president's just come in. Lock, yeah. Lock the doors. Order. The question before the chair is the motion moved by Senator Hanson and an amended motion for the order for production of documents. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the aye Senator O'Sullivan, teller for the noes Senator Urquhart. Senators, there being 29 ayes and 30 noes, it's passed in the negative. We now move to general business number 73. But I'll wait a moment before I give the member the call. Oh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you. On behalf of Senator Dean Smith, I seek leave. To amend general business notice of motion number 73 relating to an order for the production of documents before asking that it be taken as a formal motion, the amendment changes the return date from 2nd of November to 1st of December. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. 
I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator uh, O'Sullivan. I move the motion as amended. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. I think the noes have it. Is division required? Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. Order. The motion before the chamber is item 73 as from, of Senator Smith, as moved by Senator O'Sullivan. Those for the question move to the right of the chair. Those against the left of the chair, I appoint tellers for the aye, Senator O'Sullivan. I appoint as teller for the no, Senator Urquhart.
Honourable Senators, there being 41 ayes and 18 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that formal business notice of motion number 74 and 75 be taken together as formal motions. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Uh, I move the motions. Is there, being, is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator O'Sullivan. the motion. Thank you. Motion's been moved. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Division required. Ring the bells. The bells will ring for one minute. <coughs> Lock the doors. The question before the chamber is item 74 to 75 from Senator Cash, as moved by Senator O'Sullivan. Those for the question move to the right of the chair, against to the left. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator O'Sullivan, and teller for the no, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there being 28 ayes and 29 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator O'Sullivan, are you seeking the call? Yes, I am. Uh, we're up to uh, we're up, we've moved to item 76. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 76 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There has not been the objection. Senator O'Sullivan. I'm, I'm moving the motion. Moving, moving the motion. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. 
Against, no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Division required. Division required. Four minutes has been requested. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question before the chair is general business item 76 of Senator Cash's as moved by Senator O'Sullivan. Those for the question move to the right of the chair, against to the left. I appoint Teller for the aye, Senator O'Sullivan. I, tell, uh, I appoint Teller for the noes, Senator Urquhart.
Honourable Senators, there have been 27 ayes and 29 noes. It's passed in the negative. I warn the senators that we have come to the last matter, which there may well be a division. And if, the, in, the, if in the event there is a division, there has been a request for a one-minute bills. We come to general business number 77, Senator O'Sullivan. Do you seek the call? Yes. <laughs> Just conferring over here. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, on behalf of Senator Dunnian, on behalf of Senator Cash, I seek leave to amend. Sorry, let me rephrase. On behalf of Senator Cash, I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion Number 77 relating to outstanding questions on notice before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, the member has moved. So it was that. Because there were two amendments circulated, so I just want to clarify that it's being circulated to the amendment of the 28th of November. Senator Hanson Young, are you opposing that it's formal? No, no, that's fine. I just. No confusion as to what the amendment is. No, thank, thank you. you. Just for, cl for clarity and for the benefit of the Hansard. Uh, the motion has been moved, so I'm going to put the. You move the motion. I put, put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. It's division required. Division is required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The, qu the question before the chamber is item 77, order for production of documents. A motion of Senator Cash is moved by Senator O'Sullivan. Those with the question passed to the right of the chair. Those against to the left of the chair. I appoint as teller for the aye, Senator O'Sullivan. I appoint as teller for the no, Senator Urquhart.
Honourable Senators, there being 39 ayes and 17 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. Honourable Senators, item 79 has been postponed. We now come to matters of public importance. Senator McKim has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I note the required number of senators are standing. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers into debate, today's debate. With the concurrence of the senator, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Cox. Thank you, Deputy Pre President. Um, well, here we have a government who wants to host a climate conference on one hand, but actively giving billions of, bro of dollars to projects that will wreck our climate on the other. In fact, you can't have it both ways. This government cannot attend COP27, claiming they're back, like the saviours that they think they are, whilst campaigning for donations from their fossil fuel mates and giving public money back to them. During my time at COP27 just two weeks ago, I heard about the impacts of climate change that we're already having, particularly of our Pacific Island neighbours who want to also co-host COP31 with the Australian government. I heard about the costs of, to, that local communities are facing now, the impacts on the culture and the traditional way of life. First Nations people are being displaced, leaving their ancestral homes because of climate change. Climate change is real and climate change is here. The climate science spells it out clearly. We must say no to new fossil fuels and no to public money being given to these fossil fuel projects for expansion or the opening of new ones. The Greens will continue to push the government further and faster to be more ambitious in their climate commitments. Now, Vanuatu's climate minister is asking the Australian government to do the same before they'll agree to co-host COP31 alongside them. It seems like a reasonable ask, would you not say, but we know that the government struggles when made to choose between their strong climate action commitment and lining the pockets of corporate donors in the fossil fuel industry. The $9.1 billion in the budget for gas and petrochemical plants in the Middle Arm Harbour was alongside the $42.7 billion in fossil fuel subsidies. Middle Arm, just like many other projects the government is throwing money at, is a dirty fossil fuel project that does not deserve public money. Middle Arm is estimated to increase the Northern Territory's emissions by 75% and increase industrial air pollution by 500 per cent. Middle Arm will just sit three kilometres away from Palmerston, where mo locals will have to breathe in the air toxins produced by this precinct. The project will destroy our climate, our environment, but also impact on the health of those living in this area. The Beedaloo and the Barossa gas projects will also be uh, used to power this gas and petrochemical hub at Middle Arm. Public money for Middle Arm feeding into the public money for Beedaloo and Barossa, and these projects all depend on each other. And just last week, we saw the Resources Minister jetting off to Japan and assuring foreign investors that their investment in Australia's fossil fuel industry is good and is a welcome investment. So thanks to her for doing that on our behalf. While the Australian government loves to give away money to billionaires, much of this investment in the fossil fuel projects comes from overseas investors such as Japan and South Korea. If only the government could commit to phasing out fossil fuels and putting the equivalent of that $40 billion into renewable energy and infrastructure, that we need to build a clean, green energy grid. The government has a very important decision to make, and we think it's an easy decision and indeed a decision that should be made the second they won the election. The Greens want to stand in solidarity with Vanuatu and all of our Pacific nations for that. For years, they have been sounding alarms and begging the Australian government to take climate action seriously and take the action that is necessary and required. The social licence for fossil fuels is disappearing and disappearing fast. 
This government can no longer justify their subsidies to their giant corporation mates whilst wanting our Pacific neighbours to support our bid to host a climate conference. Now, in COP27, I also heard not just from our Pacific neighbours but also those of the Torres Strait Islands, those that I've also spoken about in this chamber and the alarming, alarming rates that at our low-lying islands are disappearing. And we need to take that seriously. Our domestic policy that Minister Wong talked about today is just as important as supporting our neighbours in the Pacific. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, we will be voting against this motion, um, but I want to make clear why we will be doing that. The Minister for Climate Change and Energy has just returned from a very successful COP27 in Egypt, in which Australia was warmly welcomed back into the fold, into the international community as a climate change leader after nine very long years of neglect. We are delighted to join with our Pacific family in bidding to co-host COP31 in 2026. We want the Pacific to have a voice, and there is no better way than hosting this conference with them in our region for the Pacific to put their case before the world. We look forward to working closely and cooperatively with the Pacific to secure and deliver a COP that will actually look to a collective vision in this important environment. Minister Bowen met with the Vanuatu climate minister at COP. And that minister has described having an Australian government with a strong agenda as a breath of fresh air. The level of support that we have received from around the world has been really, really encouraging for this bid, including very strong support from the Pacific region. But we also acknowledge that nations have differing positions which are rightly debated at these international summits. The question that we have in front of us refers to the Middle Arms Sustainable Development Precinct. The government is supporting the development of the Middle Arms Sustainable Development Precinct together with regional logistics hubs along key transport links. This investment will enable the precinct to be globally competitive and sustainable with a focus on green hydrogen and critical minerals processing. This investment is not a subsidy for fossil, fossil fuel. So just to be clear, this investment is not a subsidy for fossil fuel. Rather, the funding will go towards infrastructure that will support users to export clean energy critical to meet our commitment to net zero. Not only green hydrogen, but also the manufacture and export of lithium batteries that are critical to global energy transition and decarbonisation. Demand is growing overseas for these clean energy sources, and this investment will help to position the Northern Territory and Northern Australia to diversify their economy and take advantage of new opportunities and provide significant economic benefits and sustainable jobs. Middle Arm is already recognised as a potential site for renewable energy, with companies like Sun Cable looking to establish renewable energy battery facilities at Middle Arm. Instead of funding any particular companies, what we are seeking to do here is invest in common use enabling infrastructure, like the Marine Works, which will give all potential users in the market an opportunity to grow and thrive including those who are able to process and export green hydrogen and energy transition components. There is some way to go until the construction commences, and as um, our friends would be well aware, the project is undergoing significant environmental assessments, both under the Northern Territory Environmental Protection Act and also under the Federal Environment Protection and Biodiversity and Conservation Act. These assessments will look clearly at the impact of the proposed construction. The Australian government will work with the Northern Territory government, with the industry, the local community and the relevant First Nation communities to develop a sustainable growth plan for Middle Arm. 
with a view to further announcements next year on the implementation of this equity investment. The Australian government believes investing in projects such as the Middle Arm Precinct are indeed an important way of setting up our economy and the Northern Territory for a sustainable future. We are committed to playing a constructive role as a climate change leader, and we also support economic and job opportunities where it makes sense to do so. And we do believe that this project has potential for both the economic development and the job opportunities for the Northern Territory, as well as helping us into a sustainable future. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, uh, this motion is a reflection of uh, the complete failure of the Greens to get anything right on energy and also uh, the complete embarrassment uh, that was uh, COP27 uh, for the Greens' political platform. Uh, quite clearly, uh, over the last couple of weeks, there's been no agreement uh, among the countries of the world uh, to uh, get rid of, phase down, whatever you want to call it, fossil fuels. Indeed, the, the, uh, the headline in The Guardian uh, online paper was the COP27 agreement fails to call for phase down of all fossil fuels. Uh, the Greens here now with this motion are trying to sneak in uh, to this chamber uh, a decision that wasn't taken even at the climate conference. So, of course, why should Australia uh, do something that other countries are not committed to do? And the reason that other countries are moving away from phasing down fossil fuels, the language in the COP agreement is, is more open to fossil fuel development than the one last year at Glasgow, the reason that's happening is the rest of the world has woken up that we need, <laughs> we need coal and gas and oil. Uh, to have a functioning modern economy, indeed, to, to, to feed ourselves. And I, I think one thing that must be stressed in this debate is that in a few months' time, indeed by the end of this year, uh, Australia will no longer produce uh, urea-based fertilisers. Uh, urea fertilisers are the most common used fertilisers in Australia. Uh, synthetic nitrogen fertiliser, of which urea is one, are the most common used in the world. In fact, uh, nitrogen-based fertilisers feed uh, around half the world's population uh, right now. Nitrogen-based fertilisers, synthetic nitrogen-based fertilisers, come from natural gas. If we didn't have natural gas, if we don't produce natural gas, we won't be able to feed half the world's population. That's how the world works. That's how the real facts work, and the rest of the world has found that out over the past year when Russian gas was denied uh, to European manufacturers. They've had huge issues with producing fertilisers to send fertiliser prices through the roof right across the world. We've sent food prices up, fed into uh, inflation, as we've seen right around the world, causing untold suffering, especially in poorer countries. But here in Australia, it is a travesty that we are not or no longer will produce urea fertilisers. We'll be reliant on the Middle East. We used to be reliant on China, but they banned the export of them a few years ago. Uh, we'll be reliant on the Middle East. Uh, for, to grow our food rather than taking care of it ourselves. Now, we, have, we have plenty of gas resources in this country. Uh, we are just denying uh, ourselves the use of them. We're not supporting them. Uh, uh, this, this new government has uh, scrapped uh, funding for the development and exploration of new gas basins in the Beetaloo uh, uh, and, uh, and the uh, Cooper basins. Uh, we need to let's get back to supporting our country and our people. And, and just like the rest of the world has worked out that you actually do need fossil fuels, not just to make things, Order. but also uh, to do the very simple things in life like feed oneself. Order, my right. The other thing that uh, this motion demonstrates is how, how wrong the Greens have been on energy over the past few years. I remember, uh, I'm old enough to remember a few years ago, uh, uh, Green senators would be in this place saying there's no market for coal, there's no future for it, no one's going to make any money out of it anymore. Uh, and that was their prediction. That was prediction there would be no business case uh, to invest uh, in fossil fuels. But now, of course, they have to. They've been wrong on that, and fantastically wrong. And now they're trying to use uh, the laws to ban people from investing in these projects, to stop them, even though there is a very strong economic case for Australia to invest in coal and oil and gas. You just have to look at our trade data, because people might not realise, but over the last 12 months, King Coal has re-emerged. King Coal has been re-coronated. It is the nation's biggest export once again. The uh, biggest export from Australia over the past 12 months is coal. It's overtaken iron ore in the last couple of months. For the last 12 months, we exported $130 billion worth of coal. It alone is about a quarter of our exports. 
So about one in every four dollars of exports from our nation, merchandise exports, I should say, comes from coal. Iron ore is about 120 billion. Very important. Gas, though, gas too is uh, sitting just shy of 80 billion dollars now. And together, coal and gas and oil account for 40 per cent of our nation's merchandise exports. Uh, a massive amount of wealth for our country and indicative of how much demand there is for our high quality fossil fuel production in Australia. In that environment, we should be increasing our production of those commodities because when the price of something goes up, when demand goes up, we should respond to that and help the world, especially overcome aggression from Russia, to help the free world provide for its own food and energy needs by increasing our fossil fuel production. This Greens motion would make us weaker and more dependent on dictatorial regimes who, who mean to do us harm. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. As mentioned earlier, COP27 came to a close overnight with really little achieved in terms of reducing emissions. Australia played a more positive role than we have previously, which some would argue would not be hard, but we still rank ninth last out of 65 countries on the Climate Change Performance Index. This is a long way from the climate leadership spoken of by the government. Uh, continuing to subsidise the fossil fuel industry will only make things worse. Giving money to the profitable industry responsible for global warming, given what we know about the, the state of, of the climate, makes no sense. And funding of the Middle Arm project is particularly bad. The government has committed $1.9 billion to fund, as we've, we've heard, uh, common use infrastructure, which we are assured will be sustainable. <coughs> Senator Grogan says that uh, this is not a fossil fuel subsidy, but in estimates we're told that it's up to the market to decide. And, uh, the NT government and private companies are openly talking about using it for fossil fuels such as gas. If this proposal looks like a petrochemical plant, uh, has the government ducking and weaving on whether it is a petrochemical plant and has the support of the gas industry, then it most definitely seems to be a petro petrochemical plant. Uh, at estimates last week, the week before, I asked the department what cost-benefit analysis has been done for this project. They weren't able to, to answer, so we still don't know um, how we can justify this $1.9 billion spend. I also asked uh, if they were aware that the, the site chosen for Middle Arm uh, according to modelling done by the CSIR and the IPCC, uh, will be underwater by 2100. They weren't aware of that either. So while it's great to hear about the environmental impact assessments that will be undertaken, we're, we're missing the whole point here around climate change. And I think Senator Canavan highlighted that uh, in his speech, talking about the need to continue to invest because it's profitable. With climate change, whether or not it's profitable is be beside the point. Is it morally right to continue doing what we're doing, given what we know about climate change? Not just given what we know, given what we're seeing, the flooding across the country, the, the droughts in the Horn of Africa. We, we've heard uh, people in, in Parliament argue against loss and damage for people who live in countries who have contributed next to nothing to this issue, who are pleading with us to show some leadership. Finally, we have a government who is saying the right things, who is saying we're going to become leaders on climate. We're not seeing that yet. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and hope that we, we continue to see them heading in the right direction. But $1.9 billion for a fossil fuel project is not heading in that, in that direction, in the direction that Australians want and that, is, that millions of Australians voted for. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, Vanuatu is calling out Australia on our nonsense. And uh, it's clearly said, well, Australia shouldn't 
host or co-host the next climate conference if we are giving public money to open up new coal, oil and gas projects. I completely agree with the Vanuatu climate minister on that. And I thought that this government had made a commitment that there wouldn't be any new public money for fossil fuel subsidies. But unfortunately, when the budget was handed down, we saw some tweaks, sure, but we saw about $40 billion of the last government's fossil fuel subsidies retained by this government who are so poor they can't put dental or mental health care um, into Medicare, they can't raise the rate of job seeker. They're too poor to do that, but they're not too poor to keep $40 billion of the last government's subsidies for the coal and gas industry. And then they have the audacity to add $1.9 billion for a new gas export terminal without the consent of First Nations owners, I, might, I hesitate and am desperately sad to see, $1.9 billion for an LNG export terminal and petrochemical hub. Now, we just heard from Labor that, oh, look, it might do some other things as well. Don't, don't look too hard. Well, I'm afraid it is directly a gas export terminal that will prop up gas uh, extraction from the Beetaloo Basin, that the $50 million public grant fund uh, which was proposed by the last government is also being retained by this government. So this is a gas export terminal that will essentially create a market for the Beetaloo uh, gas basin, which also lacks First Nations consent and which would be an absolute carbon bomb. So I'm afraid so much for no fossil fuel subsidies and so much for being too poor to fund decent things in this country, not too poor to give yet more handouts to the gas companies that conveniently make large donations to both political uh, parties. The other thing that made me laugh cry was the Labor Party saying that this was a uh, sustainable development precinct and not to worry because it's going to be assessed under the EPBC Act, our federal environment laws. Well, I am an environmental lawyer and I can tell you that there are no climate impacts considered under the EPBC Act because we do not yet have a climate trigger. So I'm afraid it gives me no comfort whatsoever that a gas export terminal will need tick off from our current EPBC laws, which were written by former Prime Minister John Howard because the climate impacts won't be considered. So I mean, honestly, you could not make this stuff up. We're at $42.7 billion now of public money over the Ford estimates over four years going to prop up the fossil fuel sector. $42.7 billion over four years. That is an absolute outrage from a government that said there wouldn't be any new public money for new coal, oil and gas, and from that same government who are crying poor when it comes to actually helping people with the cost of living, doing things like increasing the pathetically low rate of job seeker, which sees people kept below the poverty line. It doesn't add up, except when you look at the donations from the coal, oil and gas industry. And uh, of course, they only have to disclose that once a year on the 1st of February. So it's just a very cosy little stitch up here, and it's no wonder that Vanuatu's climate minister is calling Australia out and urging us to not have new fossil fuel subsidies if Australia wants to host the next climate conference. The Greens are firmly in agreement with that position. Those fossil fuel subsidies should have been dumped from the budget. There certainly should, have been, uh, should not have been $1.7 billion added for a new gas export terminal, and the Labor government need to start remembering that they'd one time made a commitment that not to have new fossil fuel subsidies, and they ought to stick to that commitment. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Great news. Vanuatu still exists. Experts told us it would now be underwater due to global warming and rising sea levels. Just like Al Gore forecast Mount Kilimanjaro would have no snow by 2016. How many islands has Vanuatu lost due to rising sea levels? None. Mount Kilimanjaro is still topped with icy white powder. Maybe that's why it's now called climate change instead of global warming. I thank the Australian Greens for this breaking news that Vanuatu's climate minister would only back Australia's bid to host the 2026 Conference of Parties COP, if Australia does not commit to any new coal or gas projects. With that headline, the solution is clear. Australia must immediately fund and build as many coal and gas projects as humanly possible. So there's no chance these parasites will, will be hosted here the expensive UN World Economic Forum talk fest for climate elites, the 2026 COP. What's the COP? The UN's conference of parties involves millionaires, billionaires and politicians bouncing around the world in fuel-guzzling private jets to luxurious locations. 
gorging themselves on prime beef while preaching to we lowly peasants to reduce our carbon dioxide footprint, stop flying, stop driving and stop eating red meat. If the 2026 COP was hosted in Australia, taxpayers would be forking out for the UN's globalist elite talk fest. We'd be paying for them to tell us to destroy our energy grid and commit economic suicide to appease the sun gods. If COP, the Conference of Parties, does not want to come to Australia, that's their loss. That is their loss. We'll keep our abundant protein-rich red meat, delicious range of seafood, cheap and reliable coal-fired power, huge gas reserves and efficient petrol and diesel cars. Let the UN's Conference of Parties, the World Economic Forum's Conference of Parties, eat their bugs in the dark while waiting for their electric vehicles to charge. We have one flag, we are one community, we are one nation. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The 22 the 2022 federal election saw a groundswell of support for candidates that support reducing Australia's emissions. Not only is the public support there for reducing emissions, it's also the necessary thing to do if we want to avoid further catastrophic climate change. So Australia hosting a conference of parties meeting, or COP, to work together globally to prevent a mass extinction should be a good thing. But hosting an international climate change conference is a not-so-cheap exercise in public relations if you're committed to opening up more coal and gas mines like this government is. You can't have climate action while opening up more coal and gas. They are literally incompatible. Vanuatu is absolutely correct to put conditions on their support for Australia's bid to host the COP. The government likes to talk about regaining our place on the international stage and how our partnerships with the Pacific are about respecting the Pacific family. Well, using island nations to greenwash Labor's fossil fuel agenda is a pretty atrocious way of showing respect to the Pacific. Pacific nations know this, and they aren't going to let it happen. They have proven themselves more than adept at lobbying richer and more powerful nations on climate policy, and they will continue to make decisions in the best interests of their people and their region. If Labor were serious about climate action, they would put a stop to all new coal and gas mines, stop using public money to subsidise the fossil fuel sector, and commit to phasing out fossil fuel use and exports. We need to transition to a clean energy future. Giving $1.9 billion to a new petrochemical and LNG facility undermines our interests in the Pacific, it undermines Australia's credibility and, quite frankly, it undermines our chances of keeping global temperatures to a survivable level. Thank you. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes are passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes, Senator Cadell's teller for the noes. Order. There being 13 ayes and 28 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Senators, we are moving on to the matter of public importance. So, for those who are not remaining in the chamber, please leave quietly or resume your seats quietly. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Dean Smith, which is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. People will recall the famous novel by Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. But if Charles Dickens was alive today, he would be compelled to write about a tale of two Labor parties. The first Labor Party is the Labor Party that acts in a certain way when it's desperate to get elected to government. The other tale of the Labor Party is how it chooses to act when it is elected to government. Earlier today, we talked about the great deceit that Labor has inflicted upon West Australian voters. Prior to the election, the Labor Party said that large-scale, wide-ranging 
backward-looking industrial relations reforms were not part of its plan. And today, six months after their election, as we begin the last parliamentary fortnight, the big ticket item that this Senate chamber will debate will be Labor's big plans for industrial relations reform. But nothing tells the story better about what Labor says and what Labor does on its way into government compared to what Labor says and does when it's in government than the issue of electricity prices. 97, just think about that, three less than 100, nine, seven, 97 occasions the Labor Party thought it would seek to camouflage its poor record on electricity prices in an effort to come to government. Jim Chalmers, Order. then opposition treasurer, Smith. Mr. Jim Chalmers, then Thank opposition you. treasurer, said in Perth on the 30th of April this year, we've got policies about getting power bills down. We've got policies for cheaper, more accessible health care, which is a big part of the story. We've got policies to make childcare cheap, to get real wages moving again. Policies to get electricity prices down, Mr Chalmers said. The Prime Minister himself said at the Powering Australian press conference on the 3rd of December in 2021, the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, then the shadow opposition leader, said it will see electricity prices fall from the current level by $275 for households by 2025. In his National Press Club address on the 18th of May this year, then opposition leader, now Labor Prime Minister, Mr Albany says, making Australia a renewable energy superpower is the fastest way to cut pollution and the most effective way to act on climate change. And then he says, but it is also the best way to cut power bills for families and businesses, saving families $275 a year. They are just a few examples of the 97 occasions when Labor in opposition said it would commit to bringing power prices down for Australian families by $275. That's what they said in opposition. And what has happened in government? What has happened in government? You can run, but you can't hide from the budget process. You can run, but you can't hide from the budget process. And in the government's own budget documents, at page 57, in the first budget document, it said this, Treasury has assumed that retail electricity prices will increase by an average of 20 per cent nationally in late 2022 contributing to higher forecast CPI in 2022-23. Giving forward wholesale contract prices for electricity remain elevated, retail electricity prices are expected to rise by a further 30 per cent in 2023-24. What Labor says in opposition trying to get to government is very, very different to what it does in government. And who are the people that pay the price for that? ordinary Australian families, small and medium-sized businesses. And just this morning, West Australians would have woken up to a news story about how West Australian charities are now having to do more to support Australian families, West Australian families, meet Order. the rising cost of Your living challenges. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, again, the question of cost of living. And let's Let's look at what the impact is for so many people right at the moment. At the inquiry into the most recent um, industrial relations bill, Peter Richards, a Simplot worker from Devonport, 42 years old, casual forklift driver. To his credit, he served in East Timor with the Army back in 1999-2000. And Peter went on to say that the cost of living has gone through the roof, everyday necessities, it's the difference between buying frozen vegetables or having fresh vegetables. 
I currently walk most places because the cost of fuel has gone through the roof. And I get a lift to and from work from my fellow workmates. Paul Jeffries, again talking about the cost of living and the pressures in, to be a, being a working person uh, in Australia at the moment, under the previous government's legislation. I work at CUB Carlton United Breweries here in Melbourne as a shift electrician. I've been there 30 years. He was told by a company by the name of Catalyst, who was operating as a recruitment arm of Programmed, that his wages and conditions, he had one choice. One, he got sacked, and secondly, he was told he had to take an agreement for a 65 per cent wage decrease if he wanted to work. And he said, when your wages and conditions are reduced by 65 per cent, your whole life changes, your world crumbles, you just fall apart. Just like that. He went on to say about the pressures that is on him and his workers and after almost, almost a year of fighting to get their wages and conditions back on keel, they eventually got there, with no help from the legislation. And he went on to say this can absolutely still happen to thousands of workers right across Australia. Heather McCarty, a primary school teacher, talking about the problems that she's had of 18 months of negotiations in, uh, in the existing multi-employer stream and not having the capacity to bring those, that uh, dispute to a head and the effects on her and her colleagues. We need the negotiations, she said, to process to hurry up. It's too slow. It's far too slow. We have no power. The legislation is a way to change things and make things better for employees. And of course, then we go to the academics. And these reports, the reports that have been uh, talked about multi-employer bargaining. And it really is a question about whether the race to the bottom, which has happened for the last 10 years, or we want to have a race to the top based on quality economic output. Because that's what happens when you start making the system work for working people, for fellow Australians in this country. Now, improving employment and wage distribution in the 2019 OECD report says multi-employer bargaining is critical. It's higher, higher employment, lower unemployment, a better integration of vulnerable groups and less wage inequality, addressing gender inequality. A 2020 OECD report found that multi-employer arrangements are necessary to negotiate targeted raises in female-dominated and low-paid sectors. And of course, macroeconomic performance in other countries such as Austria, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Japan. Multi-employer bargaining is an essential part of the macroeconomic policy. It gives the capacity for skills and training and investment. It's where people come together and work at how we can work results together. And they come together across industries. What a great idea. They can turn around and say, we as a group can actually invest in skills, training and capacity across our industry. And even more so, they also get smaller employers, medium-sized employers who come together, who may not have the resources to do it on their own. And we heard through the recent Senate inquiry where numerous examples were given from small employers and medium-sized employers about how it works for them, how it would work for them. But then, of course, you've got the vanguard of people like you know, Alan Joyce and his you know, material world, where he says, you know, 21 external companies, 17 owned subsidiaries are all okay. They can, they, that's okay. Wages go down. That's not multi-employer bargaining when I set up dodgy companies. Or then you have the Perla, where we got you know, the, great, the really the home goal. You know, when the Senator Birmingham says, those are the things that our government managed to achieve with strong economic growth in our last year in office, with unemployment down 50-year lows, creating the conditions for economic growth to help drive help to drive product, productive Order. wages your growth. Time has expired. Well, that is a lie. Resume your seat. Senator Rice. I rise to speak on this matter of public importance on the government's broken promise to bring cost of living relief in the budget. Energy bills are rising, rents are rising, the cost of food is rising. We are in a cost of living crisis. And it seems everything is rising except for income support payments. These are still way below the poverty line, with JobSeeker at just $48 a day. 
It is people on income support who are most impacted by the cost of living crisis, who need cost of living relief, who have been failed by this government in the budget. On $48 a day, how does the government expect people to pay the bills, to pay the rent, to feed themselves? The reality is people just can't, and they aren't. Last week I had the privilege of visiting St Mary's House of Welcome in Collingwood in Melbourne, a community hub where anyone is welcome to come for lunch, for a shower or to charge their phone. And what I saw is that the, fa the face of homelessness is changing. St Mary's is seeing more people than ever before, including young people and families. Many come to grab a meal to take home to their family because they simply cannot afford fresh fruit and vegetables anymore. I mean, the work that St Mary's does is incredible, but they rely on donations and they run on the smell of an oily rag. And with the cost of living rising, they are feeling the pressure from increased demand. And the reality is we should not be relying on organisations like St Mary's to do the heavy lifting and to be supporting our community. Inadequate, inadequate income support payments force people to live in poverty. But poverty is a political choice, and it's a choice that this government is making that made in the budget. We can blame the cost of living crisis all we want, but the government has the power, and they have made a choice. That what their choice needs to be is to acknowledge that as cost of living continues to rise, income support payments they need to rise too. We need a guaranteed livable income of at least $88 a day for all income support payments. We need to end mutual obligations which do nothing to help people find work. And we need to remove unfair restrictions on who can access payments to ensure that everybody has got enough to cover their basic needs. Only with a guaranteed adequate income will we really tackle the cost of living crisis for those who are feeling it the most. Will we see income equality so that places like St Mary's aren't expected to keep on picking up the pieces? Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Brockman. Madam Acting Deputy President, I too rise to uh, speak on this matter of public importance uh, from Senator Smith on the cost of living crisis facing so many Australians. This is a government that doesn't have a plan, and that's very, very clear. In fact, we've seen it revealed here in question time today, and I'll, I'll go back to that later. But we've seen a government with no plan. They, this government, incoming, knew that gas prices were on the rise. We've seen that long before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. We'd seen rising gas prices. And we knew that in the end that they would have a flow-on impact on businesses and households. And what's this government's immediate response to that crisis in gas prices, which is an eastern state's gas crisis, I will just point out. The West Australian uh, situation is very different. But what's the government's response? What does it put on the table as policy responses to the rising cost of gas impacting on the rising cost of living. Price controls, a policy that has failed every time it has been tried for over 2,000 years, price controls, increased regulation, a policy that again uh, has a very dubious chance of actually succeeding in pushing downward prices on gas. Uh, and what's the other one they floated? Taxation increase. Taxation increase is really going to help cost of living pressures on Australian families and Australian businesses. A tax increase. I mean, it almost beggars belief. But this is a government that came into office without a plan. And as I said, we've seen that today. Uh, in answering a question on inflation and wages today, the finance minister said, and I quote, no one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation. Now think about that for a second. No one is pretending that wages should be growing 
at the pace of inflation. She said that just today. Yet what did her Prime Minister say just a few short months ago, in fact in 2022, about wages and inflation? He said, and I quote, it's not bad luck, it's bad policy that wages aren't keeping up with inflation. Now, don't you see quite a contrary position in those two statements? The Prime Minister, it's not bad luck, it's bad policy that wages aren't keeping up with inflation. The Finance Minister, no one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation. This is a government that has no clue about how to handle the pressures of a modern economy. This is a government that has no clue on how to satisfy the demands of the union movement on the one hand and still maintain uh, downward pressure on prices, maintain a strong and growing economy that they inherited from the Liberal government. It is a government that promises much. They promised $275 decrease in power prices to every Australian family—$275. In their first budget, they delivered an increased outlook for energy prices going into the foreseeable future, an increased cost of energy into the foreseeable future. We've seen massive rises in the cost of fuel, which impacts on every Australian household. We've seen massive rises in the cost of rental accommodation. We've seen huge flow-on impacts to things like grocery prices. And every, every family knows that the, uh, the, the headline rate of inflation is not reflective of the real cost of living pressures that are facing every Australian family. And part of the reason why these cost of living pressures will keep going is because this is a government that is contradictory internally. It doesn't know how to handle this situation and it doesn't even understand how wages and inflation work. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Green. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to stand here today in the Senate and uh, contribute to this matter of public importance debate on the cost of living. And that's because as we head into the final sitting week of this year, the Albanese Labor government isn't slowing down on delivering our election commitments. Over the next fortnight, we will be implementing our $7.5 billion five-point cost of living plan. We will be delivering cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, more generous paid parental leave, more affordable housing, and we will get wages moving again. In just six short months, the Albanese Labor government has taken more action on the cost of living than the previous government did in almost a decade. Just in the chamber today, we are talking about cheaper childcare. This is just one of those steps that we are taking. These changes will be material impacts for around 96 per cent of families who use early childhood education. Labor's plan for cheaper childcare will make it more affordable for around 1.26 million Australian families. But it's not just cheaper childcare that we are delivering. Our cost of living plan won't just reduce those costs. It will also put Australians back on track for real pay rises. And that's because our secure jobs and better pay bill goes right to the heart of cost of living challenges Australians are facing right now. Australia's current workplace laws are not working to deliver meaningful wage increases, and no one forgets that under the previous government, under those opposite, it was a deliberate design feature to keep wages low. See, the hypocrisy for those opposite to come in here and talk about cost of living, while at the same time having a design feature to keep wages low is not lost on everyday Australians. And it, the hypocrisy continues when it comes to the discussion around electricity prices in this place. Because can I tell you, the former government had 22 energy policies, 22 energy policies over nine years and those incoherent, inconsistent, uncertain policies led to three changes in the Liberal leadership, possibly two in the National Party, uh, to direct results of disunity and energy on policy. They couldn't get their act together for 10 years, and now they want to come in here and lecture us. This is their record on 
electricity prices. Complete disunity on net zero. Vetoing renewable energy projects, which would have created jobs, which is the most affordable energy source in the market. Look, they promised to build a coal-fired power station in North Queensland, but of course that was just a press release. They never actually did that. They hid key information about electricity prices from the Australian public about the rises in electricity. This is not only a problem of the former government, it's followed them through to opposition, because we know that the opposition still has climate deniers in their ranks, politicians that come into this place with their graphs downloaded from some pokey part of the internet. Now their answer, uh, after having no solutions for a decade, seems to be to offer nuclear power as a solution. Well, last week in estimates, the CSIRO said only weeks ago that nuclear wasn't a competitive option and that it would take until the next decade to get up and running. This is the solution from those opposite, the most expensive form of power that will take us into the next decade to establish. We know that renewable energy is the cheapest form of power. That is why we are delivering our Powering Australia plan. And we know that this country needs certainty when it comes to energy uh, policies. That is why we are delivering our plan for Australians. What you will see from those opposite is hypocrisy when it comes to energy prices and cost of living. Now, I appreciate I'm about to be followed in this place by um, the Venn diagram of, um, <laughs> of conspiracy theorists about climate change and throw in anti-vax as well. But I just want to make this clear. When it comes to the uh, facts on order, energy Senator policy... Green, order, Senator Green. Uh, Senator Scar, on a point of order. Uh, my point of order is personal reflection. Uh, there were two personal reflections there on my good colleague, Senator, um, uh, well, it could be either Senator Roberts or Senator <laughs> Rennick, um, in relation to um, assertions of conspiracy theorists and, uh, and any vaxxer, and I think they should be withdrawn. If you don't know, really call it personal, can you? <laughs> Um, Senator Green, perhaps you could clarify that you aren't intending on making a reflection in your contribution, um, but I will draw you to the point of order from Senator Scar and ask that you take note of uh, the point that he made. I'm happy to paint the entire bench over there with the same brush, with the same brush when it comes order, to— Order, Senator Green. <laughs> Senator Scar, another point of order. Madam uh, Acting uh, Deputy President, I think uh, the advice and previous rulings are that a personal reflection, which is uh, done in group form on a collective basis, can perhaps be even more egregious, can be even more egregious than if it's just directed at a particular Senate, senator. And I can certainly remember the clerk providing advice um, with respect to uh, that sort of collective um, reference. Um. Um, Senator Green, you have 36 seconds left of your contribution, um, and I might just ask that you exercise a degree of caution in how uh, widely or narrowly you choose to make reflections on senators opposite. Um, I do note that you were um, choosing your words quite um, carefully, I thought, but just be very cautious of not uh, too broadly uh, using the brush that you were utilising at that point. Thank you, Senator Green. Well, thank you. And I do think it is important that the Senate understands I'm talking directly about the former government, the Liberal National Party, and their failure over a decade, over a decade, to develop any energy policy. And we know the reason that that occurred, because of their disunity, because of the beliefs in their own party about this about climate change and about delivering cheaper energy policy. So we will not stand here as many points of order as you want to call. We won't be lectured by those opposite about bringing down energy prices because they never did it over a decade. Order. Thank you, Senator Green. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you. 
The Albanese government's behaviour goes well beyond a broken election promise to give cost of living relief. The government is actively making inflation worse. The inflation rate is 8 per cent and will remain at 8 per cent into the future on the back of increases to energy prices. Electricity, gas, diesel and petrol are all inputs into every corner of our economy. Forcing energy price increases to appease the sky god of warming will force up input costs right across our economy and lead to more inflation. Weather-dependent solar and wind power will never provide baseload power. Doubling down on more solar and wind before the added cost of changing out every wind turbine and solar panels with new ones before we even get to 2050 will lead to more inflation. Taxpayers pay for these things twice, once in taxpayer subsidies to wind and solar and through higher inflation, energy inflation. Not only do we have a lack of wage rises, we have a lack of wages. Businesses are closing all over Australia as inflation wreaks havoc in the productive economy and energy costs drive manufacturing overseas. This government has no answers. We have just seen a childcare bill that gives handouts to millionaires but fails to create a single job. Failing to use government policy to create jobs while allowing 220,000 new migrants into Australia every year will create a pool of unemployed resulting in reduced market power for labour. That can only mean lower wages, even before losing 8 per cent a year off their pay packet through inflation. One Nation believe the way to break the inflation cycle is a comprehensive root and branch review of the taxation system to return bracket creep to wage earners while forcing big business, especially foreign multinationals, to pay their fair share. Queensland Labor government's health department still mandates COVID injections for health professionals. Injection mandates must be abolished now. Let anyone who wants to work, work. We are one community, we are one nation, and Labor is a threat to breadwinner jobs. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. And it's, uh, I'm very pleased to uh, rise about this, bill today, uh, this uh, motion today about uh, the Albanese government's inability to control the price of energy. Uh, it's not really surprising. Uh, that that has happened, and as we heard from the speech before, uh, it was basically made up more of invective and personal uh, insults than any actual detail. And we saw that type of behaviour as well in estimates, where I uh, got to question uh, Senator McAllister about how many transmission lines that we were going to need uh, in order to meet the 43 per cent reduction in uh, carbon dioxide by 2030. And of course, she actually had no idea. The numbers we were given were somewhere between 5,000 uh, kilometres and 28,000 kilometres. Now, there was an article uh, a year or two ago in the Australian Financial Review that uh, said that the cost of building, uh, what was it, 900 kilometres of a transmission line would cost $2.4 billion. That was back in 2020. So if you wanted to build 28,000 uh, kilometres of transmission lines, that would cost a cool little $75 billion back in uh, 2020 prices. So I suspect that's probably closer to $100 billion uh, just to build the transmission lines. So if you think energy prices have gone up a lot already, um, get ready, get set for them to go even higher, because that's what will happen under the Albanese government, who have absolutely no idea on the price of basically turning uh, the, the energy grid into being backed by 82 per cent of renewable energy. And I'm glad Senator Green referred to the CSIRO because I've spoken to the CSIRO many times uh, and they have actually said that there's 40 different models to get to net zero. Can you believe that? 40 different models. Now these people want you to believe that the science is settled, but there's 40 different models apparently to work out how to get to net zero. Now let me tell you something. If you've got to rely on a model to get to net zero, that's not science. That's indoctrination, intimidation and shoddy mathematical modelling. Okay? The only time the science is settled is when you've got an algorithm demonstrating cause and effect and quantifying that cause and effect. I, Einstein wasn't famous because he was a scientist. He was famous because of the algorithms he invented, E equals MC squared. It's called mathematics. It's called mathematics, and that's what matters. So let, let's go uh, back to the economy, however, and uh, another question I put to the CSIRO, uh, another question I put to the CSIRO was that the cost of recycling the battery, or actually I didn't actually ask this, uh, uh, Larry Marshall, the head of the CSIRO, actually volunteered this, the cost of recycling a battery is three times more than building it. 
is three times more than building it. And of course, this is the thing that the unicorn farmers don't want to talk about, is that it's not just the generation that you've got to build, it's the cost of building it, it's the generation, it's the transmission, it's the storage, it's all the extra security services. So that's more batteries on top of storage. You need more batteries to control frequency control. And then you want to recycle it. And then you re want to recycle it. Now, I'll tell you a simple solution if you want to recycle it. It's called photosynthesis. You were taught about it in grade eight science. Okay, very, very simple. And we know that carbon dioxide is recycled through the atmosphere every four years. Simple numbers. The weight of the atmosphere is 5.15 times 10 to the 15. Carbon dioxide makes 0.04 per cent of that atmosphere, which means the weight of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 2 by 10 to the power of 12. Carbon dioxide has a specific density of 1.53. So the weight of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 3 times 10 to the power of 12. Now we know, as per the IPC report 2007, that 800 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide is consumed via photosynthesis every year naturally in the environment. That's by 8 by 10 to the power of 11. So you take 3 by 10 to times the power of 12 divided by 8 by 10 to the power of 11 is 4, which means the carbon dioxide— no, 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 that's photosynthesis, champ. Photosynthesis. You taught about it in grade 8 science. And so let me tell you, we can cut the cost by basically going back and building more coal-powered fire stations Order. near my hometown at Cogan Creek. There's 400 Order. million tonnes Order, of freak— Order, Senator Rennick. Senator Scar is on his feet. Senator Scar. Uh, Order, acting, acting Deputy President, there is just a continuous, <laughs> continuous barrage of interjections from Senator Shoebridge. I'm having trouble uh, hearing my friend Senator Rennick, even though I'm this far away from Senator it's Shoebridge. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Scar. Uh, I was likewise struggling to hear um, above all of the cries across the chamber, but I would also um, remind all senators to direct their comments through the chair. That might enable us to be somewhat more orderly. Senator Shoebridge, are you wishing to the de debate the point of order? Um, and I'm sorry, it was his attack on Einstein that really, really, really <laughs> set me off. And, and, uh, and I apologise if that troubled me in the way it did. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Senator Rennick, you can continue your contribution. Uh, thank you, Acting De Deputy President. And let me, let me say the cheapest way and the best way to lower power prices will only be under a coalition government, and we will do that by adding some more turbines at Cogan Creek near my hometown of Chinchilla, which is 400 million tonnes of free coal owned by the state government. You've only got to uh, basically mine it, put it straight into the coal mine, it goes straight into the southern end connector, and you get free energy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, the time for the debate on the MPI has expired, so I will now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on pages four to nine of today's order of business. Senator Cadell. Acting Deputy Speaker, I take note of all documents listed uh, there between one and 109, between pages four and nine. I seek to continue my remarks. Seek leave to continue your remarks, indeed. Uh, Senator Scar. Uh, I rise to take note of government document number 11, which is the uh, annual report from the Australian Building and Construction Commissioner uh, for 2021 and 2022, but also the quarterly report for the period 1 April to 30 June 2022. Madam Acting Deputy President, I don't think that any objective stakeholder or citizen of this country who took the time to read the Australian Building and Construction Commission annual report of 2021 to 22 would identify this as an agency which should be abolished. To the contrary, to the contrary any reasonable-minded person who perused this annual report would come to the view that the ABCC is undertaking extremely important work which is in the best interests of Australia and the best interests of all Australians, including those in particular involved in the construction industry. You don't have to go too far into the annual report to make that assessment. Indeed, in the introductory section of the annual report, there's a performance snapshot with respect to the year in review for 2021 to 2022. And what does that tell us about the performance of the ABCC? Let me tell you. 4,355 inquiries received, 
203 presentations delivered, 99 per cent of calls answered within 60 seconds, 1,638 site visits conducted. And listen to these figures. Listen to these figures. 5278478 dollars paid to subcontractors following ABCC intervention. Over $5 million, Madam Acting Deputy President, paid to subcontractors due to ABCC intervention. 1,577 enterprise agreements assessed in an average assessment time of 2.4 weeks. 555 workplace relations management plans assessed, 225 code audits finalised, $2,569,852 worth of wages and entitlements recovered for, for over 4,000 employees, 161 wage audits finalised. Does this sound like an agency which no, should be abolished, need it, need or does this sound like an agency which is in fact doing its job? and should be supported. Here, here. Increase. Addressing non-compliance, 171 investigations finalised, 164 new investigations commenced. Mm. So obviously there's still a problem, isn't there? Yep. Obviously there's still a problem. The pipeline of investigations which need to be continued Happy continues. Right. 22 proceedings finalised, but 23 new proceedings commenced. Again, again, there's a pipeline of issues which the ABCC needs to address. And then in terms of penalties, in terms of penalties, $3,087,438 of penalties imposed. Over $3 million of penalties imposed. And the success rate, the success rate of the ABCC, and we've heard from some of those opposite who tell us the ABCC is pursuing matters which are trivial, inconsequential, etc. Well, what actually happens? What happened during the last financial year, ended 30 June 2022, when the ABCC actually had its proceedings finalised? 100 per cent success rate. 100 per cent success rate. 100 per cent. Not 95, not 90, not 85. 100 per cent success rate. And that builds on. That builds on the success of the ABCC since 2 December 2016, where $13.5 million paid to subcontractors, 110 proceedings finalised with a 92 per cent success rate since 2 December 2016, $728,000 in compensation paid to victims of unlawful conduct, over $17 million of penalties imposed as a direct result of actions taken by the ABCC, over $17 million. Does that sound like an agency which should be abolished? Nope. Or does it sound like an agency which should, is doing its job and should actually be supported? Hence, it is tragic, it is tragic then, to go to the message from the commissioner of the ABCC. And he describes in the first paragraph how the ABCC is in transition, in transition. And let me quote, we are in a state of transition to abolition, end quote. A state of transition to abolition. The industrial relations bill, the government's industrial relations bill will come to this place shortly, and I'll continue my re remarks. I seek leave to continue my remarks in relation to this annual report. Thank you, Senator Scar. Were there any other senators wishing to take note of documents? If not, I will move to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I table documents relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Wine Tourism and Cellar Door Grant Program. Thank you, Minister. Any senators wishing to take note of that statement? No. In that case, I move to committee memberships. The president has received a letter nominating senators to be members of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that Senators Hanson and Roberts be appointed as participating members of the Select Committee on the Cost of Living and the Select Committee on Work and Care. The question is that the motion moved by the Minister Senator Brown be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those, 
All those with that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, having dealt with committee memberships, I'll move to messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence, Emergency Response Fund Amendment, Disaster Ready Fund Bill 2022 and Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment, Workforce Incentive Bill 2022. I call the Minister. Proceed without formalities may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against, aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Emergency Response Fund Amendment, Disaster Ready Fund Bill 2022, Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment, Workforce Incentive Bill 2022. I call the minister. I table revise explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate now be now adjourned. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022 and Privacy Legislation Amendment Enforcement and Other Measures Bill 2022. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be, be now read a first time. Uh, those in favour say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022, Privacy Legislation Amendment Enforcement and Other Measures Bill 2022. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022 and move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. It's in accordance with Standing Order 115.3, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to the 22nd of November 2022. Minister. I move that the bills be listed as a separate orders of the, of the day. The question is that they be listed as separate orders of the day. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding seven, a further seven bills for concurrence as listed at item 17 of today's order of business. Minister. I move that these bills, bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. Those, those in favour say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Anti-discrimination and human rights legislation amendment respect at work bill 2022, atomic energy amendment mine rehabilitation and closure bill 2022, Australian Crime Commission amendment special operations and special investigations bill 2022, defence home ownership assistance scheme amendment bill 2022, education legislation amendment 2022 measures number one bill 2022, high speed rail authority bill 2022. Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Budget Measures Bill 2022. Minister. 
I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the anti-discrimination and human rights legislation amendment respect at work bill 2022 and amendment to the explanatory memorandum relating to High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022, and I move that these bills now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. Those in favour say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the Customs Amendment India-Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement Implementation Bill 2022 and four related bills for concurrence. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Customs Amendment India Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement Implementation Bill 2022, Customs Tariff Amendment India Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement Implementation Bill 2022, Customs Amendment Australia United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement Implementation Bill 2022, Customs Tariff Amendment Australia United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement Implementation Bill 2022, and Treasury Laws Amendment, Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement Implementation Bill 2022. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now the adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Those in favour say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Ms Cheney to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 12 laws, details of which will be incorporated into Hansard. Okay. Clerk. Business of the Senate Order of the Day No. 1 relating to a report from the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, pursuant to order at the request of the Chair of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Le at Legislation Committee, Senator Green, I present a report of the committee on its consideration of time critical legislation. Thank you. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, Family Assistance Legislation Amendment, Cheaper Childcare Bill 2022, Resumption in Committee of the Whole. Childcare Bill 2022 and the amendment moved by Senator Roberts. The question is that part two of Schedule 4 stand as printed. Senator Hanson. Um, oh, sorry. Minister, just, I, I will come straight back to you, Senator Hanson. Thanks, thanks Chair. And I, I was just going to provide um, some uh, advice to the Chamber, just so they're aware. So tonight's the first Monday under the new routine of business that there are no divisions after 6.30 until adjournment. I want to take this opportunity to remind senators that in lieu of calling a division, uh, they are able to record their voting position in Hansard by way of a request to the chair. Um, this approach would facilitate smooth running of the chamber during this time and ensure that we're able to continue consideration of the legislative program as well. 
Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, the debate was actually um, interrupted because it ran out of time, so therefore I'd like to continue with some questions with regard to this bill to the minister. Prior to uh, the last question I asked the minister with, was regards to um, what benefits is given to, to which people with regards to being able to pay cash. And the minister okay. responded by saying that Aboriginals in certain remote areas could actually um, pay cash. Where, and then I referred to the fact is, well, what about white Australians? The minister's response back to me was, well, I've gone on my racist rant again. What I'd like to ask the minister then, if it is, is if it is racism, please tell me how do you define every other Australian who is not Aboriginal? Don't you believe that your policy in this bill, which clearly defines that Aboriginal people can pay by cash in remote areas where other Australians can't, don't you believe that your bill is racist when it's clearly based on race and not on an individual needs basis? So who is the racist here, Minister? Please answer my question. Minister. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and that's uh, not what I said, actually, Senator Hanson. But um, what we've said is that there is, uh, it is feasible that some people will still be able to pay cash in certain circumstances. Uh, that would obviously be determined through the department. Uh, I gave some examples of what that would be, uh, whether it be remote Indigenous communities, whether it be some uh, remote geographic areas, whether it be someone who was a domestic violence victim. So there are some examples that I gave. Obviously, um, how that would be determined would go through a departmental process. Senator Hanson. In the bill, you define also pe you know, people of Aboriginality who can Aborigines who can actually um, access this childcare um, services. Um, I know it came up earlier about the definition of an Aboriginal. Now, self-determination accepted by the elders or the fact is that you were born Aboriginal. Can you state that are you happy with these definitions? Minister. Thanks, Chair. And I've already provided an answer to this uh, question, Senator Hanson. Uh, the definition of an ab eligible Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child is in, uh, in the bill is based on the definition in the Australian Indig Education Regulation that has been in place since 2014. Senator Hanson. Um, I have grave concern about this because if you look at the census of people claiming Aboriginality, that they are Aboriginals, in the last census it was around about 850,000 people. The one prior to that was about 670,000. There has been an increase over five years of 23 to 24 per cent of people claiming to be of Aboriginal descent, whereas the rest of the population increased by 8 per cent, and that included migrants into the country. Could it be possible that a lot of people are jumping on the bandwagon bandwagon claiming to be Aboriginals when they are not and claiming benefits from the taxpayer that they are not clearly entitled to. Senator Hanson. It shows me you can't even answer that question because you don't know how to answer it. Uh, I need to call you, Minister, before you jump to your feet, Senator Hanson. Thank you. If we have a discrepancy in, in this nation and a division because people are coming from other countries, islanders who are claiming Aboriginality and getting benefits in this nation purely for the fact is, although they may, this definition that we have, what defines an Aboriginal self-identification, do you believe that it is good enough for taxpayer-funded services that the people of Australia, hard-working Australians, have to pay for? Minister. Uh, I've got no idea the point you're trying to make, Senator Hanson, but um, I think 
the aspersions you're trying to cast are outrageous. Um, they don't belong uh, in this chamber at all. Uh, if you've got a serious contribution to make, uh, I'm happy to stay here and answer questions, uh, but I'm not going to put up with nonsense. Senator Faruqi. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I just want to get up also and say that Senator Hansen is spreading pretty baseless conspiracy theories, and it's absolutely vile. And could I please request that the question be put? Senator Verke, are you moving that be the case? The question is that the question be put. Those in that opinion say aye. Senator Faruqi is sorry, just to draw your attention to the question before the chair. Senator Faruqi moves that the question be put. Those in that in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes uh, have it. Um, but do you want your dissent recorded or do you want to defer the division? Defer the, the vote till tomorrow. So it can't. Yeah, you it are actually, what to Senator Faruqi has actually said can't be put to the chamber for a vote on it because there's no voting. No, this is exact. Well, there is no voting on. Uh, there's voting by the voices, uh, but because you've asked for a division to be recorded, that means I can't put the question, and therefore it means that the debate continues. I think. Um, mm -hmm. No. Well, I, uh, Senator Faruqi. I'm just wondering, based on what the minister said earlier, we can still record, record our positions and our votes without having a division tonight. Well, you did put the question that the motion be put, Senator Faruqi, and that was carried on the voices, but I cannot implement that because it needs a vote in the chamber. So I'm seeking some advice from the clerks as to whether we are required to report progress or whether we can continue with the other question. Okay, I'm advised that we have to report progress. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Narcotic Drugs Licence Charges Amendment Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Hang on, just um, Yes. Uh, is quorum, apparently quorum is required. Narcotics. Okay, we're now moving on to social services. Where we for quorum. Um, social services. Thank you. So, Jonna, you're you've got the call. You know that next on social services. No, it's quorum.
16, 17. Eighteen. Quorum present. So we have now moved to the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Workforce Incentive Bill, and I call Senator Dunningham. Oh, you, your first, Clark. Sorry, we've changed our order of business, Clark. Government business order of the day, Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Workforce Incentive Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. S Senator Dunning. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I rise to make a contribution on the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Workforce Incentive Bill 2022 uh, and um, indicate the Coalition's position in relation to this bill, uh, and uh, that is that we will be supporting the bill, but we're also intending to move an amendment to increase uh, the fortnightly work bonus from $300 to $600 a fortnight from the 1st of January uh, 2024, which is of course when the government's temporary work bonus concession balance measure comes to an end. Uh, and so, uh, acting deputy president, um, in making those points, I'll state that at the outset the coalition will always pursue well-designed policy changes to ease the pressures faced in the labour market, be they uh, sh uh, worker shortages or inflationary pressures. And the pension um, that so many in our community rely on shouldn't financially punish older Australians who want to continue to work. In June of this year, 78,000 of the 2.6 million age pension recipients in this country had earnings from employment in the last fortnight. Uh, for the DSP, 52,400 recipients had earnings from a total of 765,000 recipients. For both payments, the majority—65,500 of the aged pensioners and 37,000 of DSP recipients had earnings of over $250 in a fortnight. 5,500 aged pensioners and 2,300 DSP recipients were on zero-rate payment. That is, they had their payment suspended. And in its most recent business conditions and sentiments release, the ABS reported that almost a third of employing businesses are having difficulty finding suitable staff, something that I think everyone who goes out into their community, talking with small business, talking with primary producers, talking with any employer, uh, would be well familiar with that fact. Uh, regional areas as well are suffering from staff shortages as a result of a depressed labour mobility between regions and, of course, also reduced migration, which is uh, in place uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, the, challenges finding, uh, the challenges finding employees post-COVID was highlighted by the National Farmers Federation in its submission to the Senate inquiry into this legislation. Before borders closed in February 2020, there were 337,800 people working in agriculture, forestry and fishing. Uh, in February of 2022, that figure had fallen to 301,800. So it's over 30,000, nearly 40,000 people less in that period of time. A recent survey by the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry showed 75 per cent of its members are reporting uh, to be struggling to find suitable staff to hire. Pensioners who choose to engage in some paid employment during their retirement typically have higher incomes and can support a higher standard of living than those who, of course, don't. They also gain significant non-financial benefits, including stronger social connections, something I think we all need to uh, consider as important, staying mentally active and keeping physically fit. In its submission to the Community Affairs uh, inquiry into Senator Smith's very good social services legislation amendment, enhancing pensioner and veteran workforce participation bill 2022, Anglicare noted uh, that uh, Anglicare noted that, as well as much-needed income, work can give people purpose. It can reduce social isolation and foster connection in the community. Pensioners who choose to work during their retirement make a valuable contribution to Australia's economy and to its community. Around 80,000 aged pensioners are supplementing their pension income with paid employment. The Coalition had a proven track record developing sound, sensible and practical policy to address the challenges faced by pensioners. The government has once again endorsed coalition policy by adopting schedules one and two from a government bill of the last parliament. Those schedules of that bill were introduced uh, by the former coalition government in February to incentivise recipients of the age pension 
of the disability support pension and certain veterans' entitlements to undertake or increase paid employment. Of course, the coalition's bill didn't progress uh, because of the prorogation of parliament and the election. Under the current policy settings, pensioners with employment income have their age pension cancelled if their total income exceeds the pension income test limit for more than 12 weeks. They also lose access to their pensioner concession card after 12 weeks. It's quite clear to anyone who examines these settings that they can act as a deterrent for pensioners and those receiving the equivalent Department of Veterans Affairs payments. Um, understandably, many pensioners want to work but do not want to lose their pension status and have their pensioner concession card cancelled for earning too much. They also do not want to complete a full application to have their pension or pensioner concession card reinstated. Both Schedule 1 and 2 of this bill, um, initiatives of the former coalition government, increase the flexibility for those people over the pension age who want to work by allowing pensioners to move easily between the pension and periods of work. Pensioners with employment income whose total income exceeds the income limit will have their age pension suspended for a period of up to two years rather than cancelled after 12 weeks. If at any time during the two-year period their income is at a level that they can return to the age pension, they will benefit from a, an abridged reapplication process. Acknowledging the importance of the pensioner concession card to pensioners, this bill extends the time a person can keep their pensioner concession card while their payments are suspended. The bill will increase and align the amount of time age pensioners and disability support pensioners are able to retain their concession card to two years. Relating to the work bonus, Schedule 3, both the coalition and stakeholder groups have advocated for an increase to the work bonus. State and Territory Chambers of Commerce, as well as the Council on the Ageing, the National Seniors Association, National Farmers Federation, the Benevolent Society and Housing Industry Association, amongst others, have voiced their support in providing pensioners with support to re-enter the workforce. On 26 June this year, just uh, weeks after the election, the Coalition announced a Dutton government would support older Australians who choose to work more by doubling the amount of work bonus from 300 to $600 a fortnight that could be earned without reducing pension payments. This coalition policy makes it further worthwhile for older Australians to pick up an extra shift or work extra hours and help businesses across Australia with labour shortages. Back then, the coalition called on uh, the Albanese government to implement the policy immediately to help relieve pressure on a very tight labour market. And of course, sadly, as we know, there was no response. In August, the, the coalition introduced legislation to double the amount pensioners can earn before their pension payments are impacted and also remove barriers for working pensioners deterred by the risk of losing their pension or pensioner concession card, or the requirement to complete a full application every time they become eligible for the pension. Indeed, again, there was no response forthcoming on the government when this legislation was introduced. It took the Jobs and Skills Summit for the government to belatedly uh, wander into this policy space. And indeed, while we welcome the government's long overdue announcement of an increase in the work bonus income, uh, we said this temporary measure was too little too late. The government has continued to drag its feet on incentivising pensioners to take up some employment without penalty. Pensioners could have had their work bonus already increased, but the coalition's amendment to increase work bonus payments to $600 a fortnight, which had been passed in the Senate, were voted down by the government in the House only a matter of weeks ago. The government's temporary alternative to provide a $4,000 increase to their work bonus concession balance was originally due to terminate on 30 June 2023. The government finally listened to the coalition and to stakeholders, importantly, and extended this increase to the end of 2023. However, with this extension of time, more can still be done. Increasing the amount pensioners can earn every fortnight will make a meaningful difference to household finances, and this increase should continue beyond 31 December 2023. That's why the Coalition is calling on the government to increase this work bonus from 300 to 600 per fortnight from 1 January 2024 to further incentivise eligible pensioners to undertake additional hours of paid employment. This increase would commence on 1 January 2024 when the government's temporary measure ends and would be ongoing subject to an annual review to ensure that these measures remain appropriate. With regard to the amendment I've already referred to, currently under subsection 1073AA of the Social Security Act, pensioners can earn income concessions of up to $300 over an instalment period of 14 days. 
The Coalition's amendment will enable eligible pensioners and relevant veteran entitlement recipients to earn up to $600 work bonus a fortnight and still receive the maximum pension payment. Pensioners will continue to accrue unused concession balance up to a maximum of $7,800, which can exempt future earnings from the pension income test. The amendments will encourage and support eligible pensioners wishing to re-enter the workforce or, their, or increase their work hours, enabling them to contribute to rel uh, relieving the skill and labour shortages Australia is so badly suffering. The added income received by working pensioners and veterans means they are better able to support themselves and their dependents, considering, on, uh, considering the economic climate of increasing inflation and the growing costs of living. In June, recognising the challenges businesses face in hiring and retaining staff, the Coalition announced that a Dutton government would support older Australians by, as I've already stated, doubling the amount, income pensioners, uh, amount of income pensioners and veteran service pensioners can earn without reducing pension payments. The amendment follows through on the policy that was announced and would take, as I have already said, effect from uh, the 1st of January 2024. It includes an annual review mechanism. It requires a ministerial review to be tabled in the parliament on the operation of the amendments. Um, it's an important point to make that the pension should not financially punish older Australians who want to continue to work. Um, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, in its pre-budget submission made last December, noted the following. And I quote, there is an army of older workers with skills uh, Australia needs who would still like to work but don't participate in the workforce as it reduces their pension. Uh, in its submission to the Senate inquiry into this bill, Aki also noted, uh, considering the deeply rooted labour market conditions, faltering product, uh, productivity rates and downgrades to domestic and international economic growth forecasts, these amendments will end long before the challenges facing businesses and the economy are solved. And I think they are important points to take note of uh, from an organisation that is uh, well connected with the business community, with employers and the pressures they are facing. So if they're saying that these uh, measures in place already are going to come to an end too soon, it is a good reason to look to the coalition's amendment. The amendment is sensible policy that will provide long-term certainty to both businesses and to pensioners, and it builds on other measures of the bill originally introduced and proudly introduced by the coalition before the last election. Again, the amendment will incentivise pensioners to remain engaged in the workplace, get those few extra shifts or extra hours without any penalty being applied, and provide businesses with an additional source of experienced staff and all of the other benefits that flow from uh, being able to remain connected to society, uh, to remain physically fit. Um, all of those are positives, and I would commend that amendment when we do get to it. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm also pleased to make a contribution in relation to the Social Services and Other Legislations Amendment Workforce Incentives Bill 2022. As has been highlighted, the Coalition Government introduced a similar bill with, in fact, a very similar name in February this year aimed at incentivising older pensioners and veterans to undertake or increase their paid employment activities. And I'm pleased to note that the government's bill adopts some of the measures proposed in our earlier bill. As a member of the Community Affairs Committee, I've had taken particular notice and interest in this piece of legislation. It does encourage eligible recipients of age pension, disability support pension, and carer payment and those receiving some veteran entitlements to engage in paid work. After the election, the coalition announced the Dutton government would support older Australians who choose to make more by, work more by doubling the amount of income eligible pensioners and veteran service pensioners can earn without reducing their pension payment. Essentially, pensioners would be able to increase the amount of money they'd earned fortnightly from $300 to $600 while still receiving their pension entitlement. Under the coalition's earlier legislation, if a pensioner's income from employment exceeded the income limit, their age pension would be suspended for up to two years rather than be cancelled after 12 weeks. And if during that two-year period the pensioner's income had dropped to a level where they could return to the age pension, they could reapply for that entitlement via, as Senator Dunham mentioned, an abridged process by updating their income and asset information with Services Australia. Our bill also allowed for working age pensioners, disability support pensioners and some veterans entitlement recipients and their pensioner partners 
to retain their pension concession card for up to two years after their payment ceased. My colleague, Senator Dean Smith, introduced the Private Senators' Bill in August to bring the Coalition's policy to fruition and help around 80,000 pensioners. Senator Smith also moved a successful amendment to the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment lifting the income limit for the Commonwealth Seniors' Health Card Bill in October, which incorporated many of these initiatives. However, the government later used its numbers to exclude that amendment. The bill also included extended qualification for pension concession cards and suspension of benefits and entitlements instead of cancellation as per the bill introduced by the former government on 10 February. So, In addition to sharing a similar name, much of the content within this bill is the same as the legislation introduced by the Coalition earlier this year. The first two schedules in this government bill replicate the measures in the Coalition's bill and in Senator Smith's, part of Sen Senator Smith's bill. These measures could have been enacted months ago, so I don't think we need to keep pensioners waiting any longer for these changes to come into effect. As it stands now, the bill we are debating today enables eligible pensioners and veterans to benefit to a maximum of a $7,800 increase to their work bonus concession balance, which can exempt future earnings from the pension income test. While the Coalition welcomes a measure that allows pensions to earn more, it is only temporary. Pensioners should receive support beyond the end of 2023. And to this end, it would be great to see the work bonus increase from 300 to 600 per fortnight that to be reviewed every 12 months rather than simply end in December 2023. Businesses in my home state of Tasmania and others across Australia are right now facing industry-wide workforce and skill shortages, which is impacting productivity and economic growth. We are also still recovering from the impact of COVID-19 on our economy and dealing with high inflationary pressure. Last year, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry called on the government to encourage more pensioners back into the workforce by letting them earn without losing their benefits. The organisation backed this up again in June this year, asking the Labor government to consider this important issue at the much-publicised Jobs and Skills Summit in September. Indeed, 36 immediate actions were identified at that event for a bigger, better trained and more productive workforce. How many have been implemented to date? Following the summit, the ACCI made a submission to the Community Affairs Com Committee's inquiry, highlighting that businesses are already working at full capacity and looking to secure more labour. The ACCI submission said, and I quote, there is now almost one job available for every person seeking work, with 470,900 job vacancies and 487,700 unemployed in August. And it went on to say, targeted and ongoing public effort has the capacity to increase workforce participation. With productivity growth over the past decade at 1.1 per cent per year, its slowest pace in 60 years, and the RSA downgrading GDP forecast to 3.25 per cent over 2022, 1.75 per cent over 2023 and 1.75 per cent over 2024, there is a need to ensure maximum participation. And yet we are still debating this topic today. Labor shortages are one of the top issues facing Australian businesses right now. Quite simply, if businesses don't have access to enough workers, they can't run. Let's help our businesses stay open. All sides of politics recognise this sticking point right now, and we have a good solution. And I commend the government for endorsing coalition policy by adopting schedules one and two from our earlier bill. However, the solution this bill provides will be very short term, not nearly long enough for the pensioners to supplement the income they are watching diminish as they pay more for essentials in today's climate, and not long enough for Australian businesses to reap the benefit of this experienced and willing workforce. We're not suggesting that work bonus increase becomes a permanent fixture with this within the legislation, but that's why an annual review would be excellent. That small change would make a world of difference. Thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Workforce Incentive Bill 2022. This bill makes small but meaningful improvements that will benefit aged pensioners and some veteran recipients. It will mean that people's payments will be suspended for two years but not cancelled if people's incomes mean that they can't receive the payment. It will enable people to keep their pensioner concession cards for up to two years after their payment ceases. That's a welcome measure and we support it. And finally, and most importantly, 
it makes changes to the work bo bonus to increase the amount that aged pensioners are able to earn if they are working before their pension gets cut. Now, I want to thank, to begin with, the Minister's Office for their close and constructive engagement on this piece of legislation. The Minister moved an amendment in the House of Representatives as a result of negotiations with the Greens and advocacy with organisations such as National Seniors to extend the time that this scheme will operate on until December next year. And that is a really concrete improvement in the, in the bill. And I also want to thank the opposition for their, their advocacy on this issue. They put forward a clear, concrete proposal that would help people on income support and we welcome to that. And I want to say to the opposition and to the government that we'd like to see some other proposals for people on JobSeeker to allow people on JobSeeker to be able to earn more as well. They are on lower incomes than people on pensions, and their effective, their effective tax rate, as a, which operates as a disincentive to work, is much, much higher. And finally, I'd like to thank National Seniors Australia for their close engagement and advocacy on this issue. And we recognise that they would like to see further changes to the age pension, and we look forward to continuing to work with them on how the system can be improved. But as we discuss the measures in this bill before us, I want to actually make the contrast between what else needs to occur, and that is the appallingly low rate of job seeker the desperate need for a guaranteed livable income, so that the benefits that are flowing through to age pensioners in this bill could also flow into other people on income support. And the same measures that could be taken to increase the amount that income support benefits i.e. age pensioners are able to receive that is included in this bill could be extended to other people on income support. I mean, mere days ago, we saw the collapse of Deliveroo which is leaving around 15,000 workers without their usual source of income, with no more than a few minutes' notice. And sadly, we know that many people working as delivery drivers will not be able to access income support because of the restrictions in place. And even for those who may be eligible, we know they'll likely face hours of paperwork and potentially weeks of waiting. And then, when they do receive the payment, it will be a vastly inadequate one vastly below the poverty line. I mean, imagine that you're a job seeker looking for permanent, reliable work that delivers you a decent income. You get a bit of work here and there, casual, unreliable, unpredictable work. You're certainly not going to go off job seeker in order to take this work, because although you might get enough work this week, who knows what will happen next week or next month? Or imagine you're this job seeker and you've got health issues that will enable you to work more some weeks, but not the rest. But of course, under our punitive system, you're not eligible for the disability support pension, even though you've got these health issues. Not that the DSP gives you all that much more than job seeker. I mean, imagine that this week you are able to work. Imagine this person is actually just like the aged pensioner somebody who is able to fill the labour shortage gaps that we are facing in this country. So imagine this week you're able to work. Your health is good this week. There's some extra hours of cleaning available at a local business. And you'd really like to take up this opportunity to pay a few bills, maybe to get the washing machine fixed, or pay off some of the loan that a friend generously lent to you six months ago so that you could repair your car. But it's not worth it. Unlike this bill, which is giving aged pensioners an $11,800 work bonus that pensioners are going to be able to earn before their payments start to be reduced, and again, we welcome that, we're supporting this bill, but unlike those pensioners, my job seekers that we're talking about, their payments start to be reduced and they only get a work credit of $1,000. So what that means is that as soon as they start getting a bit of extra work, then their payments get slashed. And in fact, they are facing an equivalent marginal tax rate of over 60 per cent in many instances. 
In fact, looking at modelling of that, it's, for some job seekers, depending on their particular circumstances, it's an equivalent tax, marginal tax rate of between 60 to 80 per cent. So not only are our job seekers who are capable of looking for of working something, working some more hours, working to, to top up their job seeker payment, not only are they able to having to scrimp by on job seeker and get by on charity and loans to survive, but they just can't get ahead. And they are certainly not being incentivised to take up extra work if it's available. So that's the first reason why I wanted to bring the issue of job seekers into this debate, because they, like age pensioners, are available to take up extra work opportunities as they are available and should also be available to this increase in, uh, in the amount they can earn before their payments are slashed. But the other reason that we are actually debating this, this issue today and debating increased income limits for age pensioners is because we know that actually living on the age pension can be a real struggle, particularly if you're an age pensioner that is renting a private rental um, house. And pensioners, you ask them, do they want to be able to earn extra money? And they say they sure do, because surviving on the pension is a struggle. And they say they need to be able to earn extra in order to survive. But of course, as well as this focus on pensioners, we also need to be focusing on the people on income support who are surviving on much, much less. Those people on job seeker, those people on youth allowance, those people on parenting allowance. I mean, job seekers are expected to exist on $48 a day when the Henderson poverty line is $88 a day. And we've, we know in the debate on this bill, we heard and in the, in the debate on this bill and in the committee um, hearings on this bill, we heard from the Australian Council of Trade Unions, who have publicly called for an increase in the job seeker rate. We have heard that from the Business Council of Australia, who acknowledged earlier in the pandemic that the rate needed to be raised. We have heard it from social services and community organisations around the country. And these two things go hand in hand. We need to increase the rate as well as allowing people to earn more. And most importantly, we've heard it time and time again directly from the people who have been forced to rely on inadequate payments. So I have been sharing stories in this place from people whose lives have been impacted by the failure to act on job seeker and other payments. And I want to thank them for their courage in sharing their stories. It's been a privilege to try and bring their voices into this place. And I also want to mention specifically that the rate of job seeker is an issue we've heard about from some senior members of this government. When legislation passed through Parliament after the COVID supplement ended with a minuscule increase to job seeker, multiple Labor ministers said that they thought the increase wasn't enough and that they would act. Well, now they're in government, but we have yet to see any action. I mean, the now Deputy Prime Minister in a speech said, the government is in control of the budget and the purse strings, and in order to change the budget, ultimately we need to, cha to change the budget, ultimately we need to change the government. This is a matter to which Labor is committed. In government, it is something we would certainly seek to act on. Now, the legislation before us today is a great step forward for age pensioners, but we are yet to see any action on a change in policy that would increase the rate of job seekers or allow them to own more, to earn more. All we got from the government, all we have got so far, is a commitment that was made in the national plan to end violence against women and children that they would commit to review the rate of job seeker before the budget and before, before budgets. So let me give them a hand with that review. The rate of job seeker is inadequate. And I asked about this very issue in estimates. It turns out that a review actually doesn't mean whether the rate's adequate. It turns out the review actually isn't a review. In fact, um, Senator Ayres um, answered my questions in estimates. It wasn't a review as a noun. It was to review as a verb. And all that meant was that there was an informal discussion between the head of the department and the minister. 
It doesn't, that review wasn't examining whether the rate was adequate or whether people were able to live on the payment or whether the rate's so low that it's putting people at risk of domestic violence, of food scarcity, of homelessness. No. The review is whether the government think that they can afford to increase the rate. But at the same time, the government tells us that the stage three tax cuts are the holy grail of pre-election commitments. They cannot be reviewed, considered or contemplated in any way, shape and or form, despite costing the budget bottom line $250 billion over the next decade. But no, we must not touch them. And in fact, it seems Labor ministers aren't even allowed to look at the stage three tax cuts out of the corner of their eye. Probably because if they did, the right-wing media would assemble like a school of piranhas desperately to draw blood on the premise of a broken promise. Well, we hope, I hope that the Labor Party is going to find the courage of its convictions, and in addition to moving on aged pensioners, to act on increasing the rate of job seeker. And we hope that, because it will make a crucial difference to the people who are forced to be living below the poverty line and not able to earn anything extra without having it absolutely slashed by the income limits. And in the meantime, we will keep calling for a raise to the rate of job seeker as often as we can. I will keep raising it in any bit of debate on any bit of legislation that is relevant, because we need it. People are desperately living in poverty. And we will keep calling, in fact, for a guaranteed livable income for anyone who needs it. Poverty is a political choice. It is a choice that the Liberal Party made for over a decade, except for that brief window when the COVID supplements lifted payments above the poverty line. And it's a choice that, sadly, the Labor government made in their last budget, leaving hundreds of thousands of people relying on payments that are below the poverty line. With regard to this legislation, in line with this, I foreshadow that we will have some substantive amendments during the Committee of the Whole debate. and They reflect the work that we're putting into developing a policy platform before the election. And I want to particularly thank the drafters for their incredible work on this. The Social Security Act is a large and complex piece of legislation, and I thank them, particularly given the tight timeframes and the small team that's available. We are putting these forward as substantive amendments because we want to make the point that, po that poverty is a political choice and that politicians in this place, in the way they vote, they are making choices that, that impact the lives of people across the country. The amendment items in the sheet that's been circulated in the chamber set out clear changes that we call for all parties in this place to support. And most important among them is raising the rate of income support to $88 a day. We know that the rate of job seeker and other payments is too low. We know that it needs to be increased. Here today is an opportunity to do that. We also have an amendment to abolish, to abolish mutual obligations. We've seen reporting about how these systems have failed to help the most vulnerable and instead have left people interacting with a baffling and, at times, cruel system. We can end it. And we have amendment to provide earlier access to the age pension, to, to help people who, in previous years, would have been able to access the age pension at 65, who now are no longer able to. And simply put, we think this could make a huge difference to thousands of older Australians who are eking out, surviving until they reach age pension age. And this is particularly true for First Nations peoples, who we know face a lower life expectancy. We have an amendment to lower the age for job seeker from 22 to 18, and that, in combination with removing mutual obligations, would make a huge difference to thousands of students around the country. Too many people are forced to study full time on payments that are inadequate, and this would change that. And finally, we have an amendment to extend the work bonus to other income support groups. If people can enable those on age pension to earn more before learning that losing their income support, then why can't we do it for people on JobSeeker or the DSP? That is a simple question that I want to put to everyone in this place. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the Workforce Incentive Bill. Uh, according to the Department of Social Services, only 3 per cent of pensioners receive income from employment. According to recent reports, 
employers are struggling to fill about 480,000 jobs. Pensioners represent an eminently qualified pool of workers that we could be better utilising. Traditionally, pensioners have been rightfully cautious about taking up work for fear of how it will impact their pensions. Understandably, not everyone go, wants to go to the hassle of liaising with Services Australia and, and risking their pension just to work a few hours here and there or to work a couple of weeks over the holidays. Removing the barriers standing in the way of getting pensioners to take up more hours or get back into the workforce is good public policy. I share the government's optimism that these changes to the work bonus will get seniors back into the workforce at a time where we desperately need them. The changes would give senior Australians more flexibility by putting $4,000 up front into their work bonus income banks. This means that senior Australians are better able to consider seasonal work, whether that's accounting, at tax time or retail, around the holidays. I also support the change being implemented, uh, this change being implemented as a trial, and note that the government has extended the trial date until the end of 2023. Clearly, there are a lot of priorities for our social services budget, and I believe we need to be looking closely at the effectiveness of each of our programs so that we can refine them over time and also make room for new ideas. As we move on through the parliamentary term, I'll keep asking the question on whether this program is working and whether it needs to be refined. I also want to speak briefly about the amendments that will be moved by the Greens on this bill. I will always support uh, raising the rate of job seeker, youth allowance and other payments to, the, to those most in need. I've spoken about this many times in this place because it's not right to leave people behind. We know that inequality has huge implications for the fabric of our society, for the cohesion that many have taken for granted. Dealing with rising inequality and having an effective safety net is something that we should all support. This is about priorities. Uh, we've heard over and over how tight the budget is, yet we've seen no talk of winding back fossil fuel subsidies, reportedly near $12 billion a year, and then we see additional ones, $1.9 billion for the middle arm project. So this is clearly about priorities. And we're not treating the discussion about JobSeeker with the urgency that it deserves. And I commend Senator Rice on, on the way that she continues to raise this as an issue here in the ACT, just beyond these walls, we have too many people living in, frankly, terrible conditions. Uh, there are over 38,000 Canberrans living below the poverty, poverty line, and that includes some 9,000 children. Reports suggest that one in six children in Australia are now growing up in poverty. That should concern everyone in this in this place, and we should be working to ensure that that doesn't happen, because we can change that. A recent study by Care Financial Counselling found that Canberra households living in private rentals face a shortfall of $100 per week. The cost of rent for a two-bedroom unit in Canberra has increased by 7.4 per cent in the past year. If you're living on a payment, you cannot afford to rent privately. With 160,000 people on the social housing waitlist nationwide, social housing is not an option for most people. In asking people to support themselves on $48 a day, we are asking people to live in their cars. We're better than this. If the Senate is willing, we can raise the rate today and grant kids, students and pensioners a better quality of life. On the other amendments proposed by the Greens, I've, I've not had the opportunity to look at them in detail and provide scrutiny. We were only provided with them uh, this morning. I note that they are not small amendments. I haven't seen any of the, the costings or, or analysis uh, behind them, and I haven't had the time to uh, consult with experts, let alone people in, in, in the ACT. Many of these 
the amendments are policies that I would likely support, but if my support is needed, uh, then I need to better understand the benefits, uh, the impacts and the potential consequences before I cast my vote. Uh, so while I will support the uh, increase in, in job seeker, uh, I'll be abstaining from the other amendments put forward by the Greens. However, in doing so, uh, I want to say that I, I welcome more discussion on this. We have turned a blind eye to this for, for too long. There are so many Australians doing it tough. There are Australians with jobs doing it tough, and much of the talk uh, in the, uh, the parliament has been around dealing with the cost of living crisis faced across the country. Let's not f forget people uh, who are unemployed and who are relying on job seeker to put food on the table for themselves and their families. This is important. This is important for those people, those family, those children who are having to grow up in poverty. But this is important for all of the communities that we come from, uh, all of the towns and cities. Uh, this is about deciding what kind of country we want to be, whether we want to be a country that looks after people who who need the support to get back on their feet or are willing to say that as one of the wealthiest countries in the history of the world, uh, we simply uh, decide that we still can't afford to give you a helping hand. Uh, I certainly believe that we can. I'd suggest looking at, at the budget and, and again, you know, the $12 billion going to, to fossil, uh, fossil fuels in, in the form of subsidies. Uh, this is about choice and I'd, I'd urge um, my colleagues here in, in the Senate on, on all sides of politics to really consider this and consider the impact that it's going to have on the future of our great country by having one in six children grow up in poverty. The consequences of that, uh, when we have the means to, to deal with it, we can be a compassionate country, we can deal with this, we can be part of, of um, starting to, to deal with the growing inequality, which should be of, a concern, of, of concern to all of us in here. I commend this bill. Uh, it, it will certainly help um, a number of pensioners uh, and will help ease some um, pressures in, in businesses across the country. But hopefully this is the, the first uh, step in, in looking at Social Security in, in Australia and coming up with a, with a fairer system. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. The Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Workforce Incentive Bill 2022. The bill will enable eligible Social Security pensioners over age pension age and certain veterans entitlement recipients over qualifying age to earn up to another $4,000 before the income tax test is applied and their payments affected. This will occur through a $4,000 increase in the work bonus unused concession balance for each eligible recipient and a $4,000 increase to the maximum unused concession balance until the 30th of June 2023. Well, for years now, for years, One Nation has um, been um, fighting for an increase to age pensioners and more opportunities to earn additional income. Actually, it was just prior to the last election. It took pride of place in one of my cartoons, please explain, about pensioners being able to earn extra money, and it was well received by the public. They loved it. The government is to be acknowledged and commended for adopting our policy. Thank you for years. Too late, but anyway, you've adopted it. That's great, because it wasn't on your agenda prior to the election. Maybe you watched my cartoon and it gave you a little hint where we should go with this in looking after our aged people in Australia. While the need to increase Australian workforce participation has become more urgent, allowing pensioners to earn more without penalty made all kinds of sense long before now. A person's utility in the economy does not end at retirement age. The knowledge, experience, industry 
and work ethic of many Australians at this age is a substantial economic asset we can ill afford to leave untapped. This can be applied to many industries and economic sectors that are screaming for skilled workers. It is simply better for this nation that Australian jobs are done by Australians instead of outsourcing them to a flood of overseas workers who we cannot accommodate sustainably. We are going to bring in over 200,000 people into the country. The additional income earned by aged pensioners will largely be spent in our economy and in our communities, especially regional communities. And in many cases today, it is income that our, our older population really need, given there is very little else their government is doing about their rising costs of living and soaring interest rates. Older Australians will not only enjoy additional income without penalty, but also potential health benefits from remaining active in the workforce longer. Like we have some members of parliament, they're active in the workforce. This potentially has a flow-on effect of reducing public health and aged care costs in the long term. One Nation completely supports this legislation and looks forward to its passage. Apart from the fact is that you are stipulating it's only till 30th of June 2023. So I'll tell the aged pensioners out there, you've got seven months at this stage, but then it depends on this passage of it and the assent of this bill, how much time you really do have to go and make your $76.92 a week. Regardless of the inflation rate of 8%, what you're paying extra in rent, what you pay extra in food, what you actually pay extra for your medication, I oh, know that's right, the government took another policy of mine to actually reduce the PBS down. I was going to I suggested to $19.50, which we could afford, but you made it $32. So he did reduce it, I've got to say that. But again, another One Nation policy that you've taken. The whole fact is that pensioners have given of themselves for this country. They are living in poverty. A lot of them can't even eat properly, buy the food that they need, and you'll think that you've done them the world one wonderful thing for them to allow them to earn $76.92 a week till June next year. I would like to know what skin is it off the government knows that we allow this to happen. Why, why are you not making this unlimited? Why are you not? Um, we shouldn't be putting a time limit on it. Why, why do next year? Why is the time limit? We have a shortage of workers in this country. We have known the grey nomads actually work, you know, travel around the country. They do the picking of fruit that we can't get workers for. These people will want to get out to work, but a lot of them won't because of the provisions that they will lose part pension, but more importantly to them is that they will lose the health benefits. That is more important to them than the, rather than the few dollars. You will gain more out of it because a lot of them won't be sitting in their homes, going through depression, knowing not what to do with themselves, feel useless to society, let alone themselves, and this would give them such an increase in their, in their health issues that we should be taking them up because did I tell you what, these aged pensioners are damn good workers. I know because I employed them. How many people in this chamber have run their own business and employed staff? How many? Most of you haven't even owned your own businesses. You've never employed staff. You've gone through the unions. You've actually gone through the political um, you know, universities and all the rest of it. You ended up here in offices and you became politicians. You wouldn't know what it's like to be in the real world. You have no idea what it is like to struggle. And yet you're putting these stipulations on pensioners. I don't even know why you've been bothered in the first place if you're only going to do it for about six months or seven months. Why bother? What was the big game plan? Was it to get a pat on the back from people out there that you're really looking after the pensioners? I don't see it. It is a great step. But I think that you need to actually get rid of that June 23 
that finishes up at that period of time. The other thing that, needs, that uh, you need to actually look at is that the government must now turn its attention to incentivising the more than 900,000 Australians currently receiving unemployment benefits. The worker and skill shortage demand that we do more to address long-term unemployment and get people who are capable of working into jobs that are going begging. The incentives have already been taken care of. Governments provide generous subsidies for relocating for work, and businesses are offering things like sign-on bonuses and free accommodation. What is needed is an, an additional push, and that is to reduce what unemployment benefits to be claimed over a set period. One Nation's policy is that unemployment benefits should only be available for two years in every five. Not in one straight go. A person might get a job for six months and they can't work anymore after that for another two or three months. Then they work for another ten months. Then they have a break, but only two years benefits. We might then start to address the unemployment benefit that's paid out to over 900,000 people in this country, people who are now fourth generation who are on welfare, people who have made themselves unemployable by their appearance, by their dress. But not only that, we are failing them as a nation because a lot of these people can't get jobs because they can't even read or write properly. And we are just kept, keep propping them up by giving them a welfare payment. There was one fellow who got a job and he came home and he was proud to tell his parents. His father abused him for getting a job because he actually shamed his father that he got a job. So he got it. what he did? was actually threw his job in. Is this what we really want? Is when people have to start being responsible for themselves and their own actions and stand on their own two feet. As Senator Pocock said, people in this country need a helping hand. Yes, they do. That's what it's about. It's about a helping hand. It is not a way of life. And both sides of this chamber, whether it be the Labor, whether it be the coalition side, you have not addressed the real concerns that are happening out in our society because you don't want to upset these people because you're going to lose the vote. Well, until you address this, we're not going to um, look after these people who are on welfare payments, people who take it for granted, think it's their God-given right to receive this unlimited amount of money, but not only welfare payments, but on top of that, you have, you know, health issue, you have their health it's all paid for. You have um, every other benefits, rental assistance, everything else that these people get. But it's at the cost that the taxpayers have to keep working to pay for. And one taxpayer in Australia on $80,000 supports one welfare recipient. If we've got an increase in costs and we're hitting $1 trillion in debt, something has to give. You can't have increasing NDIS. You cannot have increasing um, childcare expenses now, four and a half billion dollars on top of it, ten billion a year. We can't keep uh, affording this at all. And yet you are so miserly in your evaluation to allow pensioners to earn an extra four thousand on top of it till June next year, mind you, only June next year. They're not going to be drained on our society. And actually, a lot of these pensioners would be able to help their families the, the, who have their own businesses and can't get workers. They would gladly go and help them and uh, work for them and it'd give them some uh, incentive in their lives. And I think that's what's needed. I think this was poorly thought out. I think you're being tokenistic and I don't think that you're being fed income with this at all. So, in addition to making unemployed people more accountable for taxpayer-funded income and providing a strong push into the workforce, it would effectively reduce the cost to taxpayers by 60 per cent over five years. And once again, and I'll tell you what, what our bill is for welfare—228.8 billion a year. Not million, billion a year. That's what we're paying. So how do you intend to address that? And once again, it would put Australians into Australian jobs instead of outsourcing them to overseas workers. Or is that your whole plan? Is that what you want to do? Keep people in Australia on welfare so it gives you the right to actually open up the floodgates and bring people, workers in from overseas. 
instead of bringing in unsustainable numbers of immigrants to address our skill shortage, we must prioritise those Australians who are capable of working but currently are not. We have a rental and housing crisis and a public health system under erroneous demand, under enormous demand. Bringing in an additional 200,000 plus people per year can only make these problems worse, not better. It is also completely inconsistent with this Labor government's obsession with reducing emissions to net zero, a phrase they cannot even explain in layman's terms. In summary, this bill is a good first step to increasing Australian workforce participation, but only a first step. Let's do it. We've got to do all that we can to actually get more Australians into jobs and work in paying their way instead of, uh, instead of propping them up when they're not taking responsibility for their own actions and putting a roof over their own head. As I've always said, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. We are a prosperous nation. We have, this nation has been built on the hard work of taxpayers of this nation. But I'm telling you now, the taxpayers have had a gutful. They can't afford it anymore. The escalating costs due to government policies has put us in this position. Your emissions trading scheme and the, what you're doing here, zero net emissions, is actually going to put more strain on everyday Australians. So take the pressure off the neck of the aged pensioners out there. Give them unlimited access to earn what they want to earn. They will pay their taxes on it after a certain amount. And that do not put a time limit of June next year on it. Um, and I'd say, and then what I will also add is look after our independent retirees, which we don't talk about. These people have contributed to this country. They have gone without, they've saved and they've made their investments, and now they can't get any assistance help apart from uh, maybe a bit of health care. Look after those people who have contributed to this country, but you don't. You're too busy worrying about the migrants coming from overseas to look after them, make sure they're housed, make sure they're looked after, make sure they've got jobs, everything done for them. Well, what about the Australian people? And these are the, these are the Australians who actually have worked, fought for this nation, gone without and built it for the country that we have today that I'm proud to be part of and call this land mine. And thanks to those Australians who've given me what I enjoy today. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Ormond Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Workforce Incentive Bill 2022. The changes made by this bill are welcome, and I want to echo the comments made by my colleague, Senator Rice. It makes sense that older Australians that want to work more should not be penalised for doing so. I acknowledge that many of my colleagues have already spoken to the benefits of this bill succinctly. So while I wish to speak to this bill, I want to highlight further amendments that we should be considering. If we are extending the number of hours pension holders can work, then why are we not extending the number of hours that those receiving JobSeeker or the Disability Support Pension can work before being penalised? If we are increasing the number of hours that pensioners can work, it makes no sense to exclude other members of society. This exclusion is particularly stark when we know that JobSeeker and the Disability Support Pension both fail to support Australians to stay above the poverty line. The $48 a day that JobSeekers receive is not enough. They are income support payments that still fall below the poverty line and must be increased to $88 a day we must raise the rate. These increases in the rate of income support are one of the most important changes that we can make to alleviate poverty in this country. Because let's be clear, poverty is a political choice. There are people in my community throughout central Queensland that are at breaking point because of the inadequate levels of government support payments. And for these, for these people, Yes, it's the rate of pay that is too low, but it's also the paperwork, the extreme administrative burden, the waiting periods, 
and the punitive punishments for slight breaches of mutual obligations. As Senator Rice foreshadowed, there will be substantive amendments put to this bill, and each one is an opportunity for us to collectively, as a parliament, make people's lives better. It's that simple. During the initial waves of COVID, the government doubled the rate of job seeker. This lifted people out of poverty and quite literally saved lives. It also showed that it is possible to meaningfully reduce poverty in this country. This government could make choices to scrap policies such as the stage three tax cuts. These tax cuts are going to cost us $244 billion. These tax cuts only further benefit the rich in this country rather than taking this money and making sure that this government's income payments are above the poverty line. Lifting people out of poverty is only a matter of political will. We need to make and pass these additional amendments to ensure that social services in this country are more equitable, just and prioritise improving people's lives. Uh, thank you, Senator Ormond Payne. Minister. Uh, thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, I should just uh, indicate, after listening to some of the contributions, uh, firstly, um, Senator Hanson, if you're listening, um, uh, I should indicate that I, li I listened to Senator Hanson's contribution. Uh, that the date uh, that has been incorporated into the uh, legislation is, in fact, 31st of December. Uh, not the end of June. Um, I thought it would just be useful to point that out at this stage. This bill delivers uh, one of the government's commitments to address Australia's labour market challenges through practical and targeted solutions consistent with our announcements at the Jobs and Skills Summit in early September. It strengthens existing incentives for people over the age pension age to take up work or increase the number of hours they work if they wish to do so. The bill also provides that aged pensioners and those receiving equivalent Department of Veterans Affairs payments will no longer have their pensions cancelled after 12 weeks if their income, where it includes some income from employment, exceeds their income limit. Instead, they will be suspended from payment for up to two years. An abridged reapplication process will be made available to them should their income no longer preclude them from payment. Pensioners suspended from payment will keep their pension a concession card for two years instead of it being cancelled after 12 weeks, so they retain access to a range of benefits, including cheaper prescription medicines. The benefits of this measure also extend to partners of aged pensioners, disability support pensioners and equivalent veterans payment recipients, as long as the partner is also receiving a pension. These measures will strengthen the incentives for older Australians to work, and like a series of this, the, the speakers uh, in this debate, uh, I hope the Senate supports the legislation quickly. Uh, thank you, Minister. The question is that this bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, given it's oh, seven minutes to eight, I might move um, items three, five, and six together by leave on sheet 1698, if that's acceptable. And I'll talk to them, and I'll also talk to my other two amendments in order so that we don't um, take up too much time. Um, but flagging that if we do get to voting on three, five and six that um, I won't be requiring a division on those. But look, talking to all, all at the moment, as I foreshadowed in my speech, um, there are, we have a suite of substantial amendments to this bill to pick up the fact that while this bill makes 
very welcome um, changes to enable aged pensioners to earn more. It does not do the same for other income support recipients who are on lower rates of payment. And whereas aged pensioners you know, struggle to survive, particularly if they're in private rental on, low, on the pension rate, imagine if they are struggling, people on income support who are on um, considerably less are also struggling. So what our amendments are doing is, is seeking to address both of those issues. Um, amendment two is the one critical and core to this bill of saying, OK, great increase in work bonus for aged pensioners. We want to see that work bonus extended to other income support recipients, including job seeker and DSP um, recipients. So we know that all working age social security payments are below the Henderson poverty line. We know that everybody and our choice, the Greens' choice, is that we should be legislating to be increasing them all to above $88 a day. The very least that we need to be doing is to be allowing all income support recipients to have the same benefits that are being proposed for aged pensioners in this bill, to enable them to earn more. As I said in my second reading contribution, at the moment the amount that somebody on JobSeeker is able to earn before their JobSeeker payments get slashed is $1,000 in the equivalent of the work bonus and work credit, whereas this bill is allowing aged pensioners to be earning $11,800. And yet that's even with, and yet, you know, it's a double whammy because people on job, on job seeker only get that $48 a day compared with $73 a day at the aged pension. So that's um, the rationale behind um, um, amendment item two uh, of that amendment. Um, item three is to provide earlier access to the age pension. We have got um, increasingly people who have worked hard all their life, who up until when it was changed were able to access the age pension at age 65, um, who are now having to wait until age 67. So people, um, and we know that people approaching retirement age often have limited capacity to continue working, particularly if they've been working in you know, heavy labour jobs and really desperately um, aren't able to work, are stuck on job seeker, not able to access the age pension, despite the fact that the likelihood of them getting, getting work and being able to work is, is very, very low. So we feel that reducing the rate of the age pension back down to 65 would um, would really benefit these people. Um, item four of the amendments that I'm going to be moving is to be raising the rate of income support above the poverty line for everybody. And that's in line with our Greens policy of moving towards a guaranteed livable income so that everybody on income support is able to access the money that they need in order to be able to live, in order to not be living in poverty. And we can afford it, you know, just as we can afford it. Seemingly, $250 billion of the stage three tax cuts, instead of giving that money to the very wealthy in our society, income tax cuts that every one of us in this place will benefit from to the tune of $11,000 a year. Instead of going ahead with the stage three tax cuts, actually spending the money to lift people out of poverty. And we know by increasing the amount of income support, it actually enables people to get themselves back on their feet and enables them to be able to be, to be seeking work, to put them in a position. Because if you are homeless, if you are starving, if you are suffering from malnutrition, if you can't afford the medical care you need, you are not in a good place to be able to get, to, to get work. Um, item five is to abolish mutual obligations. Again, we know that the, these punitive conditional measures, they don't help people who are trying to survive on a payment rate that's way below the poverty line. And we know that the, the costing us a huge amount of money and achieving nothing. So abolish mutual obligations. We saw during the COVID um, pandemic when mutual obligations were abolished that people, there was actually people on income support, people on job seeker, more of them were seeking work and a position to seek work, not because they had to go and sort of apply for their 20 jobs a week and to be jumping through the hoops of their employment agencies, but because um, 
getting rid of those punitive obligations actually freed them up to be doing meaningful work, meaningful um, work together, plus having doubled the income rate, that rate of income, to be able to be in a position to be to be looking for work. And our final, um, the final amendment I'm going to be moving is to lower the age of qualification from job seeker from 22 to 18 years old, which is in line with advocacy from the National Union of Students and the Foundation for Young Australians, which called for the government to address the gaps faced by people aged 18 to 22 years who are trying to, a to access income support. So given um, the, the time at the moment, I will leave that at this stage and I will move items three, five and six by leave together. Th uh, thank you, Senator Rice. Is leave granted? Oh, Minister, leave is granted. Leave is granted. Uh, so the motion is that um, sections three, five and six on sheet 1698 uh, be, be agreed to. All of those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Thank you. So, just for clarity, so the ayes have it for amendments three, five, and six, and uh, your comments are noted, Senator. The, the noes, sorry, the noes have it, and your dissent is noted, Senator Rice, on behalf of the Australian Greens. Now, it being uh, eight p.m., I shall report to the Senate. Uh, the committee reports progress, and I propose the question that the Senate now adjourn. Ah, Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Dep Deputy President. I rise to add my voice and support to the SDA Tasmania's campaign to make New Year's Day in Tasmania a public holiday. Currently, under Tasmanian legislation, New Year's Day is not a public holiday, and therefore, when it falls, as it does uh, this year, then employees who will not be able to receive their penalties for working on the 1st of January. This is frankly unfair, as our mainland brothers and sisters do recognise New Year's Day as a public holiday. The cost of living is rising, groceries are going up. Petrol is going up, and Tasmanian workers will be up to $150 or more out of pocket when they work on New Year's Day, not only in retail but other sectors as well. I recently met with Tamika from a Woolworth store, uh, a local store uh, in my hometown of Launceston. She is a mother and works full time. Because she works Monday to Sunday, she will be affected by this short-sighted nature of the Tasmanian government to not recognise January 1 as a public holiday in Tasmania. Tamika is not only uh, the only Tasmanian affected, thousands of other working people will be disadvantaged as well. Not just people working in fast food, hospitality, retail and supermarkets, but nurses and firefighters are also affected. Tasmania doesn't deserve to be the poor cousin to our mainland counterparts when we are working on certain days in the calendar year. It really doesn't make any sense at all because there is no consistency across the rest of the year as Christmas is a public holiday. Why then is New Year's Day any different? I ask the Liberal state government. I urge the Tasmanian Liberal government to start listening to the Tasmanian workforce to do something about bringing about equality, and I urge the Tasmanian Liberal government to start listening to the SDA and their secretary, Joel Tynan, because Tasmanian workers deserve to be paid a fair day's pay on a public holiday, which is recognised by others, including mainland states. Some Tasmanians do get paid for that public holiday but not all Tasmanians, and we deserve to be treated equally. I also note that the SDA's campaign to make uh, Amazon pay this week, uh, the SDA, TWU and unions 
across not only Australia but across the world are calling for an end to poor working conditions and low wages for Amazon workers. As Black Friday sales begin this week, not just in America but also here in Australia and many other countries, Amazon workers will face undeniable pressure and stress to fulfil orders around the world, placing great strain on individuals and their families. The race to the bottom on wages and secure job is not just something that the Morrison government and those opposite allowed to happen for almost 10 years. No, it is a global problem, a problem that needs to be addressed, and Amazon is the gold medalist for these poor practices. Thousands of Amazon Flex drivers aren't even getting paid the minimum wage. They have no rights and are pressured to drive dangerously overloaded cars and vehicles to avoid being sacked on a whim without reason or recourse. So this week is a reminder that Amazon workers who kept Filling and delivering orders throughout the pandemic deserve respect and have a right to safe workplaces right around the world, as does every working person. Working rights are human rights, so I implore you to join this campaign. Whilst profits soar at Amazon's, doubling in the first half of 2021 compared to 2020, workers are left with little or no pay rises and working unimaginable hours without breaks. Amazon really is amongst the world's worst offenders for exploiting their work practices and their employees. So I stand with the SDA in fighting for equality on New Year's Day to be paid as a public holiday, and I stand with the TWU and the SDA when they're speaking up and walking in solidarity with the Amazon workforce. These conditions aren't Australian. We don't want this sort of uh, downward trend of workers' rights and pay in this country. And the only way that's going to change is if people become members of their union and they stand with these unions and campaign against this atrocity in taking away workers' rights and taking advantage of those people who don't necessarily have a voice of their own. So I urge you to support these campaigns. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Rennie. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, and I rise to speak tonight to give a bit of a uh, synopsis on uh, last week in estimates, uh, where I got to speak to uh, a number of health professionals, but mainly uh, Professor Murphy. Uh, I had more time with Pro Professor Murphy this time than I did with Professor Skerritt, who was off in Ireland uh, on some conference, uh, instead of being here at estimates, which I was a little bit disappointed in. But, um, I have to say one of the most startling aspects of my questioning was the fact that Professor Murphy had admitted that he hadn't read the TGA non-clinical report for the Pfizer vaccine. Now, I would have thought that when you were the actual chief health officer uh, and you were about to administer a vaccine to you know, what turned out to be over 20 million people, nearly you know, all of your countrymen, you would have taken the time to actually read the non-clinical report that goes through and outlines all of the uh, research that was done on the vaccine and all the testing, animal testing and everything like that that was done on the vaccine. I certainly know uh, in, my, in, in my former career that you would never sign off on a set of financial statements if you hadn't have actually scrutinised the financial statements in uh, intricate detail. Uh, and it's interesting and, and it's relevant because uh, Professor Murphy told me that on Thursday, but uh, on the Tuesday night before, I'd actually asked the National Blood Bank Authority uh, whether or not the spike, spike protein stayed in the blood uh, for longer than three days, at which time you could donate blood. And Professor Murphy insisted that there was absolutely no evidence uh, that the spike protein was in the blood. Well, he's actually correct to a certain extent, because had he actually read the TGA non-clinical report, he would have actually said, uh, read or known that there was no distribution and degradation data on the S antigen encoding mRNA protein. Now, that, that in itself I find is shocking, the fact that you wouldn't actually test the spike protein um, in the vaccine before you actually administered it to humans, because the spike protein is the active ingredient. The spike protein is what you know, the idea of the vaccine was, was to deliver, deliver a lipid inside your body that goes into your cells, and then the cell's ribosome would produce the actual spike protein. No, no, what they did was they actually tested uh, luciferase, a benign enzyme, in actual animals, uh, so they didn't even test the spike protein in animals. So for anyone to make any uh, absolute comments or, or, or you know, speak in a position of, th of authority about what the actual spike protein is capable of doing in the blood is, is completely wrong. 
and uh, I will be uh, looking at ways of uh, holding both Professor Murphy and Professor Skerritt accountable for those statements, because it's completely wrong that he should be saying things if he hasn't actually done the time. But I just want to touch on a couple of other things in this uh, TGA non-clinical report that I think uh, is really, really important. Uh, in the summary, it says almost similar, similar microscopic lung inflammation was observed in both challenge control and immunised animals after the peak of infection, in other words, day seven or eight. Uh, so that seems to suggest that there was actually no difference whatsoever uh, in, in the inflammation of unvaccinated uh, rats or animals um, after day seven or eight compared to the vaccinated rats or animals. So in other words, there was no actual evidence uh, that it reduced inflammation in the lungs at all. Now, for some reason, that completely got overlooked as well. Um, but I'm going to run out of time, so I just want to jump on a couple of other things that got overlooked. Uh, in the former set of estimates, uh, Professor Skerritt said that the lipid in the protein was the same lipid that you uh, eat, eat for your breakfast, and it's the same one that's in your sausage or steak that you might eat for breakfast. Now, it actually turns out he contradicts himself in last week's set of estimates, where he now says there's four different sets of lipids uh, in the vaccine. Well, that's not what he said in the prior set of estimates. So that's another example of our so-called health experts flip-flopping uh, as to what you know, they said six months ago and to what they're saying now. So clearly the question has to be asked is Professor Skerritt, uh, did he actually read the TGA non-clinical report? Because I would get the impression that he didn't. And then, of course, the last thing that we really need to touch on tonight is the fact that the FDA actually said as far back as December 2020 that at this time data is not available to make a determination about how long the vaccine will provide protection, nor is there evidence that the vaccine prevents transmission of SARS-CoV from person to person. Now, despite that statement from the FDA back in December 20, for the next two years we have had uh, health professionals running around until the last month claiming that the vaccine stopped transmission. Now, Professor uh, Kelly couldn't actually name any studies that showed an increase in IgA immunoglobulin A in the mucosal system uh, for the simple reason there weren't any studies. No, thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, President. Tonight it is my privilege and pleasure to read out a few speeches from talented and diverse young people in New South Wales submitted through the Raise Our Voice in Parliament campaign. Eva Koshab, a 13-year-old, shared concerns about climate. Eva writes, I earnestly believe that climate change is one of the most severe challenges facing Australia today. Though climate change will affect all Australians, it has been evident over the decades that it is First Nations communities that are disproportionately impacted by the disaster. First Nations peoples have had their sacred sites and resources destroyed in order to allow big corporations to dig up fossil fuels. First Nations communities have had no autonomy over these decisions and have never allowed for these tragedies to occur. I don't believe that it is too late for the government to act, but I do believe that if there is a time to act decisively, it's now. I would like to see parliament-wide agreement in relation to a commitment to achieving net zero emissions by 2030, though not only words of sympathy and recognition, but through action. I implore the Minister for Environment, Tanya Plibersek, to not approve any more fossil fuel projects. I ask that the money that previous governments have spent to destroy this country now be used to build this country by providing a fair transition into renewable energy and for job creation for all fossil fuel workers. Nathurshi Selvarasa, an 11-year-old refugee, has this to say. My name is Nithurshi, a proud Tamil refugee. I'm 11 years old. My electorate is Greenway. The term refugee is used to refer to a person who has fled from their country, risking everything and crossing borders to escape persecution. As a refugee myself, I know that a refugee is more than a word, instead a person with resilience. My mother, my own mother fled from Tamil Elam, her homeland, with a child in her hands on a tiny boat to Australia with many dire conditions and was still hopeful. However, it's hard for refugees to stay hopeful because of the harsh system in Australia. Refugees don't have many opportunities in comparison to citizens. For instance, last year I did the opportunity class test and my result was high enough to go in an opportunity class school. I wasn't able to go because I am a refugee. Refugees escape to countries for protection and to turn over a new life. However, refugees face more problems, such as being deported months later when arriving in Australia. The Australian Parliament must take action. 
All refugees deserve freedom as they are human and faced hardships. We deserve permanent visas and no more detention centers. Thank you. Maximus Pondel, a 16-year-old from Blacktown, wrote this. I've always considered myself Australian. For 13 years, I had never known a place unlike the sparse but vibrant country I was born in. My mother tongue is English, and Tim Tams are my favorite snack, followed closely by lamingtons. There is just no place like home, but something had always felt a bit off. That sometimes, in infrequent but certainly odd occasions, I wouldn't get the same treatment compared with the rest of the flock. It was made obvious throughout the years that I had looked apart, that I was somehow different, distinct, or even at times foreign. In supermarkets, on the bus, or even on the streets at times, voices of discontent were applied without apparent reason. It would be better to always give the benefit of the doubt, but most of the time it was what you had expected it to be. In the diverse and multicultural country of ours, a relic of the past still lingers on with many of our citizens today. This shouldn't be happening. Discrimination of all forms, although relatively unnoticed at times, shamefully is treated like business as usual. Parliament should endeavor in acknowledging the diversity of this country, especially with its traditional custodians and new settlers who strive to live better than before. It should make steps to eradicate the relics of the past and live up to its anthem that we truly do have boundless plains to share. President, I am in awe of these young people. They say it like it is. Our decisions in this place would be so much better and so much wiser if we started hearing them and acting on what they are asking us to do. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Pratt. President, Raise Our Voice is an organisation dedicated to amplifying diverse young female, trans, non-binary voices to actively lead conversations in our politic, both domestic and foreign. We've been given speeches from young people all over Australia, and I'll be reading some from WA today. This one's particularly moving. My name is Alyssa. I'm from the Moore electorate in WA, and like many other young Australians, I suffer from mental illness. In my 17 years, I've been in some of the toughest situations, finding myself fighting to want to survive, hundreds of times hearing the saying, if you feel unsafe, go to emergency. But what can emergency do? Sitting in the hospital, waiting room for six hours, pleading for them to help save me from myself. Even with the overwhelming amounts of privilege and top health insurance money can buy, not that that should even matter, we were turned away. With a lack of beds, staff and supplies, their hands were tired. Had my parents been unable to take time off work to be with me for the week before I was admitted, I would not have made it there. The scariest part is that this was a notably short amount of time. Alternatively, people are waitlisted for months, begging for anyone could who could help them survive their crisis. The Parliament of Australia has supposedly highlighted mental health and suicide prevention as one of its highest priorities. But if it's truly important to them, there has to be more they can do. By encouraging the studies of psychology, psychiatry, implementing non-negotiable mental health support systems in schools and introducing youth funding towards those who miss work when in crisis, the government have the potential to change the game for youth mental health in Australia. Suicide is the leading cause of death in Australia for those aged 15 to 24. Make it known. Thank you, Elisa. I now read Sasha's words. She writes, My name is Sasha Finlay Collins. I'm a 16-year-old who lives in Tangney. I'm asking for our parliament to foster real national pride in what it means to be Australian. Changing the attitude of a country begins with its leaders, so I believe parliament needs to take more steps to show the world who we are as Australians. 
We're home to the oldest living culture, and our incredible Indigenous heritage is something that Parliament could better showcase using more Indigenous art and cultural practices on the world stage. Australia is also a country with, uh, because of its unique biodiversity. However, we are losing this biodiversity from our native butterflies and bees to the whales that swim around our nation. We need to work together to preserve our native flora and fauna. <clears throat> Appreciating our heritage and protecting our environment are some small steps our politicians can take to uphold our Australian values of mateship, a fair go and respect. When our politicians reflect these values, they inspire their people. I'm asking Parliament to preserve the identity of Australia to create a better future for all. And finally, hi there, my name's Darcy, I'm 16. I live in the electorate of Moore. Today I'm speaking to you about a topic close to my heart and probably close to many of yours as well, cancer. This year I lost my good friend, Megan Reid. Meg was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2019 at age 16. Over the years, she had countless rounds of chemo and radiation, even beating cancer three times. But despite these efforts, she sadly passed away on the 14th of July. I'm not asking for sympathy, no. I'm asking for funding. Did you know that only 4% of federal cancer funding goes towards childhood cancer research? That's right. Considering worldwide more than 400,000 children and adolescents are diagnosed with cancer every year, this just doesn't make much sense. Childhood cancer is brutal and poses more challenges than adult cancers. Cancers in children often have no known cause and are different in how they spread and grow, making it hard to tell how they will respond to treatment. We lose countless children every year. Who knows, maybe we've already lost our future Prime Minister or our next Nobel Prize winner. After lo uh, losing Megan this year, I've come to realise that without her here to push for federal funding from Parliament, someone must take her place. What a perfect way to honour her memory. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Orman Bain. Thank you, President. Uh, the Raise Our Voice in Parliament campaign is a brilliant initiative that aims to elevate the voices of young people across Australia, giving them a direct voice into the parliament. I'm delighted to have been asked to read out the speeches of several intelligent, passionate and articulate young people from Queensland. I start with Sadia Sharif, who is 15 years old. Sadia writes, Racism is a fast-spreading pandemic. One in five people living in Australia have been subjected to racial discrimination. Personally, I find it difficult to leave the house without thinking I could become a victim of racism. I'm aware that I'm not the only one who has these feelings. We talk about Australia being a multicultural and accepting society, yet there are such high rates of racism across the country. How can we talk about this when there are people being bullied and belittled for belonging to a certain ethnic group or simply having different skin colour? Being different is what makes us unique and allows our talents to shine. It is the year 2022. It is time for change. I wish that the government can educate children at school about the detrimental effects of racism. Racism is a choice, but never an option. The government should help spread more awareness about racism in Australia to allow members of the public to better understand the effects of racism here. We cannot leave this immense issue hanging. Racism is a reality in Australia, and if we continue to ignore it, the consequences will worsen. How many poor people must suffer before we can take action? The second speech is from Will Vanman, who is 16 years old, and he writes about climate change. Australia's new parliament must urgently address the impending climate catastrophe. I have been lucky enough to avoid the major impacts of flooding that impacted my electorate earlier this year. However, I know so many that do not share the same luck. It is a completely surreal feeling to walk around your neighbourhood to find houses completely underwater, boats on streets and people rescuing their pets by canoes. With the current forecast for similar conditions next year, we need to act. We cannot continue as a country to ignore the impending crisis 
brush off the increasing frequency and severity of drought, bushfires and floods, and continue business as usual. The hard truth from the IPCC is that with our current climate trajectory and goals, we only have a 50 per cent chance of staying below 2 degrees, a risk that my generation of Australians and all future generations do not want to gamble on. Before we even reach 2 degrees, climate tipping points are threatening to accelerate this process even more. We are coming towards the edge of a crumbling cliffside, knowing it could give way at any moment, yet we are still walking, running, sprinting towards it. The government needs to step up and take a lead as the global leader in the necessary climate revolution. This does not include sneaking in extra profit by continuing to open polluting coal mines, gas explorations and dirty factories. Science tells us that we need a systemic rethink, restructuring and reorienting throughout Australia, including no more coal or gas plants. Real action, not just empty promises. I talk to many of my fellow students who are pessimistic about our future. Currently, the government is letting us down. Our nation will be on the front lines of this ecological emergency and we must respond accordingly. A less than 50 per cent chance of survival is not good enough. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.